Preface of Fabiola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. Preface When the plan of the Popular Catholic Library was formed, the author of the following little work was consulted upon it. He not only approved of the design, but ventured to suggest, among others, a series of tales illustrative of the condition of the Church in different periods of her past existence. One, for instance, might be called the Church of the Catacombs, a second, the Church of the Basilicas, each comprising three hundred years, a third would be on the Church of the Cloister, and then, perhaps, a fourth might be added called the Church of the Schools. In proposing this sketch, he added, perhaps the reader will find indiscreetly, that he felt half inclined to undertake the first part, by way of illustrating the proposed plan. He was taken at his word, and urged strongly to begin the work. After some reflection he consented, but with an understanding that it was not to be an occupation, but only the recreation of leisure hours. With this condition the work was commenced early in this year, and it has been carried on entirely, on that principle. It has, therefore, been written at all sorts of times, and in all sorts of places, early and late, when no duty urged, in scraps and fragments of time, when the body was too fatigued or the mind too worn for heavier occupation, in the roadside inn, in the halt of travel, in strange houses, in every variety of situation and circumstances, sometimes trying ones. It has thus been composed bit by bit, in portions varying from ten lines to half a dozen pages at most and generally with few books or resources at hand. But once begun, it has proved what it was taken for, a recreation, and often a solace and a sedative. From the memories it has revived, the associations it has renewed, the scattered and broken remnants of old studies, and earlier readings which it has combined, and by the familiarity which it has cherished with better times and better things than surround us in our age. Why need the reader be told all this? For two reasons. First, this method of composition may possibly be reflected on the work, and he may find it patchy and ill-sorted, or not well connected in its parts. If so, this account will explain the cause. Secondly, he will thus be led not to expect a treatise or a learned work, even upon ecclesiastical antiquities. Nothing would have been easier than to cast an air of learning over this little book, and fill half of each page with notes and references. But this was never the writer's idea. His desire was rather to make us reader familiar with the usages, habits, condition, ideas, feeling, and spirit of the early ages of Christianity. This required a certain acquaintance with places and objects connected with the period, and some familiarity, more habitual than learned, with the records of the time. For instance, such writings as Acts of Primitive Martyrs should have been frequently read, so as to leave impressions on the author's mind rather than have been examined scientifically and critically for mere antiquarian purposes. And so, such places or monuments as have to be explained should seem to stand before the eye of the describer, from frequently and almost casually seeing them, rather than have to be drawn from books. Another source of instruction has been freely used. Anyone acquainted with the Roman breviary must have observed that in the office of certain saints a peculiar style prevails which presents the holy persons commemorated in a distinct and characteristic form. This is not the result so much of any continuous narrative, as of expressions put into their mouths, or brief descriptions of events in their lives, repeated often again and again. In antiphons, responsoriae, to lessons, and even versicles, till they put before us an individuality, a portrait clear and definite of singular excellence. To this class belong the offices of Saints Agnes, Agatha, Cecilia, and Lucia, and that of St. Clement and St. Martin. Each of these saints stand out before our minds with distinct features, almost as if we had seen and known them. If, for instance, we take the first that we have named, we clearly draw out the following circumstances. She is evidently pursued by some heathen admirer, whose suit for her hand she repeatedly rejects. Sometimes she tells him that he is forestalled by another, to whom she is betrothed. Sometimes she describes this object of her choice under various images, representing him even as the object of homage to sun and moon. On another occasion she describes the rich gifts, 
or the beautiful garlands with which he has adorned her and the chaste caresses by which he has endeared himself to her then at last as if more importunately pressed she rejects the love of perishable man the food of death and triumphantly proclaims herself the spouse of christ threats are used but she declares herself under the protection of an angel who will shield her this history is as plainly written by the fragments of her office as a word is by scattered letters brought and joined together but throughout one discerns another peculiarity and a true and beautiful one in her character it is clearly represented to us that the saint had ever before her the unseen object of her love saw him heard him felt him and entertained and had returned a real affection such as hearts on earth have for one another she seems to walk in perpetual vision almost an ecstatic fruition of her spouse's presence he has really put a ring upon her finger has transferred the blood from his own cheek to hers has crowned her with budding roses her eye is really upon him with unerring gaze and returned looks of gracious love what writer that introduced the person would venture to alter the character who would presume to attempt one at variance with it or who would hope to draw a portrait more lifelike and more exquisite than the church has done for putting aside all inquiry as to the genuineness of the acts of which these passages are suggested and still more waiving the question whether the hard critical spirit of a former age too lightly rejected such ecclesiastical documents as geringer thinks it is clear that the church in her office intends to place before us a certain type of high virtue embodied in the character of that saint the writer of the following pages considers himself therefore bound to adhere to this view whether these objects have been attained it is for the reader to judge at any rate even looking at the amount of information to be expected from our work in this form and one intended for general reading a comparison between the subjects introduced either formally or casually and those given in any elementary work such as Lurie's manners of the christians which embraces several centuries more will show that as much positive knowledge on the practices and beliefs of that early period is here imparted as is usual to communicate in a more didactic form at the same time the reader must remember that this book is not historical it takes in but a period of a few months extended in some concluding chapters it consists rather of a series of pictures than of a narrative of events occurrences therefore of different epochs in different countries have been condensed into a small space chronology has been sacrificed to this purpose the date of diocletian's edict has been anticipated by two months the martyrdom of st agnes by a year the period of st sebastian though uncertain has been brought down later all that relates to christian topography has been kept as accurate as possible a martyrdom has been transferred from imola to fondi it was necessary to introduce some view of the morals and opinions of the pagan world as a contrast to those of christians but their worst aspect has been carefully suppressed as nothing could be admitted here which the most sensitive catholic eye would shrink from contemplating it is indeed earnestly desired that this little work written solely for recreation be read also as a relaxation from graver pursuits but that at the same time the reader may rise from its perusal with a feeling that his time has not been lost nor his mind occupied with frivolous ideas rather let it be hoped that some admiration and love may be inspired by it of those primitive times which an over-excited interest in later and more brilliant epochs of the church is too apt to diminish or obscure september eighth eighteen fifty four end of preface Section 1 of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part 1. Peace. Chapter 1. The Christian House. It is on an afternoon in September of the year 302 that we invite our reader to accompany us through the streets of Rome. The sun has declined and is about two hours from his setting. The day is cloudless and its heat has cold so that multitudes are issuing from their houses and making their way toward caesar's gardens on one side or solace on the other to enjoy their evening walk and learn the news of the day but the part of the city to which we wish to conduct our friendly reader is that known by the name of campus martius it comprised the flat alluvial plain between the seven hills of older rome and the tiber before the close of the republican period 
this field once left bare for the athletic and warlike exercises of the people had begun to be encroached upon by public buildings pompey had erected in it his theatre soon after agrippa raised the pantheon in its adjoining baths but gradually it became occupied by private dwellings while the hills in the early empire the aristocratic portion of the city were seized upon for great edifices thus the palatine after nero's fire became almost too small for the imperial residence and its adjoining circus maximus the esquiline was usurped by titus's pass built on the ruins of the golden house the aventine by caracalla's and at the period of which we write the emperor diocletian was covering the space sufficient for many lordly dwellings by the erection of his thermae or the quirinal not far from Sallust's garden just alluded to this particular spot in the campus martius to which we will direct our steps is one whose situation is so definite that we can accurately describe it to any one acquainted with the topography of ancient or modern rome in republican times there was the large square space in the campus martius surrounded by boarding and divided into pens in which comitia or meeting of the tribes of the people were held for giving their votes this was called the septa or ovio from its resemblance to a sheepfold augustus carried out a plan described by cicero in a letter to atticus of transforming this homely contrivance into a magnificent and solid structure the septa julia as it was thenceforth called was a splendid portico of one thousand by five hundred feet supported by columns and adorned with paintings its ruins are clearly traceable and it occupied the space now covered by the doria and verospi palaces running thus along the present corso the roman college the church of st ignatius and the oratory of caravita the house to which we invite our reader is exactly opposite and on the east side of its edifice including in its area the present church of st marcellus whence it extended back towards the foot of the quirinal hill it is thus found to cover as noble roman houses did a considerable extent of ground from the outside it presents but a blank and dead appearance the walls are plain without architectural ornament not high and scarcely broken by windows in the middle of one side of this quadrangle is a door an antis that is merely relieved by a tympanum or triangular cornice resting on two half columns using our privilege as artists of fiction of invisible ubiquity we will enter in with our friend or shadow as it would have been anciently called passing through the porch on the pavement of which we read with pleasure in mosaic the greeting salve or welcome we find ourselves in the atrium or first court of the house surrounded by a portico or colonnade in the centre of the marble pavement a soft warbling jet of pure water brought by the claudian aqueduct from the tusculan hills springs into the air now higher now lower and falls into an elevated basin of red marble over the sides of which it flows in downy waves and before reaching its lower and wider recipient scatters a gentle shower on the rare and brilliant flowers placed in elegant vases around under the portico we see furniture disposed of a rich and sometimes rare character couches inlaid with ivory and even silver tables of oriental woods bearing candelabra lamps and other household implements of bronze or silver delicately chased busts vases tripods and objects of mere art on the walls are paintings evidently of a former period still however retaining all their brightness of colour and freshness of execution these are separated by niches with statues representing indeed like the pictures mythological or historical subjects but we cannot help observing that nothing meets the eye which could offend the most delicate mind here and there an empty niche or a covered painting prove that this is not the result of accident as outside the columns the covering roof leaves a large square opening in its centre called the impluvium there is drawn across it a curtain or veil of dark canvas which keeps out the sun and rain an artificial twilight therefore alone enables us to see all that we have described but it gives greater effect to what is beyond through an arch opposite to the one whereby we have entered we catch a glimpse of an inner and still richer court paved with variegated marbles and adorned with bright gilding the veil of the opening above which however here is closed with thick glass or tail lapis becularis has been partly withdrawn and emits a bright but softened ray from the evening sun on to the place where we see for the first time that we are in no enchanted hall 
but in an inhabited house. Beside a table, just outside the columns of Phrygian marble, sits a matron, not beyond the middle of life, whose features, noble yet mild, show traces of having passed through sorrow at some earlier period. But a powerful influence has subdued the recollection of it, or blended it with a sweeter thought, and the two always come together, and have long dwelt united in her heart. The simplicity of her appearance strangely contrasts with the richness of all around her. Her hair, streaked with silver, is left uncovered and unconcealed by any artifice. Her robes are of the plainest color and texture, without embroidery, except the purple ribbon sewed on and called the segmentum, which denotes the state of widowhood, and not a jewel or precious ornament, of which the Roman ladies were so lavish, is to be seen upon her person. The only thing approaching to this is a slight gold cord or chain round her neck, from which apparently hangs some object carefully concealed within the upper hem of her dress. At the time that we discover her, she is busily engaged over a piece of work, which evidently has no personal use. Upon a long, rich strip of gold cloth she is embroidering with still richer gold thread, and occasionally she has recourse to one or another of several elegant caskets upon the table, from which she takes out a pearl or a gem set in gold, and introduces it into the design. It looks as if the precious ornaments of earlier days were being devoted to some higher purpose. But as time goes on, some little uneasiness may be observed to come over her calm thoughts, hitherto absorbed to all appearance in her work. She now occasionally raises her eyes from it towards the entrance. Sometimes she listens for footsteps and seems disappointed. She looks up towards the sun, then perhaps turns her glance towards a clipsidra, or water clock, on a bracket near her. But just as a feeling of more serious anxiety begins to make an impression on her countenance, a cheerful rap strikes the house door, and she bends forward with a radiant look to meet the welcome visitor. End of section one. Section two of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, piece. Chapter two. The Martyr's Boy. It is a youth full of grace and sprightliness and candor that comes forward with flight and buoyant steps across the atrium towards the inner hall, and we shall hardly find time to sketch him before he reaches it. He is about fourteen years old, but tall for that age, with elegance of form and manliness of bearing. His bare neck and limbs are well developed by healthy exercise. His features display an open and warm heart, while his lofty forehead, round which his brown hair naturally curls, beams with a bright intelligence. He wears the usual use garment, the short protexta, reaching below the knee, and a golden bola, or hollow spheroid of gold, suspended round his neck. A bundle of papers and vellum rolls, fastened together and carried by an old servant behind him, shows us that he is just returning home from school. While we have been thus noting him, he has received his mother's embrace, and has set himself low by her feet. She gazes upon him for some time in silence, as if to discover in his countenance the cause of his unusual delay, for he is an hour late in his return. But he meets her glance with so frank a look and with such a smile of innocence that every cloud of doubt is in a moment dispelled, and she addresses him as follows. What has detained you today, my dearest boy? No accident, I trust, has happened to you on the way? Oh, none, I assure you, sweetest mother. On the contrary, all has been delightful, so much so that I can scarcely venture to tell you. A look of smiling expostulation drew from the open-hearted boy a delicious laugh as he continued. Well, I suppose I must. You know I am never happy and cannot sleep if I have failed to tell you all the bad and good of the day about myself. The mother smiled again, wondering what the bad was. I was reading the other day that the Scythians each evening cast into an urn a white or a black stone, according as the day had been happy or unhappy. If I had to do so, it would serve to mark, in white or black, the days on which I have, or have not, an opportunity of relating to you all that I have done. But today, for the first time, I have a doubt, a fear of conscience, whether I ought to tell you all. Did the mother's heart flutter more than usual, as from a first anxiety? Or was there a softer solicitude, dimming her eye, that the youth should seize her hand and put it tenderly to his lips, while he thus replied, Fear nothing, mother most beloved. 
your son has done nothing that may give you pain only say do you wish to hear all that has befallen me to-day or only the cause of my late return home tell me all dear pancratius she answered nothing that concerns you can be indifferent to me well then he began this last day of my frequenting school appears to me to have been singularly blessed and yet full of strange occurrences first i was crowned as the successful competitor in a declamation which our good master Cassanius set us for our work during the morning hours and this led as you will hear to some singular discoveries the subject was that the rural philosopher should be ever ready to die for truth i never heard anything so cold or insipid i hope it is not wrong to say so as the compositions read by my companions it was not their fault poor fellows what truth can they possess and what inducements can they have to die for any of their vain opinions but to a christian what charming suggestions to the theme naturally makes and so i felt it my heart glowed and all my thoughts seemed to burn as i wrote my essay full of the lessons you have taught me and of the domestic examples that are before me the son of a martyr could not feel otherwise but when my turn came to read my declamation i found that my feelings had nearly fatally betrayed me in the warmth of my recitation the word christian escaped my lips instead of philosopher and faith instead of truth at the first mistake i saw cassanius start at the second i saw a tear glisten in his eye as bending affectionately toward me he said in a whisper beware my child there are sharp ears listening what then interrupted the mother is cassanius a christian i chose this school for you because it was in the highest repute for learning and for morality and now indeed i thank god that i did so but in these days of danger and apprehension we are obliged to live as strangers in our own land scarcely knowing the faces of our brethren certainly had cassanius proclaimed his faith his school would soon have been deserted but go on my dear boy were his apprehensions well grounded i fear so for while the great body of my schoolfellows not noticing these slips vehemently applauded my hearty declamation i saw the dark eyes of corvinus bent scowlingly upon me as he bit his lip in manifest anger and who is he my child that was so displeased and wherefore he is the oldest and strongest but unfortunately the dullest boy in the school but this you know is not his fault only i know not why he seems ever to have had an ill will and grudge against me the cause of which i cannot understand did he say aught to you or do yes and was the cause of my delay for when we went forth from school into the field by the river he addressed me insultingly in the presence of our companions and said come pancratius this i understand is the last time we meet here he laid a particular emphasis on the word but i have a long score to demand payment of from you you have loved to show your superiority in school over me and others older and better than yourself i saw your supercilious looks at me as you spouted your high-flown declamation to-day ay and i caught expressions in it which you may live to rue and that very soon for my father you well know is prefect of the city the mother slightly started and something is preparing which may nearly concern you before you leave us i must have my revenge if you are worthy of your name and it be not an empty word let us fairly contend in more manly strife than that of the styles and tables wrestle with me or try the cestus against me i burn to humble you as you deserve before these witnesses of your insolent triumphs the anxious mother bent eagerly forward as she listened and scarcely breathed and what she exclaimed did you answer my dear son i told him gently that he was quite mistaken for never had I consciously done anything that could give pain to him or any of my schoolfellows, nor did I ever dream of claiming superiority over them. And as to what you propose, I added, you know, Corvinus, that I have always refused to indulge in personal combats, which, beginning as a cool trial of skill, ended in angry strife, hatred, and wish for revenge. How much less could I think of entering on them now, when you avowed that you were anxious to begin them with those evil feelings which are usually their bad end? Our schoolmates had now formed a circle round us, and they clearly saw that they were all against me, for they had hoped to enjoy some of the delights of their cruel games. I therefore cheerfully added, 
and now my comrades good-bye and may all happiness attend you i part from you as i have lived with you in peace not so replied corvinus now purple in the face with fury but the boy's countenance became crimson his voice quivered his body trembled and half choked he sobbed out i cannot go on i dare not tell the rest i entreat you for god's sake and for the love you bear your father's memory said the mother placing her hand upon her son's head conceal nothing for me i shall never again have rest if you tell me not all what further said or did crevinus the boy recovered himself by a moment's pause and a silent prayer and then proceeded just so exclaimed crevinus not so do you depart cowardly worshipper of an ass's head you have concealed your abode from us but i will find you out till then bear this token of my determined purpose to be revenged so saying he dealt me a furious blow upon the face which made me reel and stagger while a shout of savage delight broke forth from the boys around us he burst into tears which relieved him and then went on oh how i felt my blood boil at that moment how my heart seemed bursting within me and a voice appeared to whisper in my ear scornfully the name of coward it surely was an evil spirit i felt that i was strong enough my rising anger made me so to seize my unjust assailant by the throat and cast him gasping on the ground i heard already the shout of applause that would have hailed my victory and turned the tables against him it was the hardest struggle of my life never were flesh and blood so strong within me o oh god may they never be again so tremendously powerful and what did you do then my darling boy gasped forth the trembling matron he replied my good angel conquered the demon at my side i thought of my blessed lord in the house of caiaphas surrounded by scoffing enemies and struck ignominiously on the cheek yet meek and forgiving could i wish to be otherwise i stretched forth my hand to crevinus and said may god forgive you as i freely and fully do and may he bless you abundantly cassanius came up at that moment having seen all from a distance and the youthful crowd quickly dispersed i entreated him by our common faith now acknowledged between us not to pursue crevinus for what he had done and i obtained his promise and now sweet mother murmured the boy in soft gentle accents into his parents bosom do you not think i may call this a happy day End of section two Section three of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first piece, chapter three. The dedication. While the foregoing conversation was held, the day had fast declined. An aged female servant now entered unnoticed and lighted the lamps placed on marble and bronze candelabra and quietly retired. A bright light beamed upon the unconscious group of mother and son, as they remained silent, after the holy matron Lucina had answered Pancratius's last question, only by kissing his glowing brow. It was not merely a maternal emotion that was agitating her bosom. It was not even the happy feeling of a mother who, having trained her child to certain high and difficult principles, sees them put to the hardest test, and nobly stand it. Neither was it the joy of having for her son one, in her estimation, so heroically virtuous at such an age, for surely with much greater justice than the mother of Gracchi showed her boys to the astonished matrons of Republican Rome as her only jewels, could that Christian mother have boasted to the church of the son she had brought up. But to her this was an hour of still deeper, or, shall we say, sublimer feeling. It was a period looked forward to anxiously for years, a moment prayed for with all the fervor of a mother's supplication, many a pious parent had devoted her infant son from the cradle to the holiest and noblest state that earth possesses has prayed and longed to see him grow up to be first a spotless levite and then a holy priest at the altar and has watched eagerly each growing inclination and tried gently to bend the tender thought toward the sanctuary of the lord of hosts and if this was an only child as samuel was to anna that dedication of all that is dear to her keenest affection may justly be considered as an act of maternal heroism what then must be said of ancient matrons, Felicitas, Symphorosa, or the unnamed mother of the Maccabees, who gave up or offered their children, not one, but many, 
yea all to be victims whole burnt rather than priests to god it was some such thought as this which filled the heart of lucina in that hour while with closed eyes she raised it high to heaven and prayed for strength she felt as though called to make a generous sacrifice of what was dearest to her on earth and though she had long foreseen it and desired it it was not without a maternal throw that its merit could be gained and what was passing in that boy's mind as he too remained silent and abstracted not any thought of a high destiny awaiting him no vision of a venerable basilica eagerly visited sixteen hundred years later by the sacred antiquary and the devout pilgrim and giving his name which it shall bear to the neighbouring gate of rome no anticipation of a church in his honour to rise in faithful ages on the banks of the distant thames which even after desecration should be loved and eagerly sought as their last resting-place by hearts faithful still to his dear rome no forethought of a silver canopy or ciborium weighing two hundred and eighty seven pounds to be placed over the porphyry urn that should contain his ashes by pope honorius i no idea that his name would be enrolled in every martyrology his picture crowned with rays hung over many altars as the boy martyr of the early church he was only the simple-hearted christian youth who looked upon it as a matter of course that he must always obey god's law and his gospel and only felt happy that he had that day performed his duty when it came under circumstances of more than usual trial there was no pride no self-admiration in the reflection otherwise there would have been no heroism in his act when he raised again his eyes after his calm reverie of peaceful thoughts and the new light which brightly filled the hall they met his mother's countenance gazing anew upon him radiant with a majesty and tenderness such as he never recollected to have seen before it was a look almost of inspiration her face was as that of a vision her eyes what he would have imagined an angel's to be silently and almost unknowingly he had changed his position and was kneeling before her and well he might for was she not to him as a guardian spirit who had shielded him ever from evil or might he not well see in her the living saint whose virtue had been his model from childhood lucy not broke the silence in a tone full of grave emotion the time is at length come my dear child she said which has long been the subject of my earnest prayer which i have yearned for in the exuberance of maternal love eagerly have i watched in thee the opening germ of each christian virtue and thank god as it appeared i have noted thy docility thy gentleness thy diligence thy piety and thy love of god and man i have seen with joy thy lively faith and thy indifference to worldly things and thy tenderness to the poor but i have been waiting with anxiety for the hour which should decisively show me whether thou wouldst be content with the poor legacy of the mother's weekly virtue or art the true inheritor of thy martyred father's nobler gifts that hour thank god has come to-day what have i done then that thou shouldst have changed or raised thy opinion of me asked pancratius listen to me my son this day which was to be the last of thy school education methinks that our merciful lord has been pleased to give thee a lesson worth it all and to prove that thou hast put off the things of a child and must be treated henceforth as a man for thou canst think and speak yea and act as one how dost thou mean dear mother what thou hast told me of that declamation this morning she replied proves to me how full thy heart must have been of noble and generous thoughts thou art too sincere and honest to have written and fervently expressed that it was a glorious duty to die for the faith if thou hast not believed it and felt it and truly i do believe and feel it interrupted the boy what greater happiness can a christian desire on earth yes my child thou sayest most truly continued lucina but i should not have been satisfied with words what followed afterwards has proved to me that thou canst bear intrepidly and patiently not really pain but what i know it must have been harder for thy young patrician blood to stand the stinging ignominy of a disgraceful blow and the scornful words and glances of an unpitying multitude nay more thou hast proved thyself strong enough to forgive and to pray for thine enemy this day thou hast trodden the higher paths of the mountain with a cross upon thy shoulders one step more and thou wilt plant it on its summit thou hast proved thyself the genuine son of the martyr quintinus dost thou wish to be like him mother mother dearest sweetest mother broke out the panting youth could i be his genuine son and not wish to resemble him though i never enjoyed the happiness of knowing him 
has not his image been ever before my mind has he not been the very pride of my thoughts when each year the solemn commemoration has been made of him as of one of the white-robed army that surrounds the lamb in whose blood he washed his garments how have my heart and my flesh exalted in his glory and how have i prayed to him in the warmth of filial piety that he would obtain for me not fame not distinction not wealth not earthly joy but what he valued more than all these nay that only thing which he has left on earth may be applied as i know he now considers it would most usefully and most nobly be what is that my son it is his blood replied the youth which yet remains flowing in my veins and in these only i know he must wish that it too like what he held in his own may be poured out in love of his redeemer and in testimony of his faith enough enough my child exclaimed the mother thrilling with a holy emotion take from thy neck the badge of childhood i have a better token to give thee he obeyed and put away the golden bulla thou hast inherited from my father spoke the mother with all deeper solemnity of tone a noble name a high station ample riches every worldly advantage but there is one treasure which i have reserved for thee from his inheritance till thou shalt prove thyself worthy of it i have concealed it from thee till now though i valued it more than gold and jewels it is now time that i make it over to thee with trembling hands she drew from her neck the golden chain which hung round it and for the first time her son saw that it supported a small bag or purse richly embroidered and set with gems she opened it and drew from it a sponge dry indeed but deeply stained this too is thy father's blood pancratius she said with faltering voice and streaming eyes i gathered it myself from his death wound as disguised i stood by his side and saw him die from the wounds he had received for christ she gazed upon it fondly and kissed it fervently and her gushing tears fell on it and moistened it once more and thus liquefied again its color glowed bright and warm as if it had only just left the martyr's heart the holy matron put it to her son's quivering lips and they were empurpled with its sanctifying touch he venerated the sacred relic with the deepest emotions of a christian and a son and felt as if his father's spirit had descended into him and stirred to its depth the full vessel of his heart that its waters might be ready freely to flow the whole family thus seemed to him once more united lucina replaced her treasure in its shrine and hung it round the neck of her son saying when next it is moistened may it be from a nobler stream than that which gushes from a weak woman's eyes but heaven thought not so and the future combatant was anointed and the future martyr was consecrated by the blood of his father mingled with his mother's tears End of section 3section four of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part first peace chapter four the heathen household while the scenes described in the three last chapters were taking place a very different one presented itself in another house situated in the valley between the quirinal and esquiline hills it was that of Fabius, a man of the equestrian order, whose family, by farming the revenues of the Asiatic provinces, had amassed immense wealth. His house was larger and more splendid than the one we have already visited. It contained a third large peristyle, or court, surrounded by immense apartments, and besides possessing many treasures of European art, it abounded with the rarest productions of the East. Carpets from Persia were laid on the ground, silks from China, many-coloured stuffs from Babylon, and gold embroidery from India and Phrygia covered the furniture, while curious works in ivory and in metals scattered about were attributed to the inhabitants of islands beyond the Indian Ocean, of monstrous form and fabulous descent. Fabius himself, the owner of all this treasure, and of large estates, was a true specimen of an easy-going Roman, who was determined thoroughly to enjoy this life in fact he never dreamt of any other believing in nothing yet worshipping as a matter of course on all proper occasions whatever deity happened to have its turn he passed for a man as good as his neighbours and no one had a right to exact more the greater part of his day was passed at one or other of the great baths which besides the purposes implied in their name 
comprised in their many adjuncts the equivalents of clubs reading-rooms gambling-houses tennis-courts and gymnasiums there he took his bath gossiped read and whiled away his hours or sauntered for a time into the forum to hear some orator speaking or some advocate pleading or into one of the many public gardens whither the fashionable world of rome repaired he returned home to an elegant supper not later than our dinner where he had daily guests either previously invited or picked up during the day among the many parasites on the lookout for good fare at home he was a kind and indulgent master his house was well kept for him by an abundance of slaves and as trouble was what most he dreaded so long as everything was comfortable handsome and well served about him he let things go on quietly under the direction of his freedmen it is not however so much to him that we wish to introduce our reader as to another inmate of his house the sharer of its splendid luxury and the sole heiress of his wealth this is his daughter who according to roman usage bears the father's name softened however into the diminutive fabiola as we have done before we will conduct the reader at once into her apartment a marble staircase leads to it from the second court over the sides of which extends a suite of rooms opening upon a terrace refreshed and adorned by a graceful fountain and covered with a profusion of the rarest exotic plants in these chambers is concentrated whatever is most exquisite and curious in native and foreign art a refined taste directing ample means and peculiar opportunities has evidently presided over the collection and arrangement of all round at this moment the hour of the evening repast is approaching and we discover the mistress of this dainty abode engaged in preparing herself to appear with becoming splendid she is reclining on a couch of athenian workmanship inlaid with silver and the room of size is seen form that is having glass windows to the ground and so opening on to the flowery terrace against the wall opposite to her hangs a mirror of polished silver sufficient to reflect a whole standing figure on a porphyry table beside it is a collection of the innumerable rare cosmetics and perfumes of which the roman ladies had become so fond and in which they lavished immense sums on another of indian sandalwood was a rich display of jewels and trinkets and their precious caskets from which to select for the day's use it is by no means our intention nor our gift to describe persons or features we wish more to deal with minds we will therefore content ourselves with saying that fabiola now at the age of twenty was not considered inferior in appearance to other ladies of her rank age and fortune and had many aspirants for her hand but she was a contrast to her father in temper and in character proud haughty imperious and irritable she ruled like an empress all that surrounded her with one or two exceptions and exacted humble homage from all that approached her an only child whose mother had died in giving her birth she had been nursed and brought up in indulgence by her careless good-natured father she had been provided with the best masters had been adorned with every accomplishment and allowed to gratify every extravagant wish she had never known what it was to deny herself a desire having been left so much to herself she had read much and especially in profounder books she had thus become a complete philosopher of the refined that is the infidel and intellectual epicureanism which had been long fashionable in rome of christianity she knew nothing except that she understood it to be something very low material and vulgar she despised it in fact too much to think of inquiring into it and as to paganism with its gods its vices its fables and its idolatry she merely scorned it though outwardly she followed it in fact she believed in nothing beyond the present life and thought of nothing except its refined enjoyment but her very pride threw a shield over her virtue she loathed the wickedness of heathen society as she despised the frivolous youths who paid her jealously exacted attention for she found amusement in their follies she was considered cold and selfish but she was morally irreproachable if at the beginning we seem to indulge in long descriptions we trust that our reader will believe they are requisite to put him in possession of the state of material and social rome at the period of our narrative and will make this the more intelligible and should he be tempted to think that we describe things as over splendid and refined for an age of decline in arts and good taste we beg to remind him that the year we are supposed to visit rome is not as remote from the better periods of roman art for example that of the antonines as our age is from that of Cellini, raphael or donatello yet in how many italian palaces are still preserved works by these great artists 
fully prized though no longer imitated so no doubt it was with the houses belonging to the old and wealthy families of rome we find then fabiola reclining on her couch holding in her left hand a silver mirror with a handle and in the other a strange instrument for so fair a hand it is a sharp pointed stiletto with a delicately carved ivory handle and a gold ring to hold it by this was the favorite weapon with which roman ladies punished their slaves or vented their passion on them upon suffering the least annoyance or when irritated by pettish anger three female slaves are now engaged about their mistress they belong to different races and have been purchased at high prices not merely on account of their appearance but for some rare accomplishment they are supposed to possess one is black not of the degraded negro stock but from one of those races such as the abyssinians and numidians in whom the features are as regular as in the asiatic people she is supposed to have great skill in herbs and their cosmetic and healing properties perhaps also in more dangerous uses in compounding philtres charms and possibly poisons she is merely known by her national designation as afra a greek comes next selected for her taste in dress and for the elegance and purity of her accent she is therefore called graia the name which the third bears Syra, tells us that she comes from asia and she is distinguished for her exquisite embroidering and for her assiduous diligence she is quiet silent but completely engaged with the duties which now devolve upon her the other two are garrulous light and make great pretense about any little thing they do every moment they address the most extravagant flattery to their young mistress or try to promote the suit of one or other of the profligate candidates for her hand who has best or last bribed them how delighted i should be most noble mistress said the black slave if i could only be in the triclinium this evening as you enter in to observe the brilliant effect of this new stibium on your guests it has cost me many trials before i could obtain it so perfect i am sure nothing like it has been ever seen in rome as for me interrupted the wily greek i should not presume to aspire to so high an honour i should be satisfied to look from outside the door and see the magnificent effect of this wonderful silk tunic which came with the last remittance of gold from asia nothing can equal its beauty nor i may add is its arrangement the result of my study unworthy of the materials and you syra interposed the mistress with a contemptuous smile what would you desire and what have you in praise of your own doing nothing to desire noble lady but that you may be ever happy nothing to praise of my own doing for i am not conscious of having done more than my duty was the modest and sincere reply it did not please the haughty lady who said methinks slave that you are not over given to praise one seldom hears a soft word from your mouth and what worth would it be for me answered Syra, from a poor servant to a noble dame accustomed to hear it all day long from eloquent and polished lips do you believe it when you hear it from them do you not despise it when you receive it from us a look of spite was darted at her from her two companions fabiola too was angry at what she thought a reproof a lofty sentiment in a slave have you yet to learn then she answered haughtily that you are mine and have been bought by me at a high price that you might serve me as i please i have as good a right to the service of your tongue as of your arms and if it please me to be praised and flattered and sung to by you do what you shall whether you like it or not a new idea indeed that a slave has to have any will but that of her mistress when her very life belongs to her true replied the handmaid calmly but with dignity my life belongs to you and so does all else that ends with life time health vigour body and breath all this you have bought with your gold and it has become your property but i still hold as my own what no emperor's wealth can purchase no chains of slavery fetter no limit of life contain and pray what is that a soul a soul re-echoed the astonished fabiola who had never before heard a slave claim ownership of such a property and pray let me ask you what you mean by the word i cannot speak philosophical sentences answered the servant but i mean that inward living consciousness within me which makes me feel to have an existence with and among better things than surround me which shrinks sensitively from destruction and instinctively from what is allied to it as disease is to death and therefore it abhors all flattery and it detests a lie 
while i possess that unseen gift and die it cannot either is impossible to me the other two could understand but little of all this so they stood in stupid amazement at the presumption of their companion fabiola too was startled but her pride soon rose again and she spoke with visible impatience where did you learn all this folly who has taught you to prat in this manner for my part i have studied for many years and have come to the conclusion that all ideas of spiritual existences are the dreams of poets or sophists and as such i despise them do you an ignorant uneducated slave pretend to know better than your mistress or do you really fancy that when after death your corpse will be thrown on the heap of slaves who have drunk themselves or have been scourged to death to be burnt in one ignominious pile and when the mingled ashes have been buried in a common pit you will survive as a conscious being and have still a life of joy and freedom to be lived non omnis mariere as one of your poets says replied modestly but with a fervent look that astonished your mistress the foreign slave yes i hope nay i intend to survive all this and more yet i believe and know that out of the charnel pit which you have so feelingly described there is a hand that will pick out each charred fragment of my frame and there is a power that will call to reckoning the four winds of heaven and make each give back every grain of my dust that it has scattered and i shall be built up once more in this my body not as yours or any one's bondwoman but free and joyful and glorious loving for ever and beloved this certain hope is laid up in my bosom what wild visions of an eastern fancy are these unfitting you for every duty you must be cured of them in what school did you learn all this nonsense i never read of it in any greek or latin author in one belonging to my own land a school in which there is no distinction known or admitted between greek or barbarian freeman or slave what exclaimed with strong excitement the haughty lady without waiting even for that future ideal existence after death already even now you presume to claim equality with me nay who knows perhaps superiority over me come tell me at once and without daring to equivocate or disguise if you do so or not and she sat up in an attitude of eager expectation at every word of the calm reply her agitation increased and the violent passions seemed to contend within her as Sira said most noble mistress far superior are you to me in place and power and learning and genius and in all that enriches and embellishes life and in every grace of form and lineament and in every charm of act and speech high are you raised above all rivalry and far removed from envious thought from one so lowly and so insignificant as i but if i must answer simple truth to your authoritative question she paused as faltering but an imperious gesture from her mistress bade her continue then i put it to your own judgment whether a poor slave who holds an unquenchable consciousness of possessing within her a spiritual and living intelligence whose measure of existence is immortality whose only true place of dwelling is above the skies whose only rightful prototype is the deity can hold herself inferior in royal dignity or lower in greatness of thought than one who however gifted owns that she claims no higher destiny recognizes in herself no sublimer end than what awaits the pretty irrational songsters that beat without hope of liberty against the gilded bars of that cage fabiola's eyes flashed with fury she felt herself for the first time in her life rebuked humbled by a slave she grasped the style in her right hand and made an almost blind thrust at the unflinching handmaid Sira instinctively put forward her arm to save her person and received the point which aimed upward from the couch inflicted a deeper gash than she had ever before suffered the tears started into her eyes through the smart of the wound from which the blood gushed in a stream fabiola was in a moment ashamed of her cruel though unintentional act and felt still more humble before her servants go go she said to syra who was staunching the blood with her handkerchief go to your frozen and have the wound dressed i did not mean to hurt you so grievously but stay a moment I must make you some compensation then after turning over her trinkets on the table she continued take this ring and you need not return here again this evening fabiola's conscience was quite satisfied she had made what she considered ample atonement for the injury she had inflicted in the shape of a costly present to a menial dependent and on the following sunday in the title of st pastor not far from her house among the alms collected for the poor was found a valuable emerald ring
which a good priest polycarp thought must have been the offering of some very rich roman lady but which he who watched with beaming eye the alms coffer of jerusalem and noted the widow's might alone saw dropped into the chest by the bandaged arm of a foreign female slave End of section four. Section five of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, piece. Chapter five. The visit. During the latter part of the dialogue just recorded, and the catastrophe which closed it, there took place an apparition in Fabiola's room, which, if seen by her, would probably have cut short the one and prevented the other. The interior chambers in a Roman house were more frequently divided by curtains across their entrances than by doors, and thus it was easy, especially during such an excited scene as had just taken place, to enter unobserved. This was the case now, and when Syra turned to leave the room, she was almost startled at seeing standing, in bright relief before the deep crimson door curtain, a figure which she immediately recognized but which we must briefly describe. It was that of a lady, or rather a child, not more than twelve or thirteen years old, dressed in pure and spotless white, without a single ornament about her person. In her countenance might be seen united the simplicity of childhood with the intelligence of a maturer age. There not merely dwelt in her eyes that dove-like innocence which the sacred poet describes, but often there beamed from them rather an intensity of pure affection as though they were looking beyond all surrounding objects and rested upon one unseen by all else but to her really present and exquisitely dear her forehead was the very seat of candour open and bright with undisguising truthfulness a kindly smile played about the lips and the fresh youthful features varied their sensitive expression with guileless earnestness passing rapidly from one feeling to the other as her warm and tender heart received it those who knew her believed that she never thought of herself, but was divided entirely between kindness to those about her and affection for her unseen love. When Syra saw this beautiful vision, like that of an angel before her, she paused for a moment. But the child took her hand and reverently kissed it, saying, I have seen all. Meet me in the small chamber near the entrance when I go out. She then advanced, and as Fabiola saw her, a crimson blush mantled in her cheek for she feared the child had been witness of her undignified burst of passion. With a cold wave of her hand she dismissed her slaves, and then greeted her kinswoman, for such she was, with cordial affection. We have said that Fabiola's temper made a few exceptions in its haughty exercise. One of these was her old nurse and freedwoman, Euphrosian, who directed all her private household, and whose only creed was that Fabiola was the most perfect of beings the wisest, most accomplished, most admirable lady in Rome. Another was her young visitor, whom she loved and ever treated with gentlest affection, and whose society she always coveted. "'This is really kind of you, dear Agnes,' said the softened Fabiola, "'to come at my sudden request, to join our table to-day. But the fact is, my father has called in one or two new people to dine, and I was anxious to have someone with whom I could have the excuse of a duty to converse.' yet I own I have some curiosity about one of our new guests. It is Fulvius, of whose grace, wealth, and accomplishments I hear so much, though nobody seems to know who or what he is, or whence he has sprung up. My dear Fabiola, replied Agnes, you know I am always happy to visit you, and my kind parents willingly allow me. Therefore, make no apologies about that. And so you have come to me as usual, said the other playfully, in your own snow-white dress, without jewel or ornament, as if you were every day a bride. But you always seem to me to be celebrating one eternal espousal. But, good heavens, what is this? Are you hurt? Or are you aware that there is right on the bosom of your tunic a large red spot? It looks like blood. If so, let me change your dress at once. Not for the world, Fabiola. It is the jewel, the only ornament I mean to wear this evening. It is blood and that of a slave, but nobler in my eyes and more generous than flows in your veins or mine. The whole truth flashed upon Fabiola's mind. Agnes had seen all, and humbled almost to sickening, she said somewhat pettishly, Do you then wish to exhibit proof to all the world of my hastiness of temper and over-chastising a forward slave? 
no dear cousin far from it i only wish to preserve for myself a lesson of fortitude and of elevation of mind learnt from a slave such as few patrician philosophers can teach us what a strange idea indeed agnes i have often thought that you make too much of that class of people after all what are they human beings as much as ourselves endowed with the same reason the same feelings the same organization thus far you will admit at any rate to go no higher then they form part of the same family and if god from whom comes our life is thereby our father he is theirs as much and consequently they are our brethren a slave my brother or sister agnes the gods forbid it they are our property and our goods and i have no notion of their being allowed to move to act to think or to feel except as it suits their masters or is for their advantage come come said agnes with her sweetest tones do not let us get into a warm discussion you are too candid and honourable not to feel and to be ready to acknowledge that to-day you have been outdone by a slave in all that you most admire in mind in reasoning in truthfulness and in heroic fortitude do not answer me i see it in that tear but dearest cousin i will save you from a repetition of your pain will you grant me my request any my power then it is that you will allow me to purchase sira i think that is her name you would not like to see her about you you are mistaken agnes i will master pride for once and own that i shall now esteem her perhaps almost admire her it is a new feeling in me towards one in her station but i think fabiola i could make her happier than she is no doubt dear agnes you have the power of making everybody happy about you i never saw such a household as yours you seem to carry out in practice that strange philosophy which they were alluded to in which there is no distinction of freeman and slave everybody in your house is always smiling and cheerfully anxious to discharge his duties and there seems to be no one who thinks of commanding come tell me your secret agnes smiled i suspect you little magician that in that mysterious chamber which you will never open for me you keep your charms and potions by which you make every body and everything love you if you were a christian and were exposed in the amphitheatre i am sure the leopards would crouch and nestle at your feet but why do you look so serious child you know i am only joking agnes seemed absorbed and bent forward that keen and tender look which we have mentioned as though she saw before her nay as if she heard speaking to her some one delicately beloved it passed away and she gaily said well well fabiola stranger things have come to pass and at any rate if aught so dreadful had to happen sarah would be just the sort of person one would like to see near one so you really must let me have her for heaven's sake agnes do not take my words so seriously i assure you they were spoken in jest i have too high an opinion of your good sense to believe such a calamity possible but as to sarah's devotedness you are right when last summer you were away and i was so dangerously ill of contagious fever it required the lash to make the other slaves approach me well that poor thing would hardly leave me but watched by me and nursed me day and night and i really believe greatly promoted my recovery and did you not love her for this love her love a slave child of course i took care to reward her generously though i cannot make out what she does with what i give her the others tell me she has nothing put by and she certainly spends nothing on herself nay i have even heard that she foolishly shares her daily allowance of food with a blind beggar girl what a strange fancy to be sure dearest fabiola exclaimed agnes she must be mine you promised me my request name your price and let me take her home this evening well be it so you most irresistible of petitioners but we will not bargain together send some one to-morrow to see my father's steward and all will be right and now this great piece of business being settled between us let us go down to our guests but you have forgotten to put on your jewels never mind them i will do without them for once i feel no taste for them to-day End of section 5section six of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese 
Part First Peace Chapter Six The Banquet They found on descending all the guests assembled in a hall below. It was not a state banquet which they were going to share, but the usual meal of a rich house, where preparation for a table full of friends was always made. We will therefore content ourselves with saying that everything was elegant and exquisite in arrangement and material, and we will confine ourselves entirely to such incidents as may throw a light upon our story. When the two ladies entered the exedra or hall, Fabius, after saluting his daughter, exclaimed, Why, my child, you have come down, though late, still scarcely fittingly arranged. You have forgotten your usual trinkets. Fabiola was confused. She knew not what answer to make. She was ashamed of her weakness about her angry display, and still more of what she now thought a silly way of punishing herself for it. Agnes stepped in to the rescue, and blushingly said, "'It is my fault, cousin Fabius, both that she is late and that she is so plainly dressed. I detained her with my gossip, and no doubt she wishes to keep me in countenance by the simplicity of her attire.' "'You, dear Agnes,' replied the father, "'are privileged to do as you please.' but seriously speaking i must say that even with you this may have answered while you were a mere child now that you are marriageable you must begin to make a little more display and try to win the affections of some handsome and eligible youth a beautiful necklace for instance such as you have plenty of at home would not make you less attractive but you are not attending to me come come i dare say you have someone already in view during most of this address which was meant to be thoroughly good-natured as it was perfectly worldly, Agnes appeared in one of her abstracted moods, her bewitched looks, as Fabiola called them, transfixed in a smiling ecstasy, as if attending to some one else, but never losing the thread of the discourse, nor saying anything out of place. She therefore at once answered Fabius, "'Oh, yes, most certainly, one who has already pledged me to him by his betrothal ring, and has adorned me with immense jewels.' "'Really?' asked Fabius, with what? Why, answered Agnes with a look of glowing earnestness, and in tones of artless simplicity, he has girded my hand and neck with precious gems, and has set in my ears rings of peerless pearls. Goodness, who can it be? Come, Agnes, some day you must tell me your secret, your first love, no doubt. May it last long and make you happy. Forever, was her reply as she turned to join Fabiola and entered with her into the dining-room. It was while well she had not overheard this dialogue, or she would have been hurt to the quick, as thinking that Agnes had concealed the most important thought of her age, as she would have considered it, from her most loving friend. But while Agnes was defending her, she had turned away from her father, and had been attending to the other guests. One was a heavy, thick-necked Roman sophist, or dealer in universal knowledge, named Calpurnius. Another, Proculus, a mere lover of good fare, often at the house. Two more remained, deserving further notice. The first of them, evidently a favorite both of Fabiola and Agnes, was a tribune, a high officer of the imperial or praetorian guard. Though not above thirty years of age, he had already distinguished himself by his valor, and enjoyed the highest favor with the emperors Diocletian in the east and Maximian Hercules in Rome. He was free from all affection in manner or dress, though handsome in person, and though most engaging in conversation, he manifestly scorned the foolish topics which generally occupy society. In short, he was a perfect specimen of a noble-hearted youth, full of honor and generous thoughts, strong and brave, without a particle of pride or display in him. Quite a contrast to him was the last guest already alluded to by Fabiola, the new star of society, Fulvius. Young and almost effeminate in look, dressed with the most elaborate elegance, with brilliant rings on every finger and jewels in his dress, affected in his speech, which had a slightly foreign accent, overstrained in his courtesy of manners, but apparently good-natured and obliging, he had, in a short time, quietly pushed his way into the highest society of Rome. This was, indeed, owing partly to his having been seen at the imperial court, and partly to the fascination of his manner. He had arrived in Rome, accompanied by a single utterly attendant, evidently deeply attached to him, whether slave, freedman, or friend, nobody well knew. They spoke together always in a strange tongue, and the swarthy features, keen fiery eye, and unamiable expression of the domestic inspired a certain degree of fear in his dependence. 
for fulvius had taken an apartment in what was called an insula or house let out in parts had furnished it luxuriously and had peopled it with a sufficient bachelor's establishment of slaves profusion rather than abundance distinguished all his domestic arrangements and in the corrupted and degraded circle of pagan rome the obscurity of his history and the suddenness of his apparition were soon forgotten in the evidence of his riches and the charm of his loose conversation a shrewd observer of character however would soon notice a wandering restlessness of eye and an eagerness of listening attention for all sights and sounds around him which betrayed an insatiable curiosity and in moments of forgetfulness a dark scowl under his knit brows from its flashing eyes and a curling of the upper lip which inspired a feeling of mistrust and gave an idea that his exterior softness only clothed the character of feline malignity the guests were soon at table and as ladies sat while men reclined on couches during the repast fabiola and agnes were together on one side the two younger guests last described were opposite and the master with his two elder friends in the middle if these terms can be used to describe their position about three parts of a round table one side being left unencumbered by the sigma or semicircle couch for the convenience of serving and we may observe in passing that a tablecloth a luxury unknown in the times of horace was now in ordinary use when the first claims of hunger or the palate had been satisfied conversation grew more general what news to-day at the baths asked calpurnius i have no leisure myself to look after such trifles very interesting news indeed answered proculus it seems quite certain that orders have been received from the divine diocletian to finish his thermae in three years impossible exclaimed fabius i looked in at the works the other day on my way to salus gardens and found them very little advanced in the last year there is an immense deal of heavy work to be done such as carving marbles and shaping columns true interposed fulvius but i know that orders have been sent to all parts to forward hither all prisoners and all persons condemned to the mines in spain sardinia and even Tersonius, who can possibly be spared to come and labour at the thermae a few thousand christians thus set to work will soon finish it and why christians better than other criminals asked with some curiosity fabiola why really said fulvius with his most winning smile i can hardly give reason for it but the fact is so among fifty workmen so condemned i would engage to pick out a single christian indeed exclaimed several at once pray how ordinary convicts answered he naturally do not love their work and they require the lash at every step to compel them to perform it and when the overseer's eye is off them no work is done and moreover they are of course rude sottish quarrelsome and querulous but the christian when condemned to these public works seem on the contrary to be glad and are always cheerful and obedient i have seen young patricians so occupied in asia whose hands had never before handled a pickaxe and whose weak shoulders had never borne a weight yet working hard and as happy to all appearance as when at home of course for all that the overseers apply the lash and the stick very freely to them and most justly because it is the will of the divine emperors that their lot should be made as hard as possible but still they never complain i cannot say that i admire this sort of justice replied fabiola but what a strange race they must be i am most curious to know what can be the motive or cause of this stupidity or unnatural insensibility in these christians proculus replied with a facetious look copernius here no doubt can tell us for he is a philosopher and i hear could declaim for an hour on any topic from the alps to an ant hill copernius thus challenged and thinking himself highly complimented solemnly gave mouth the christians said he are a foreign sect the founder which flourished many ages ago in chaldea his doctrines were brought to rome at the time of vespasian by two brothers named peter and paul some maintain that these were the same twin brothers as the jews call moses and aaron the second of whom sold his birthright to his brother for a kid the skin of which he wanted to make a chirothka of but this identity i do not admit as it is recorded in the mystical books of the jews that the second of these brothers seeing the other's victims give better omens of birds than his own slew him as our romulus did remus but with the jawbone of an ass for which he was hung by king mordecaius of macedon 
upon a gibbet fifty cubits high at the suit of their sister judith however peter and paul coming as i said to rome the former was discovered to be a fugitive slave of pontius pilate and was crucified by his master's orders on the geniculum their followers of whom they had many made the cross their symbol and adore it and they think it the greatest honour to suffer stripes and even ignominious death as the best means of being like their teachers and as they fancy of going to them in a place somewhere among the clouds this lucid explanation of the origin of christianity was listened to with admiration by all except two the young officer gave a piteous look towards agnes which seemed to say shall i answer the goose or shall i laugh outright but she put her finger on her lips and smiled imploringly for silence well then the upshot of it is observed proculus that the thermae will be finished soon and we shall have glorious sport is it not said fulvius that the divine diocletian will himself come to the dedication it is quite certain and so will there be splendid festivals and glorious games but we shall not have to wait so long already for other purposes have orders been sent to numidia for an unlimited supply of lions and lepers to be ready before winter then turning round sharp to his neighbour he said bending a keen eye upon his countenance a brave soldier like you sebastian must be delighted with the noble spectacles of the amphitheatre especially when directed against the enemies of the august emperors and of the republic the officer raised himself upon his couch looked on his interrogator with an unmoved majestic countenance and answered calmly fulvius i should not deserve the title which you give me could i contemplate with pleasure in cold blood the struggle if it deserved the name between a brute beast and a helpless child or woman for such are the spectacles which you call noble no i will draw my sword willingly against any enemy of the princes or the state but i would as readily draw it against the lion or the leopard that should rush even by imperial order against the innocent and defenceless fulvius was starting up but sebastian placed a strong hand upon his arm and continued hear me out i am not the first roman nor the noblest who has thought thus before me remember the words of cicero magnificent are these games no doubt but what delight can it be to a refined mind to see either a feeble man torn by a most powerful beast or a noble animal pierced through by a javelin i am not ashamed of agreeing with the greatest of roman orators then shall we never see you in the amphitheatre sebastian asked fulvius with a bland but taunting tone if you do the soldier replied depend on it it will be on the side of the defenceless not on that of the brutes that would destroy them sebastian is right exclaimed fabiola clapping her hands and i close the discussion by my applause i have never heard sebastian speak except on the side of generous and high-minded sentiments fulvius bit his lip in silence and all rose to depart end of section six Section 7 of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part First, Peace. Chapter 7 Poor and Rich. During the latter part of the conversation just recorded, Fabius had been quite abstracted, speculating upon his conversation with Agnes. How quietly she had kept her secret to herself but who could this favoured person be who had already won her heart he thought over many but could find no answer the gift of rich jewels particularly perplexed him he knew no young rebel nobleman likely to possess them and sauntering as he did every day into the great shops he was sure to have heard if any such costly order had been given suddenly the bright idea flashed through his mind that fulvius who daily exhibited new and splendid gems brought from abroad could be the only person able to make her such presence. He moreover noticed such occasional looks darted towards his cousin by the handsome foreigner, as left him no doubt that he was deeply enamoured of her, and if Agnes did not seem conscious of the admiration, this of course was part of her plan. Once convinced of the important conclusion, he determined to favour the wishes of the two, and astonish his daughter one day by the sagacity he had displayed. 
but we must leave our nobler guests for more humble scenes and follow Syra from the time that she left her young mistress's apartment when she presented herself to euphrosion the good-natured nurse was shocked at the cruel wound and uttered an exclamation of pity but immediately recognizing it the work of fabiola she was divided between two contending feelings poor thing she said as she went on first washing then closing and dressing the gash it is a dreadful cut what did you do to deserve it how it must have hurt you my poor girl but how wicked you must have been to bring it upon yourself it is a savage wound yet inflicted by the gentlest of creatures you must be faint from loss of blood take this cordial to support you and no doubt she found herself obliged to strike no doubt said Syrah, amused it was all my fault i had no business to argue with my mistress argue with her argue oh ye gods who ever heard before of a slave arguing with a noble mistress and such a learned one why copernius himself would be afraid of disputing with her no wonder indeed she was so so agitated as not to know that she was hurting you but this must be concealed it must not be known that you have been so wrong have you no scarf or nice veil that we could throw round the arm as if for ornament all the others i know have plenty given or bought but you never seem to care for these pretty things let us look she went into the maid slave's dormitory which was within her room opened Sira's capsa or box and after turning over in vain its scanty contents she drew forth from the bottom a square kerchief of richest stuff magnificently embroidered and even adorned with pearls Sira blushed deeply and entreated not to be obliged to wear this most disproportioned piece of dress especially as it was a token of better days long and painfully preserved but euphrosion anxious to hide her mistress's fault was inexorable and the rich scarf was gracefully fastened around the wounded arm this operation performed Sira proceeded to the little parlour opposite the porter's room where the higher slaves could see their friends she held in her hand a basket covered with a napkin the moment she entered the door a light step came bounding across the room to meet her it was that of a girl of about sixteen or seventeen dressed in the poorest attire but clean and neat who threw her arms round Sira's neck with such a bright countenance and such hearty glee that a bystander would hardly have supposed that her sightless eyes had never communed with the outer world sit down dear cecilia said Sira, with a most affectionate tone and leading her to a seat to-day i have brought you a famous feast you will fare sumptuously how so i think i do every day no but to-day my mistress has kindly sent me out a dainty dish from her table and i have brought it here for you how kind of her yet how much kinder of you my sister but why have you not partaken of it yourself it was meant for you and not for me why to tell the truth it is a greater treat to me to see you enjoy anything than to enjoy it myself no dear Sira, no it must not be god has wished me to be poor and i must try to do his will i could no more think of eating the food than i could of wearing the dress of the rich so long as i can obtain that of the poor i love to share with you your pimentum which i know is given me in charity by one poor like myself i procure for you the merit of alms deeds you give me the consolation of feeling that i am before god still only a poor blind thing i think you will love me better thus than if feeding on luxurious fare i would rather be with lazarus at the gate than with divas at the table how much better and wiser you are than i my good child it shall be as you wish i will give the dish to my companions and in the meantime here i set before you your usual humble fare thanks thanks dear sister i will await your return Sarah went to the maid's apartment and put before her jealous but greedy companions the silver dish as their mistress occasionally showed them this little kindness it did not much surprise them but the poor servant was weak enough to feel ashamed of appearing before her comrades with a rich scarf round her arm she took it off before she entered then not wishing to displease euphrosion replaced it as well as she could with one hand on coming out she was in the court below returning to her blind friend when she saw one of the noble guests of her mistress's table alone and with a mortified look crossing toward the door and she stepped behind a column to avoid any possible and not uncommon rudeness it was fulvius and no sooner did she unseen catch a glimpse of him than she stood for a moment as one nailed to the spot 
her heart beat against her bosom then quivered as if about to cease its action her knees struck against one another a shiver ran through her frame the perspiration started on her brow her eyes wide open were fascinated like the birds before the snake she raised her hand to her breast made upon it the sign of life and the spell was broken she fled in an instant still unnoticed and had hardly stepped noiselessly behind a curtain that closed the stairs when fulvius with downcast eyes reached the spot on which she had stood he started back a step as if scared by something lying before it he trembled violently but recovering himself by a sudden effort he looked around him and saw that he was alone there was no eye upon him except one which he did not heed but which read his evil heart in that hour he gazed again upon the object and stooped to pick it up but drew back his hand and that more than once at last he heard footsteps approaching he recognized the martial tread of sebastian and hastily he snatched up from the ground the rich scarf which had dropped from Syra's arm he shook as he folded it up and when to his horror he found upon it spots of fresh blood which had oozed through the bandages he reeled like a drunken man to the door and rushed to his lodgings pale sick and staggering he went into his chamber repulsing roughly the officious advances of his slaves and only beckoned to his faithful domestic to follow him and then signed to him to bar the door a lamp was burning brightly by the table on which fulvius threw the embroidered scarf in silence and pointed to the stains of blood that dark man said nothing but his swarthy countenance was blanched while his master's was ashy and livid it is the same no doubt at length spoke the attendant in their foreign tongue but she is certainly dead are thou quite sure eratus asked the master with the keenest of his hawk's looks as sure as man can be of what he has not seen himself where didst thou find this and whence this blood i will tell thee all to-morrow i am too sick to-night as to those stains which were liquid when i found it i know not whence they came unless they are warnings of vengeance nay a vengeance himself deep as the furies can meditate fierce as they could launch that blood has not been shed now tut tut this is no time for dreams or fancies did any one see thee pick the the thing up no one i am sure then we are safe better in our hands than in others a good night's rest will give us better counsel true eurotus but do thou sleep this night in my chamber both threw themselves on their couches fulvius on the rich bed Eurotus on a lowly pallet, from which, raised upon his elbow with dark but earnest eye, he long watched by the lamp's light the troubled slumbers of the youth, at once his devoted guardian and his evil genius. Fulvius tossed about and moaned in his sleep, for his dreams were gloomy and heavy. First he sees before him a beautiful city in a distant land, with a river of crystal brightness flowing through it. Upon it is a galley weighing anchor, with a figure on deck, waving towards him, in farewell an embroidered scarf the scene changes the ship is in the midst of the sea battling with a furious storm while on the summit of the mast the same scarf streams out like a pennant unruffled and uncrumbled by the breeze the vessel is now dashed upon a rock and all with a dreadful shriek are buried in the deep but the top mast stands above the billows with its calm and brilliant flag till amidst the sea-birds that shriek around a form with a torch in her hand and black flapping wings flies by snatches it from the staff and with a look of stern anger displays it as in her flight she pauses before him he reads upon it written in fiery letters nemesis but it is time to return to our other acquaintances in the house of fabius after Syra had heard the door close on fulvius she paused to compose herself offered up a secret prayer and returned to her blind friend she had finished her frugal meal and was waiting patiently the slave's return. Sarah then commenced her daily duties of kindness and hospitality. She brought water, washed her hands and feet in obedience to Christian practice, and combed and dressed her hair, as if the poor creature had been her own child. Indeed, though not much older, her look was so tender, as she hung over her poor friend, her tones were so soft, her whole action so motherly, that one would have thought it was a parent ministering to her daughter, rather than a slave serving a beggar. 
and this beggar too looked so happy spoke so cheerily and said such beautiful things that syra lingered over her work to listen to her and gaze on her it was at this moment that agnes came for her appointed interview and fabiola insisted on accompanying her to the door but when agnes softly raised the curtain and caught a sight of the scene before her she beckoned to fabiola to look in enjoining silence by her gesture the blind girl was opposite and her voluntary servant on one side unconscious of witnesses the heart of fabiola was touched and she had never imagined that there was such a thing as disinterested love on earth between strangers as to charity it was a word unknown to greece or rome she retreated quietly with a tear in her eye and said to agnes as she took leave i must retire that girl as you know proved to me this afternoon that a slave may have a head she has now shown me that she may have a heart i was amazed when a few hours ago you asked me if i did not love a slave i think now i could almost love syrah i have forget that i have agreed to part with her as she went back into the court agnes entered the room and laughing said so cecilia i have found out your secret at last this is the friend whose food you have always said was so much better than mine that you would never eat in my house well if the dinner is not better at any rate i agree that you have fallen in with a better hostess oh don't say so sweet lady agnes answered the blind girl it is the dinner indeed that is better you have plenty of opportunities for exercising charity but a poor slave can only do so by finding someone still poorer and helpless like me that thought makes her food by far the sweetest well you are right said agnes and i am not sorry to have you present to hear the good news i bring to syra it will make you happy too fabiola has allowed me to become your mistress syra and to take you with me to-morrow you shall be free and a dear sister to me cecilia clapped her hands with joy and throwing her arms round syra's neck exclaimed oh how good how happy you will now be dear syra but syra was deeply troubled and replied with faltering voice oh good and gentle lady you have been kind indeed to think so much about one like me but pardon me if i entreat you to remain as i am i assure you dear cecilia i am quite happy here but why wish to stay asked agnes because rejoined syra it is most perfect to abide with god in the state wherein we have been called i own this is not the one in which i was born i have been brought to it by others a burst of tears interrupted her for a moment and then she went on but so much the more clear is it to me that god has willed me to serve him in this condition how can i wish to leave it well then said agnes still more eagerly we can easily manage it i will not free you and you shall be my bondwoman that will be just the same no no said syra smiling that will never do our great apostle's instructions to us are servants be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle but also to the froward i am far from saying that my mistress is one of these but you noble lady agnes are too good and gentle for me where would be my cross if i lived with you you do not know how proud and how strong i am by nature and i should fear for myself if i had not some pain and humiliation agnes was almost overcome but she was more eager than ever to possess such a treasure of virtue and said i see syra that no motive addressed to your own interest can move you i must therefore use a more selfish plea I want to have you with me that i may improve by your advice and example come you will not refuse such a request selfish replied the slave you can never be and therefore i will appeal to yourself from your request you know fabiola and you love her what a noble soul and what a splendid intellect she possesses what great qualities and high accomplishments if they only reflected the light of truth and how jealously does she guard in herself that pearl of virtues which only we know how to prize what a truly great christian she would make go on for god's sake dear syra broke out agnes all eagerness and do you hope for it it is my prayer day and night it is my chief thought and aim it is the occupation of my life 
i will try to win her by patience by assiduity even by such unusual discussions as we have held to-day and when all is exhausted i have one resource more what is that both asked to give my life for her conversion i know that a poor slave like me has few chances of martyrdom still a fiercer persecution is said to be approaching and perhaps it will not disdain such humble victims but be that as god pleases my life for her soul is placed in his hands and oh dearest best of ladies she exclaimed falling on her knees and bedewing agnes's hand with tears do not come in thus between me and my prize you have conquered sister syra oh never again call me lady said agnes remain at your post such single-hearted generous virtue must triumph it is too sublime for so homely a sphere as my household and i for my part subjoined cecilia with a look of arch gravity say that she has said one very wicked thing and told a great story this evening what is that my pet asked sarah laughing why you said that i was wiser and better than you because i declined eating some trumpery delicacy which would have gratified my palate for a few minutes at the expense of an act of greediness while you have given up liberty happiness the free exercise of your religion and have offered to give up life itself for the salvation of one who is your tyrant and tormentor oh fie how could you tell me such a thing the servant now announced that agnes's litter was waiting at the door and any one who could have seen the affectionate farewell of the three the noble lady the slave and the beggar would have justly exclaimed as people had often done before see how these christians love one another End of section seven. Section eight of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, peace. Chapter eight. The first day's conclusion. If we linger a little time about the door and see Agnes fairly off and listen to the merry conversation between her and cecilia in which agnes asked her to allow herself to be accompanied home by one of her attendants as it has grown dark and the girl is amused at the lady's forgetfulness that day and night are the same to her and that on this very account she is the appointed guide to thread the mazes of the catacombs familiar to her as the streets of rome which she walks in safety at all hours if thus we pass a little time before re-entering to inquire how the mistress within fares after the day's adventures we shall find the house turned topsy-turvy slaves with lamps and torches are running about in every direction looking for something or other that is lost in every possible and impossible place euphrosian insists it must be found till at last the search is given up in despair the reader will probably have anticipated the solution of the mystery Sarah had presented herself to have her wound redressed, according to orders, and the scarf which had bound it was no longer there. She could give no account of it, further than she had taken it off and put it on, certainly not so well as Euphrosian had done it, and she gave the reason, for she scorned to tell a lie. Indeed, she had never missed it till now. The kind-hearted old nurse was much grieved at the loss, which she considered must be heavy to a poor slave girl as she probably reserved the object for the purchase of her liberty and Sarah too was sorry but for reasons which she could not have made the good housekeeper comprehend euphrosian had all the servants interrogated and many even searched to Sarah's great pain and confusion and then ordered a grand general battue through every part of the house where Sarah had been who for a moment could have dreamt of suspecting a noble guest at the master's table of purloining any article valuable or not the old lady therefore came to the conclusion that the scarf had been spirited away by some magical process and greatly suspected that the black slave afra whom she knew could not bear Sira, had been using some spell to annoy the poor girl for she believed the moor to be a very canadea being often obliged to let her go out alone at night under pretence of gathering herbs at full moon for her cosmetics as if plucked at any other time they would not possess the same virtues to be cured deadly poisons euphrosian suspected but in reality to join in the hideous orgies of fetichism with others of her race or to hold interviews with such as consulted her imaginary art it was not till all was given up and Sibra found herself alone that on more coolly recollecting the incidents of the day she remembered the pause in fulvius's walk across the court 
at the very spot where she had stood, and his hurried steps, after this, to the door. The conviction, then, flashed on her mind that she must have there dropped her kerchief, and that he must have picked it up. That he should have passed it with indifference she believed impossible. She was confident, therefore, that it was now in his possession. After attempting to speculate on the possible consequences of this misadventure, and coming to no satisfactory conclusion, she determined to commit the matter entirely to God, and sought that repose which a good conscience was sure to render balmy and sweet. Fabiola, on parting with Agnes, retired to her apartment, and after the usual services had been rendered to her by her other two servants and Euphrosyne, she dismissed them with a gentler manner than ever she had shown before. As soon as they had retired, she went to recline upon the couch, where first we found her, when to her disgust she discovered lying on it the style with which she had ruined it, Syra. She opened a chest, and threw it in with horror, nor did she ever again use any such weapon. She took up the volume which she had last laid down, and which had greatly amused her, but it was quite insipid, and seemed most frivolous to her. She laid it down again, and gave free course to her thoughts on all that had happened. It struck her first what a wonderful child her cousin Agnes was, how unselfish, how pure, how simple, how sensible, too, and even wise. She determined to be her protector, her elder sister in all things. She had observed, too, as well as her father, the frequent looks which Fulvius had fixed upon her, not, indeed, those libertine looks which she herself had often borne with scorn, but designing, cunning glances, such as she thought betray some scheme or art, of which Agnes might become the victim. She resolved to frustrate it, whatever it might be, and arrived at exactly the opposite conclusion to her father's about him. She made up her mind to prevent Fulvius having any access to Agnes, at least at her house, and even blamed herself for having brought one so young into the strange company which often met at her father's table, especially as she now found that her motives for doing so had been decidedly selfish. It was nearly at the same moment that Fulvius, tossing on his couch, had come to the determination never again, if possible, to go inside Fabius's door, and to resist or elude every invitation from him. Fabiola had measured his character, had caught, with her penetrating eye, the affection of his manner, and the cunning of his looks, and could not help contrasting him with the frank and generous Sebastian. "'What a noble fellow that Sebastian is,' she said to herself. "'How different from all the other youths that come here! Never a foolish word escapes his lips, never an unkind look darts from his bright and cheerful eye. How abstemious, as becomes a soldier, at the table! How modest, as befits a hero, about his own strength and bold actions in war, which others speak so much about!' Oh, if he only felt towards me as others pretend to do. She did not finish the sentence, but a deep melancholy seemed to steal over her whole soul. Then Sarah's conversation, and all that had resulted from it, passed again through her mind. It was painful to her, yet she could not help dwelling on it, and she felt as if that day were a crisis in her life. Her pride had been humbled by a slave, and her mind softened. She knew not how. Had her eyes been opened in that hour, and had she been able to look up above this world, she would have seen a soft cloud like incense, but tinged with a rich carnation, rising from the bedside of a kneeling slave. Prayer and willing sacrifice of life breathed upwards together, which, when it struck the crystal footstool of a mercy seat in heaven, fell down again as a dew of gentlest grace upon her arid heart. She could not indeed see this, yet it was no less true and wearied, at length she sought repose. But she too had a distressing dream. She saw a bright spot as in a delicious garden, richly illuminated by a light like noonday, but inexpressibly soft, while all around was dark. Beautiful flowers formed the sward, plants covered with richest bloom grew festooned from tree to tree, on each of which glowed golden fruit. In the midst of this space she saw the poor blind girl, with her look of happiness on her cheerful countenance, seated on the ground while on one side Agnes, with her sweetest, simplest looks, and on the other Syra, with her quiet, patient smile, hung over her and caressed her. Fabiola felt an irresistible desire to be with them. It seemed to her that they were enjoying some felicity which she had never known or witnessed, and she thought they even beckoned her to join them. She ran forward to do so, when, to her horror, 
she found a wide and black and deep ravine at the bottom of which roared a torrent between herself and them by degrees its water rose till they reached the upper margin of the dyke and there flowed though so deep yet sparkling and brilliant and most refreshing oh for courage to plunge into the stream through which alone the gorge could be crossed and land in safety on the other side and still they beckoned urging her on to try it but as she was standing on the brink clasping her hands in despair copernius seemed to emerge from the dark air around with a thick heavy curtain stretched out on which were worked all sorts of monstrous and hideous chimeras most curiously running into and interwoven with each other and this dark veil grew and grew till it shut out the beautiful vision from her sight she felt disconsolate till she seemed to see a bright genius as she called him in whose features she fancied she traced a spiritualized resemblance to sebastian and whom she had noticed standing sorrowful at a distance now approach her and smiling on her fan her fevered face with his golden purple wing when she lost her vision in a calm and refreshing sleep End of section 8「Fabiola」by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part First Piece. Chapter 9. Meetings. Of all the Roman hills, the most distinctly traceable on every side is undoubtedly the Palatine. Augustus, having chosen it for his residence, successive emperors followed his example, but gradually transformed his modest residence into a palace, which covered the entire hill. Nero, not satisfied with its dimensions, destroyed the neighborhood by fire, and then extended the imperial residence to the neighboring Esquiline, taking in the whole space now occupied between the two hills by the Colosseum. Vespasian threw down that golden house, of which the magnificent vaults remain, covered with beautiful paintings, and built the amphitheater just mentioned, and other edifices, with its materials. The entrance to the palace was made, soon after this period, from the Via Sacra, or the Sacred Way, close to the Arch of Titus. After passing through a vestibule, the visitor found himself in a magnificent court, the plan of which can be distinctly traced. Turning from this, on the left side, he entered into an immense square space, arranged and consecrated to Adonis by Domitian, and planted with trees, shrubs, and flowers. Still keeping to the left, he would enter into sets of chambers, constructed by Alexander Severus, in honor of his mother Mamee, whose name they bore. They looked out opposite to the Chilean hill, just at the angle of it, which abuts upon the latter triumphal arch of Constantine, and the fountain called the Metasedans. Here was the apartment occupied by Sebastian as a tribune or superior officer of the imperial guard. It consisted of a few rooms, most modestly furnished, as became a soldier and a Christian. His household was limited to a couple of freedmen and a venerable matron, who had been his nurse and loved him as a child. They were Christians, as were all the men in his cohort, partly by conversion, but chiefly by care in recruiting new soldiers. It was a few evenings after the scenes described in the last chapter that Sebastian, a couple of hours after dark, ascended the steps of the vestibule just described, in company with another youth, of whom we have already spoken. Pancratius admired and loved Sebastian with the sort of affection that an ardent young officer may be supposed to bear towards an older and gallant soldier, who receives him into his friendship. But it was not as to a soldier of Caesar, but as to a champion of Christ that the civilian boy looked up to the young tribune, whose generosity, noble-mindedness, and valor were enshrouded in such a gentle, simple bearing, and were accompanied by such prudence and considerateness, as gave confidence and encouragement to all that dealt with him. And Sebastian loved Pancratius no less, on account of his single-hearted ardor and the innocence and candor of his mind. But he well saw the dangers to which his youthful warmth and impetuosity might lead him, and he encouraged him to keep close to himself that he might guide and perhaps sometimes restrain him as they were entering the palace that part of which sebastian's cohort guarded he said to his companion every time that i enter here it strikes me how kind and active divine providence it was to plant almost at the very gate of caesar's palace the arch which commemorates at once the downfall of the first great system that was antagonistic to christianity 
and the completion of the greatest prophecy of the gospel the destruction of jerusalem by the roman power i cannot but believe that another arch will one day arise to commemorate no less a victory over the second enemy of our religion the heathen roman empire itself what do you contemplate the overthrow of this vast empire as the means of establishing christianity god forbid i would shed the last drop of my blood as i shed my first to maintain it and depend upon it when the empire is converted it will not be by such gradual growth as we now witness but by some means so unhumane so divine as we shall never in our most sanguine longings forecast but all will exclaim this is the change of the right hand of the most high no doubt but your idea of a christian triumphal arch supposes an earthly instrument where do you imagine this to lie why pancratius my thoughts i own turn towards the family of one of the augusti as showing a slight germ of better thoughts i mean constantius chlorus but sebastian how many of even our learned and good men will say nay do say if you speak thus to them that similar hopes were entertained in the reigns of alexander gordian or aurelian yet ended in disappointment why they ask should we not expect the same results now i know it too well my dear pancratius and bitterly have i often deplored those dark views which damp our energies that lurking through that vengeance is perpetual and mercy temporary that martyr's blood and virgin's prayer have no power even to shorten times of visitation and hasten hours of grace by this time they had reached sebastian's apartment the principal room of which was lighted and evidently prepared for some assembly but opposite the door was a window open to the ground and leading to a terrace that ran along that side of the building the night looked so bright through it that they both instinctively walked across the room and stood upon the terrace a lovely and splendid view presented itself to them the moon was high in the heavens swimming in them as an italian moon does a round full globe not a flat surface bathed all round in a dumb refulgent atmosphere it dimmed indeed the stars near itself but they seemed to have retired in thicker and more brilliant clusters into the distant corners of the azure sky it was just such an evening as years after monica and augustine enjoyed from a window at ostia as they discoursed of heavenly things it is true that below and around all was beautiful and grand the Colosseum or flavian amphitheatre rose at one side in all its completeness and the gentle murmur of the fountain while its waters glistened in a silvery column like the refluent sea wave gliding down a slanting rock came soothingly on the ear on the other side the lofty building called the septizonium of severus in front towering above the cullion the sumptuous baths of caracalla reflected from their marble walls and stately pillars the radiance of the autumn moon but all these massive monuments of earthly glory rose unheeded before the two christian youths as they stood silent the elder with his right arm round his youthful companion's neck and resting on his shoulder after a long pause he took up the thread of his last discourse and said in a softer tone i was going to show you when we stepped out here the very spot just below our feet where i have often fancied the triumphal arch to which i have alluded would stand but who can think of such paltry things below with the splendid vault above us lighted up so brilliantly as if on purpose to draw upwards our eyes and hearts true sebastian i have sometimes thought that if the underside of that firmament up to which the eye of man however wretched and sinful may look be so beautiful and bright what must that upper side be down upon which the eye of boundless glory deigns to glance i imagine it to be like a richly embroidered veil through the texture of which a few points of golden thread may be allowed to pass and these only reach us how transcendently royal must be that upper surface on which tread the light some feet of angels and of the just made perfect a graceful thought pancratius and no less true it makes the veil between us labouring here in the triumphal church above then and easily to be passed and pardon me sebastian said the youth with the same look up to his friend as a few evenings before had met his mother's inspired gaze pardon me if while you wisely speculate upon a future arch to record the triumph of christianity i see already before me built and open the arch through which we feeble as we are may lead the church speedily to the triumph of glory and ourselves to that of bliss 
Where, my dear boy? Where do you mean? Pancratius pointed steadily with his hand towards the left and said, There, my noble Sebastian, any of those open arches of the Flavian amphitheatre, which lead to its arena, over which not denser than the outstretched canvas which shades our spectators, is that veil of which you spoke just now. But hark! That was a lion's roar from beneath the Chilean, exclaimed Sebastian, surprised. Wild beasts must have arrived at the vivarium of the amphitheatre, for I know there were none there yesterday. Yes, hark, continued Pancratius, not noticing the interruption. These are the trumpet notes that summon us. That is the music that must accompany us to our triumph. Both paused for a time. When Pancratius again broke the silence, saying, This puts me in mind of a matter on which I want to take your advice, my faithful counsellor. Will your company be soon arriving? Not immediately and they will drop in one by one, till they assemble. Come into my chamber, where none will interrupt us. They walked along the terrace, and into the last room of the suite. It was at the corner of the hill, exactly opposite the fountain, and was lighted only by the rays of the moon, streaming through the open window on that side. The soldier stood near this, and Pancratius sat upon his small military couch. What is this great affair, Pancratius? said the officer, smiling upon which you wish to have my sage opinion quite a trifle i dare say replied the youth bashfully for a bold and generous man like you but an important one to an unskilled and weak boy like me a good and virtuous one i doubt not do let me hear it and i promise you every assistance well then sebastian now don't think me foolish proceeded pancratius hesitating and blushing at every word you are aware I have a quantity of useless plate at home, mere lumber, you know, in our plain way of living, and my dear mother, for anything I can say, won't wear the lots of old-fashioned trinkets which are lying locked up, and of no use to any body. I have no one to whom all this should descend. I am, and shall be the last of my race. You have often told me, who in that case are Christian's natural heirs, the widow and the fatherless, the helpless and the indigent why should these wait my death to have what by reversion is theirs and if a persecution is coming why run the risk of confiscation seizing them or plundering lictors stealing them whenever our lives are wanted till the other loss of our rightful heirs pancratius said sebastian i have listened without offering remark to your noble suggestion i wish you to have all the merit of uttering it yourself now just tell me what makes you doubt or hesitate about what i know you wish to do why to tell the truth i feared it might be highly presumptuous and impertinent in one of my age to offer to do what people would be sure to imagine was something grand or generous while well, i assure you dear sebastian it is no such thing for i shall not miss these things a bit they are of no value to me whatever but they will be to the poor especially in the hard times coming of course lucina consents oh no fear about that i would not touch a grain of gold dust without her even wishing it but why i require your assistance is principally this i should never be able to stand its being known that i presume to do anything considered out of the way especially in a boy you understand me so i want you and beg of you to get the distribution made at some other house and as far from uh say from one who needs much the prayers of the faithful especially the poor, and desires to remain unknown. I will serve you with delight, my good and truly noble boy. Hush, did you not hear the Lady Fabiola's name just mentioned? There, again, and with an epithet expressive of no good will. Pancratius approached the window. Two voices were conversing together so close under them that the cornice between prevented their seeing the speakers, evidently a woman and a man after a few minutes they walked out in the moonlight almost as bright as day i know that moorish woman said sebastian it is fabiola's black slave aphra and the man added pancratius is my late schoolfellow Corvinus. they considered it their duty to catch if possible the thread of what seemed a plot but as the speakers walked up and down they could only make out a sentence here and there we will not, however, confine ourselves to these parts, but give the entire dialogue. Only, 
a word first about the interlocutors of the slave we know enough for the present Curvinus was son as we have said to tertullus originally prefect of the purgatorium this office unknown in the republic and of imperial creation had from the reign of tiberius gradually absorbed almost all civil as well as military power and he who held it often discharged the duties of chief criminal judge in rome it required no little strength of nerve to occupy this post to the satisfaction of despotic and unsparing masters to sit all day in a tribunal surrounded with hideous implements of torture unmoved by the moans or shrieks of old men youths or women on whom they were tried to direct a cool interrogatory to one stretched upon the rack and quivering in agony on one side while the last sentence of beating to death with bullet-laden scourges was being executed on the other to sleep calmly after such scenes and rise with appetite for the repetition was not an occupation to which every member of the bar could be supposed to aspire tertullus had been brought from sicily to fill the office not because he was cruel but because he was a cold-hearted man not susceptible of pity or partiality his tribunal however was Corvinus's early school he could sit while quite a boy for hours at his father's feet thoroughly enjoying the cruel spectacles before him and angry when any one got off he grew up sottish coarse and brutal and not yet arrived at man's estate his bloated and freckled countenance and blear eyes one of which was half closed announced him to be already a dissolute and dissipated character without taste for anything refined or ability for any learning he united in himself a certain amount of animal courage and strength and a considerable measure of low cunning he had never experienced in himself a generous feeling and he had never curbed an evil passion no one had ever offended him whom he did not hate and pursue with vengeance too above all he had sworn never to forgive the schoolmaster who had often chastised him for his sulky idleness and the schoolfellow who had blessed him for its brutal contumely justice and mercy good and evil done to him were equally odious to him tertullus had no fortune to give him and he seemed to have little genius to make one to become possessed of one however was all important to his mind for wealth as the means of gratifying his desires was synonymous with him to supreme felicity a rich heiress or rather her dower seemed the simplest object at which to aim too awkward shy and stupid to make himself a way in society he sought other means more kindred to his mind for the attainment of his ambitious or avaricious desires what these means were his conversation with a black slave will best explain i have come to meet you at the meta sudans again for the fourth time at this inconvenient hour what news have you for me none except that after to-morrow my mistress starts for her villa at Cajeta and of course i go with her i shall want more money to carry on my operations in your favour more still you have had all i have received from my father for months why do you know what fabiola is yes to be sure the richest match in rome the haughty and cold-hearted fabiola is not so easily to be won but yet you promised me that your charms and potions would secure me her acceptance or at any rate her fortune what expense can these things cause very great indeed the most precious ingredients are requisite and must be paid for and do you think i will go out at such an hour as this amidst the tombs of the appian way to gather my simples without being properly rewarded but how do you mean to second my efforts i have told you this would hasten their success and how can i you know i am not cut out by nature or fitted by accomplishments to make much impression on any one's affection i would rather trust to the power of your black art then let me give you one piece of advice if you have no grace or gift by which you can gain fabiola's heart fortune you mean they cannot be separated depend upon it there is one thing which you may bring with you that is irresistible what is that gold and where am i to get it it is that i seek the black slave smiled maliciously and said why cannot you get it as fulvius does how does he get it by blood how do you know it i have made acquaintance with an old attendant that he has who if not as dark as i am in skin fully makes up for it in his heart 
his language and mine are sufficiently allied for us to be able to converse he has asked me many questions about poisons and pretends he would purchase my liberty and take me back home as his wife but i have something better than that in prospect i trust however i got all that i wanted out of him and what was that why that fulvius has discovered a great conspiracy against diocletian and from the wink of the old man's awful eye i understood he had hatched it first and he has been sent with strong recommendations to rome to be employed in the same line but i have no ability either to make or to discover conspiracies though i may have to punish them one way however is easy what is that in my country there are large birds which you may attempt in vain to run down with the fleetest horses but which if you look about for them quietly are the first to betray themselves for they only hide their heads what do you wish to represent by this the christians is there not going to be a persecution of them soon yes and a most fierce one such as has never been before then follow my advice do not tire yourself with hunting them down and catching after all but mean prey keep your eyes open and look about for one or two good fat ones half trying to conceal themselves pounce upon them get a good share of their confiscation and come with one good handful to get two in return thank you thank you i understand you you are not fond of these christians then fond of them i hate the entire race the spirits which i worship are the deadly enemies of their very name and she grinned horrible a ghastly smile as she proceeded i suspect one of my fellow-servants is one. Oh, how i detest her what makes you think it in the first place she would not tell a lie for anything and gets us all into dreadful scrapes by her absurd truthfulness good what next then she cares not for money or gifts and so prevents our having them offered better and moreover she is the last word died in the ear of Corvinus, who replied, "'Well, indeed, I have to-day been out of the gate to meet a caravan of your country folk coming in, but you beat them all.' "'Indeed!' exclaimed Aphra, with delight. "'Who were they?' "'Simply Africans,' replied Corvinus, with a laugh. "'Lions, panthers, leopards.' "'Wretch, do you insult me thus?' "'Come, come, be pacified. They are brought expressly to rid you of your hateful Christians.' let us part friends here is your money but let it be the last and let me know when the filters begin to work i will not forget your hint about christian money it is quite to my taste as he departed by the sacred way she pretended to go along the carriage the street between the palatine and the chilean mounts and then turned back and looking after him exclaimed fool to think that i am going to try experiments for you on a person of fabulous character she followed him at a distance but a sebastian to his amazement thought turned into the vestibule of the palace he determined at once to put fabiola on her guard against this new plot but this could not be done till her return from the country end of section nine section ten of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part First, Peace. Chapter Ten. Other Meetings. When the two youths returned to the room by which they had entered the apartment, they found the expected company assembled. A frugal repast was laid upon the table, principally as a blind to any intruder who might happen unexpectedly to enter. The assembly was large and varied containing clergy and laity men and women the purpose of the meeting was to concert proper measures in consequence of something which had lately occurred in the palace this we must briefly explain sebastian enjoying the unbounded confidence of the emperor employed all his influence in propagating the christian faith within the palace numerous conversions had gradually been made but shortly before this period there had been a wholesale one effected the particulars of which are recorded in the genuine acts of this glorious soldier in virtue of former laws many christians were seized and brought to trial which often ended in death two brothers marcus and marcellianus had been so accused and were expecting execution but when their friends admitted to see them implored them with tears to save their lives by apostasy 
they seemed to waver they promised to deliberate sebastian heard of this and rushed to save them he was too well known to be refused admittance and he entered into their gloomy prison like an angel of light it consisted of a strong room in the house of the magistrate to whose care they had been entrusted the place of confinement was generally left to that officer and here tranquilinus the father of the two youths had obtained a respite for them of thirty days to try to shake their constancy and to second his efforts nicostratus the magistrate had placed him in custody in his own house sebastian's was a bold and perilous office besides the two christian captives there were gathered in the place sixteen heathen prisoners there were the parents of the unfortunate youths weeping over them and caressing them to allure them from their threatened doom there was the gaoler claudius and there was the magistrate nicostratus with his wife zoe drawn thither by the compassionate wish of seeing the youths snatched from their fate could sebastian hope that of this crowd not one would be found whom a sense of official duty or a hope of pardon or hatred of christianity might impel to betray him if he avowed himself a christian and did he not know that such a betrayal involved his death he knew it well but what cared he if three victims would thus be offered to god instead of two so much the better all that he dreaded was that there should be none the room was a banqueting hall but seldom opened in the day and consequently requiring very little light what it had entered only as in the pantheon by an opening in the roof and sebastian anxious to be seen by all stood in the ray which now darted through it strong and brilliant where it beat but leaving the rest of the apartment almost dark it broke against the gold and jewels of his rich tribune's armour and as he moved scattered itself in sparks of brilliant hues into the darkest recesses of that gloom while it beamed with serene steadiness upon his uncovered head and displayed his noble features softened by an emotion of tender grief as he looked upon the two vacillating confessors it was some moments before he could give vent in words to the violence of his grief till at length it broke forth in impassioned tones holy and venerable brothers he exclaimed who have borne witness to christ who are imprisoned for him whose limbs are marked by chains worn for his sake who have tasted torments with him i ought to fall at your feet and do you homage and ask your prayers instead of standing before you as your exhorter still less as your reprover can this be true which i have heard that while angels were putting the last flowers to your crowns you have bid them pause and even thought of telling them to unweave them and scatter their blossoms to the winds can i believe that you who have already your feet on the threshold of paradise are thinking of drawing them back to tread once more the valley of exile and of tears the two youths hung down their heads and wept in humble confession of their weakness sebastian proceeded you cannot meet the eye of a poor soldier like me the least of christ's servants how then will you stand the angry glance of the lord whom you are about to deny before men but cannot in your hearts deny on that terrible day when he in return will deny you before his angels when instead of standing manfully before him like good and faithful servants as to-morrow ye might have done you shall have to come into his presence after having crawled through a few more years of infamy disowned by the church despised by its enemies and what is worse gnawed by an undying worm and victims of a sleepless remorse cease oh in pity cease young man whoever thou art exclaimed tranquilinus the father of the youths speak not thus severely to my sons it was i assure thee to their mother's tears and to my entreaties that they had begun to yield and not to the tortures which they have endured with such fortitude why should they leave their wretched parents to misery and sorrow does thy religion command this and dost thou call it holy wait in patience my good old man said sebastian with the kindest look and accent and let me speak first with thy sons they know what i mean which thou canst not yet but with god's grace thou too shalt soon your father indeed is right in saying that for his sake and your mother's you have been deliberating whether you should not prefer them to him who told you he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me you cannot hope to purchase for these your aged parents eternal life by your own loss of it will you make them christians by abandoning christianity will you make them soldiers of the cross by deserting its standard will you teach them that its doctrines are more precious than life by preserving life to them do you want to gain for them not the mortal life of the perishable body 
but the eternal life of the soul? Then hasten yourselves to its acquisition. Throw down at the feet of your Saviour the crowns you will receive, and entreat for your parents' salvation. Enough, enough, Sebastian, we are resolved, cried out together both the brothers. Claudius, said one, put on me again the chains you have taken off. Nicostratus, added the other, give orders for the sentence to be carried out. Yet neither Claudius nor Nicostratus moved. Farewell, dear father, adieu, dearest mother, they in turn said, embracing their parents. No, replied the father, we part no more. Nicostratus, go tell Crematins that I am from this moment a Christian with my sons. I will die with them for a religion which can make heroes thus of boys. And I, continued the mother, will not be separated from my husband and children. The scene which followed baffles description. All were moved, all wept. The prisoners joined in the tumult of these new affections, and Sebastian saw himself surrounded by a group of men and women smitten by grace, softened by its influences, and subdued by its power, yet all was lost if one remained behind. He saw the danger, not to himself, but to the church, if a sudden discovery were made, and to those souls fluttering upon the confines of life. Some hung upon his arms, some clasped his knees, some kissed his feet, as though he had been a spirit of peace such as visited Peter in his dungeon at Jerusalem. Two alone had expressed no thought. Nicostratus was indeed moved, but by no means conquered. His feelings were agitated, but his convictions unshaken. His wife, Zoe, knelt before Sebastian with a beseeching look and outstretched arms, but she spoke no word. "'Come, Sebastian,' said the keeper of the records, for such was Nicostratus's office. "'It is time for thee to depart.' I cannot but admire the sincerity of belief and the generosity of heart which can make thee act as thou hast done, and which impel these young men to death. But my duty is imperative, and must overweigh my private feelings. And dost not thou believe with the rest? No, Sebastian, I yield not so easily. I must have stronger evidence than even thy virtue. Oh, speak to him, then, thou, said Sebastian to Zoe. Speak, faithful wife. Speak to thy husband's heart, for I am mistaken indeed, if those looks of thine tell me not that thou at least believeth. Zoe covered her face with her hands, and burst into a passion of tears. Thou hast touched her to the quick, Sebastian, said her husband. Knowest thou not that she is dumb? I knew it not, noble Nicostratus, for when last I saw her in Asia she could speak. For six years, replied the other with a faltering voice. Her once elegant tongue has been paralyzed, and she has not uttered a single word. Sebastian was silent for a moment. Then suddenly he threw out his arms, and stretched them forth, as the Christians always did in prayer, and raised his eyes to heaven, then burst forth in these words, O God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the beginning of this work is thine. Let its accomplishment be thine alone. Put forth thy power, for it is needed entrust it for once to the weakest and poorest of instruments. Let me, though most unworthy, so wield the sword of thy victorious cross, as that the spirits of darkness may fly before it, and thy salvation may embrace us all. Zo, look up once more to me. All were hushed in silence when Sebastian, after a moment's silent prayer, with his right hand made over her mouth the sign of the cross, saying, Zo, speak, dost thou believe? I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, she replied in a clear and firm voice, and fell upon Sebastian's feet. It was almost a shriek that Nicostratus uttered as he threw himself on his knees and bathed Sebastian's right hand with tears. The victory was complete. Everyone was gained, and immediate steps were taken to prevent discovery. The person responsible for the prisoners could take them where he wished, and Nicostratus transferred them all, with Tranquilinus and his wife, to the full liberty of his house. Sebastian lost no time in putting them under the care of the holy priest Polycarp of the title of St. Pastor. It was a case so peculiar and requiring such concealment, and the times were so threatening, and all new irritations had so much to be avoided, that the instruction was hurried and continued night and day, so the baptism was quickly administered. The new Christian flock was encouraged and consoled by a fresh wonder. Tranquilinus, who was suffering severely from the gout, was restored to instant and complete health by baptism. 
Chromatins was the prefect of the city, to whom Nicostratus was liable for his prisoners, and this officer could not long conceal from him what had happened. It was indeed a matter of life or death to them all, but, strengthened now by faith, they were prepared for either. Chromatins was a man of upright character, and not fond of persecution, and listened with interest to the account of what had occurred. But when he heard of Tranquilinus's cure, he was greatly struck. He was himself a victim to the same disease, and suffered agonies of pain. If, he said, what you relate be true, and if I can have personal experience of this healing power, I certainly will not resist its evidence. Sebastian was sent for. To have administered baptism without faith proceeding, as an experiment of its healing virtue, would have been a superstition. Sebastian took another course, which will be later described, and Chromatus completely recovered. He received baptism soon after, with his son Tiburtius. It was clearly impossible for him to continue in his office, and he had accordingly resigned it to the emperor. Tertullus, the father of the hopeful Corvinus, and prefect of the Praetorium, had been named his successor, so the reader will perceive that the events just related from the Acts of St. Sebastian had occurred a little before our narrative begins, for in an early chapter we spoke of Corvinus's father as already prefect of the city. Let us now come down again to the evening in which Sebastian and Pancratius met most of the persons above enumerated in the officers' chambers. Many of them resided in or about the palace, and besides them were present Costilus, who held a high situation at court, and his wife Irene. Several previous meetings had been held to decide upon some plan for securing the completer instruction of the converts and for withdrawing from observation so many people whose change of life and retirement from office would excite wonder and inquiry. Sebastian had obtained permission from the emperor for Chromatins to retire to a country house in Capania, and it had been arranged that a considerable number of the neophytes should join him there, and forming one household should go on with religious instruction and unite in common offices of piety. The season was come when every body retired to the country, and the emperor himself was going to the coast of Naples, and thence would take a journey to southern Italy. It was therefore a favorable moment for carrying out the preconcerted plan. Indeed, the Pope, we are told, on the Sunday following this conversion, celebrated the divine mysteries in the house of Neostratus, and proposed this withdrawal from the city. At this meeting all details were arranged, different parties were to start, in the course of the following days, by various roads, some direct by the Appian, some along the Latin, others round by Tiber, and a mountain road through Aparnum but all were to meet at the villa not far from Capua. Through the whole discussion of these somewhat tedious arrangements, Torquatus, one of the former prisoners, converted by Sebastian's visit, showed himself forward, impatient, and impetuous. He found fault with every plan, seemed discontented with the directions given him, spoke almost contemptuously of this flight from danger, as he called it, and boasted that for his part, he was ready to go into the forum on the morrow and overthrow any altar or confront any judge as a christian everything was said and done to soothe and even to cool him and it was felt to be most important that he should be taken with the rest into the country he insisted however upon going his own way only one more point remained to be decided it was who should head the little colony and direct its operations here was renewed a contest of love between the holy priest Polycarp and Sebastian, each wishing to remain in Rome and have the first chance of martyrdom. But now the difference was cut short by a letter brought in from the Pope, addressed to his beloved son Polycarp, priest of the title of St. Pastor, in which he commanded him to accompany the converts and leave Sebastian to the arduous duty of encouraging confessors and protecting Christians in Rome. To hear was to obey, and the meeting broke up with a prayer of thanksgiving. Sebastian, after bidding affectionate farewell to his friends, insisted upon accompanying Pancratius home. As they were leaving the room, the latter remarked, Sebastian, I do not like the Turquatus. I fear he will give us trouble. To tell the truth, answered the soldier, I would rather he were different, but we must remember that he is a neophyte, and will improve in time and by grace. As they passed into the entrance court of the palace, they heard a babel of uncouth sounds and coarse laughter and occasional yells proceeding from the adjoining yard, in which were the quarters of the Mauritanian archers. 
a fire seemed to be blazing in the midst of it for the smoke and sparks rose above the surrounding porticoes sebastian accosted the sentinel in the court where they were and asked friend what is going on there among our neighbours the black slave he replied who is their priestess and who is betrothed to their captain if she can purchase her freedom has come in for some midnight rites and this horrid turmoil takes place every time she comes indeed said pancratius and can you tell me what is the religion these africans follow i do not know sir replied the legionary unless they be what are called christians what makes you think so why i have heard that the christians meet by night and sing detestable songs and commit all sorts of crimes and cook and eat the flesh of a child murdered for the purpose just what might seem to be going on here good night comrade said sebastian and then exclaimed as they were issuing from the vestibule it is not strange pancratius that in spite of all our efforts we who are conscious that we worship only the one living god in spirit and truth who know what care we take to keep ourselves undefiled by sin and who would die rather than speak an unclean word should yet after three hundred years be confounded by the people with the followers of the most degraded superstitions and have our worship ranked with the very idolatry which above all things we abhor how long o oh lord how long so long said pancratius pausing on the steps outside the vestibule and looking at the now declining moon so long as we shall continue to walk in this pale light until the sun of justice shall rise upon our country in his beauty and enrich it with his splendour sebastian tell me whence do you best like to see the sun rise the most lovely sunrise i have ever seen replied the soldier as if humouring his companion's fanciful question was from the top of the ladial mountain by the temple of jupiter the sun rose behind the mountain and projected its huge shadow like a pyramid over the plain and far upon the sea then as it rose higher this lessened and withdrew and every moment some new object caught the light first the galleys and skiffs upon the water then the shore with its dancing waves and by degrees one white edifice after the other sparkled in the fresh beams till at last majestic rome itself with its towering pinnacles vast in the effulgence of day it was a glorious sight indeed such as could not have been witnessed or imagined by those below just what i should have expected sebastian observed pancratius and so will it be when that more brilliant sun rises fully upon this benighted country how beautiful will it then be to behold the shades retiring and each moment one and another of the charms as yet concealed of our holy faith in worship starting into light till the imperial city itself shines forth a holy type of the city of god will they who live in those times see these beauties and worthily value them or will they look only at the narrow space around them and hold their hands before their eyes to shade them from the sudden glare i know not dear sebastian but i hope that you and i will look down upon that grand spectacle from which alone it can be duly appreciated from a mountain higher than jupiter's be he alban or be he olympian dwelling on that holy mount whereon stands the lamb from whose feet flow the streams of life they continued their walk in silence through the brilliantly lighted streets and when they had reached lucina's house and affectionately bid one another good night pancratius seemed to hesitate a moment and then said sebastian you said something this evening which i should much like to have explained what was it when you were contending with polycarp about going into capania or remaining in rome you promised that if you stayed you would be most cautious and not expose yourself to unnecessary risks then you added that there was one purpose in your mind which would effectually restrain you but that when that was accomplished you would find it difficult to check your longing ardour to give your life for christ and why pancratius do you desire so much to know this foolish thought of mine because i own i am really curious to learn what can be the object high enough to check in you the aspiration after what i know you consider to be the very highest of a christian's aim i am sorry my dear boy that is not in my power to tell you but you shall know it some time do you promise me yes most solemnly god bless you End of section 10
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part First, Peace, Chapter Eleven, A Talk with the Reader. We will take advantage of the holiday which Rome is enjoying, sending out its inhabitants to the neighboring hills, or to the whole line of sea coasts from Genoa to Pastum, for amusement on land and water, and, in a merely didactic way, endeavor to communicate to our reader some information which may throw light on what we have already written, and prepare him for what will follow. From the very compressed form in which the early history of the Church is generally studied, and from the unchronological arrangement of the saints' biographies, as we usually read them, we may easily be led to an erroneous idea of the state of our first Christian ancestors. This may happen in two different ways. We may come to imagine that during the first three centuries the church was suffering unrespited, under active persecution, that the faithful worshipped in fear and trembling, and almost lived in the catacombs, that bare existence was scarcely an opportunity for outward development or inward organization, none for splendor was all that religion could enjoy that in fine it was a period of conflict and of tribulation without an interval of peace or consolation on the other hand we may suppose that those three centuries were divided into epochs by ten distinct persecutions some of longer and some of shorter duration but definitely separated from one another by breathing times of complete rest either of these views is erroneous and we desire to state more accurately the real condition of the christian church under the various circumstances of that most pregnant portion of her history. When once persecution had broken loose upon the church, it may be said never entirely to have relaxed its hold, till her final pacification under Constantine. An edict of persecution once issued by an emperor was seldom recalled, and though the rigor of its enforcement might gradually relax or cease, through the accession of a milder ruler, still it never became completely a dead letter it was a dangerous weapon in the hands of a cruel or bigoted governor of a city or province. Hence, in the intervals between the great general persecutions, ordered by a new decree, we find many martyrs who owed their crowns either to popular fury or to the hatred of Christianity and local rulers. Hence also we read of a bitter persecution being carried on in one part of the empire, while other portions enjoyed complete peace. Perhaps a few examples of the various phases of persecution will illustrate the real relations of the primitive church with the state, better than mere description, and the more learned reader can pass over this digression, or must have the patience to hear repeated what he is so familiar with that it will seem commonplace. Trajan was by no means one of the cruel emperors. On the contrary, he was habitually just and merciful. Yet, though he published no new edicts against the Christians, many noble martyrs, among them St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, at Rome, and St. Simeon at Jerusalem, glorified their Lord in his reign. Indeed, when Pliny the Younger consulted him on the matter in which he should deal with Christians, who might be brought before him as governor of Bithynia, the emperor gave him a rule which exhibits the lowest standard of justice, that they were not to be sought out, but if accused, they were to be punished. Adrian, who issued no decree of persecution, gave a similar reply to a similar question from Serenus Granianus, proconsul of Asia, and under him, too, and even by his orders, cruel martyrdom was suffered by the intrepid Symphorosa and her seven sons at Tiber or Tivoli. A beautiful inscription found in the catacombs mentions Marius, a young officer, who shed his blood for Christ under this emperor. Indeed, St. Justin Martyr, the great apologist of Christianity, informs us that he owed his conversion to the constancy of the martyrs under his emperor. In like manner, before the emperor Septimus Severus had published his persecuting edicts, many Christians had suffered torments and death. Such were the celebrated martyrs of Solita in Africa, and Saints Perpetua and Felicitas with their companions, the acts of whose martyrdom, containing the diary of the first noble lady, twenty years of age, brought down by herself to the eve of her death, form one of the most touching and exquisitely beautiful documents preserved to us from the ancient church. From these historical facts it will be evident that while there was from time to time a more active, severe, and general persecution of the Christian name all through the empire, there were partial and local cessations, and sometimes even a general suspension of its rigor. An occurrence of this sort has secured for us most interesting information connected with our subject. When the persecution of Severus had relaxed in other parts, it happened that Scapula, proconsul of Africa, 
prolonged it in his province with unrelenting cruelty he condemned among others mavilus of adramatum to be devoured by beasts when he was seized with a severe illness tertullian the oldest christian latin writer addressed a letter to him in which he bids him take warning from this visitation and repent of his crimes reminding him of many judgments which had befallen cruel judges of the christians in various parts of the world yet such was the charity of these holy men that he tells him that they were offering up earnest prayers for their enemy's recovery he then goes on to inform him that he may very well fulfil his duties without practising cruelty by acting as other magistrates had done for instance Cincius severus suggested to the accused the answers they should make to be acquitted vespronius candidus dismissed a christian on the grounds that his condemnation would encourage tumults asper seeing one ready to yield upon the application of slight torments would not press him further and expressed regret that such a case should have been brought before him pudens on reading an act of accusation declared the title informal because calumnious and tore it up we thus see how much might depend upon the temper and perhaps the tendencies of governors and judges in the enforcing even of imperial edicts of persecution and st ambrose tells us that some governors boasted that they had brought back from their provinces their swords unstained with blood in cruentos enses we can also easily understand how at any particular time a savage persecution might rage in gaul or africa or asia while the main part of the church was enjoying peace but rome was undoubtedly the place most subject to frequent outbreaks of the hostile spirit so that it might be considered as the privilege of its pontiffs during the first three centuries to bear the witness of blood to the faith which they taught to be elected pope was equivalent to being promoted to martyrdom at the period of our narrative the church was in one of those longer intervals of comparative peace which gave opportunity for great development from the death of valerian in two sixty eight there had been no new form of persecutions though the interval is glorified by many noble martyrdoms during such periods the christians were able to carry out their religious system with completeness and even with splendour the city was divided into districts or parishes each having its title or church served by priests deacons and inferior ministers the poor were supported the sick visited catechumens instructed the sacraments were administered daily worship was practised and the penitential canons were enforced by the clergy of each title and collections were made for these purposes and others connected with religious charity and its consequence hospitality it is recorded that in 250 during the pontificate of cornelius there were in rome forty-six priests a hundred and fifty-four inferior ministers who were supported by the alms of the faithful together with fifteen hundred poor this number of the priests pretty nearly corresponds to that of the titles which st optoptus tells us there were in rome although the tombs of the martyrs in the catacombs continue to be objects of devotion during these more peaceful intervals and these asylums of the persecuted were kept in order and repair they did not then serve for the ordinary places of worship the churches to which we have already alluded were often public large and even splendid and heathens used to be present at the sermons delivered in them and such portions of the liturgy as were open to catechumens but generally they were in private houses probably made out of the large halls or trinclinia which the nobler mansions contained thus we know that many of the titles in rome were originally of that character tertullian mentions christian cemeteries under a name and with circumstances which show that they were above ground for he compares them to threshing floors which were necessarily exposed to the air a custom of ancient roman life will remove an objection which may arrive as to how considerable multitudes could assemble in these places without attracting attention and consequently persecution it was usual for what may be called a levy to be held every morning by the rich attended by dependents or clients and messengers from their friends either slaves or freedmen some of whom were admitted into the inner court to the master's presence while others only presented themselves and were dismissed hundreds might thus go in and out of a great house in addition to the crowd of domestic slaves tradespeople and others who had access to it through the principal or the back entrance and little or no notice would be taken of the circumstance there is another important phenomenon in the social life of the early christians which one would hardly know how to believe were not evidence of it brought before us in the most authentic acts of the martyrs and in ecclesiastical history it is the concealment which they contrived to practise 
no doubt can be entertained that persons were moving in the highest society were occupying conspicuous public situations were near the persons of the emperor who were christians and yet were not suspected to be such by their most intimate heathen friends nay cases occurred where the nearest relations were kept in total ignorance on this subject no lie no dissembling no action especially inconsistent with christian morality or christian truth was ever permitted to ensure such secrecy but every precaution compatible with complete uprightness was taken to conceal christianity from the public eye however necessary this prudential course might be to prevent any wanton persecution its consequences fell often heavily upon those who held it the heathen world the world of power of influence and of state the world which made laws as best suited it and executed them the world that loved earthly prosperity and hated faith felt itself surrounded filled compenetrated by a mysterious system which spread no one could see how and exercised an influence derived no one knew whence families were startled at finding a son or daughter to have embraced this new law with which they were not aware that they had been in contact and which in their heated fancies and popular views they considered stupid grovelling and antisocial hence the hatred of christianity was political as well as religious the system was considered as unroman as having an interest opposed to the extension and prosperity of the empire and as obeying an unseen and spiritual power the christians were pronounced irreligiosi and caesaris disloyal to the emperors and that was enough hence their security and peace depended upon the state of popular feeling when any demagogue or fanatic could succeed in rousing this neither their denial of the charges brought against them nor their peaceful demeanour nor the claims of civilised life could suffice to screen them from such measure of persecution as could be safely urged against them after these digressive remarks we will resume and unite again the broken thread of our narrative End of section eleven Section twelve of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, Peace. Chapter twelve. The Wolf and the Fox. The hints of the African slave had not been thrown away upon the sordid mind of Corvinus. Her own hatred of Christianity arose from the circumstance that a former mistress of hers had become a Christian and had manumitted all her other slaves but feeling it wrong to turn so dangerous a character as aphra or rather jubala her proper name upon the world had transferred her to another proprietor Corvinus had often seen fulvius at the baths and other places of public resort he admired and envied him for his appearance his dress his conversation but with his untoward shyness or moroseness he could never have found courage to address him had he not now discovered that though a more refined he was not a less profound villain than himself fulvius's wit and cleverness might supply the want of these qualities in his own sottish composition while his own brute force and unfeeling recklessness might be valuable auxiliaries to those higher gifts he had the young stranger in his power by the discovery which he had made of his real character he determined therefore to make an effort and enter into alliance with one who otherwise might prove a dangerous rival it was about ten days after the meeting last described that Corvinus went to stroll in Pompey's gardens. These covered the space round his theatre, in the neighbourhood of the present Piazza Farnese. A conflagration in the reign of Corvinus had lately destroyed the scene, as it was called, of the edifice, and Diocletian had repaired it with great magnificence. The gardens were distinguished from others by rows of plane trees, which formed a delicious shade. Statues of wild beasts, fountains and artificial brooks profusely adorned them while sauntering about crivinus caught a sight of fulvius and at once made up to him what do you want with me asked the foreigner with a look of surprise and scorn at the slovenly dress of crivinus to have a talk with you which may turn out to your advantage and mine what can you propose to me with the first of these recommendations no doubt at all as to the second fulvius I am a plain-spoken man, and have no pretensions to your cleverness and elegance, but we are both of one trade, and both consequently of one mind. Fulvius started and deeply coloured, then said with contemptuous air, What do you mean, Sarah? If you double your fist, 
rejoined Corvinus, to show me the fine rings on your delicate fingers. It is very well. But if you mean to threaten by it, you may as well put your hand again into the folds of your toga. It is more graceful. Cut this matter short, sir. Again I ask, what do you mean? This, Fulvius, and he whispered into his ear, that you are a spy and an informer. Fulvius was staggered, then rallying said, what right have you to make such an odious charge against me? You discovered, with a strong emphasis, a conspiracy in the East, and Diocletian. Fulvius stopped him and asked, What is your name, and who are you? I am Corvinus, the son of Tertullus, prefect of the city. This seemed to account for all, and Fulvius said, in subdued tones, No more here. I see friends coming. Meet me disguised at daybreak tomorrow in the Patrician Street, under the portico of the Baths of Novatus. We will talk more at leisure. Corvinus returned home, not ill-satisfied with his first attempt at diplomacy. He procured a garment shabbier than his own from one of his father's slaves, and was at the appointed spot by the first dawn of day. He had to wait a long time, and had almost lost patience when he saw his new friend approach. Fulvius was well wrapped up in a large overcoat, and wore his hood over his face. He thus saluted Corvinus. "'Good morning, comrade. I fear I have kept you waiting in the cold morning air, especially as you are thinly clad.' "'I own,' replied Corvinus, "'that I should have been tired, had I not been immensely amused, and yet puzzled by what I have been observing.' "'What is that?' "'Why, from an early hour, long, I suspect, before my coming, there have been arriving here from every side and entering into that house, by the back door in the narrow street, the rarest collection of miserable objects that you ever saw, the blind, the lame, the maimed, the decrepit, the deformed of every possible shape, while by the front door several persons have entered, evidently of a different class. Whose dwelling is it, do you know? It looks a large old house, but rather out of condition. It belongs to a very rich, and, it is said, very miserly, old patrician. But look, there comes some more. At that moment a very feeble man, bent down by age, was approaching, supported by a young and cheerful girl, who chatted most kindly to him as she supported him. We are just there, she said to him. A few more steps and you shall sit down and rest. Thank you, my child, replied the old man. How kind of you to come for me so early. I knew, she said, you would want help, and as I am the most useless person about, I thought I would go and fetch you. I have always heard that blind people are selfish, and it seems but natural. But you, Cecilia, are certainly an exception. Not at all. This is only my way of showing selfishness. How do you mean? Why, first, I get the advantage of your eyes, and then I get the satisfaction of supporting you. I was an eye to the blind, that is you and a foot to the lame that is myself they reached the door as she spoke these words that girl is blind said fulvius to corvinus do you not see how straight she walks without looking right or left so she is answered the other surely this is not the place so often spoken of where beggars meet and the blind see and the lame walk and all feast together but yet I observed these people were so different from the mendicants on the Arician bridge. They appeared respectable and even cheerful, and not one asked me for alms as he passed. It is very strange, and I should like to discover the mystery. A good job might, perhaps, be got out of it. The old patrician, you say, is very rich? Immensely. Humph! How could one manage to get in? I have it. I will take off my shoes, screw up one leg like a cripple, and join the next group of queer ones that come, and go boldly in, doing as they do. That will hardly succeed. Depend on it, every one of these people is known at the house. I am sure not, for several of them asked me if this was the house of the Lady Agnes. Of whom? asked Fulvius with a start. Why do you look so? said Corvinus. It is the house of her parents but she is better known than they as being a young heiress, nearly as rich as her cousin, Fabiola. Fulvius paused for a moment, a strong suspicion, too subtle and important to be communicated to his rude companion, flashed through his mind. 
he said therefore to Corvinus, if you are sure that these people are not familiar of the house try your plan i have met the lady before and will venture by the front door thus we shall have a double chance do you know what i have been thinking fulvius something very bright no doubt that when you and i join in any enterprise we shall always have two chances what are they the foxes and the wolves when they conspire to rob a fold Fulvius cast on him a look of disdain, which Corvinus returned by a hideous leer, and they separated for their respective posts. End of section 12section 13 of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part first peace chapter 13 charity as we do not choose to enter the house of agnes either with the wolf or with the fox we will take a more spiritual mode of doing so and find ourselves at once inside the parents of agnes represented noble lines of ancestry and her family was not one of recent conversion, but had for several generations professed the faith. As in heathen families was cherished the memory of ancestors who had won a triumph or held high offices in the state, so in this and other Christian houses was preserved with pious reverence and affectionate pride the remembrance of those relations who had, in the last hundred and fifty years or more, borne the palm of martyrdom, or occupied the sublimer dignities of the church, but though ennobled thus and with a constant stream of blood poured forth for christ accompanying the waving branches of the family tree the stem had never been hewn down but had survived repeated storms this may appear surprising but when we reflect how many a soldier goes through a whole campaign of frequent actions and does not receive a wound or how many a family endures untainted through a plague we cannot be surprised if providence watched over the well-being of the church by preserving in it through old family successions long unbroken chains of tradition and so enabling the faithful to say unless the lord of hosts had left us seed we had been as sodom and we should have been like to gomorrah all the honours and hopes of this family centred now in one whose name is already known to our readers agnes the only child of that ancient house given to her parents as they had reached the very verge of hope that their line could be continued she had been from infancy blessed with such a sweetness of disposition such a docility and intelligence of mind and such simplicity and innocence of character that she had grown up the common object of love and almost of reverence to the entire house from her parents down to the lowest servant yet nothing seemed to spoil or warp the compact virtuousness of her nature but her good qualities expanded with a well-balanced adjustment which at the early age in which he find her had ripened into combined grace and wisdom she shared all her parents' virtuous thoughts, and cared as little for the world as they. She lived with them in a small portion of the mansion, which was fitted up with elegance, though not with luxury, and their establishment was adequate to all their wants. Here they received the few friends with whom they preserved familiar relations, though, as they did not entertain, nor go out, these were few. Fabiola was an occasional visitor, though Agnes preferred going to see her at her house, and she often expressed to her young friend her longing for the day when, meeting with a suitable match, she would re-embellish and open all the splendid dwelling. For notwithstanding the Volconian law, on the inheritance of women, now quite obsolete, Agnes had received, from collateral sources, large personal additions to the family property. In general, of course, the heathen world, who visited, attributed appearances to avarice, and calculated what immense accumulations of wealth the miserly parents must be putting by, and concluded that all beyond the solid screen which shut up the second court was left to fall into decay and ruin. It was not so, however. The inner part of the house consisting of a large court, and the garden with the detached dining hall, or trinclinium, turned into a church, and the upper portion of the house, accessible from those parts, were devoted to the administration of that copious charity which the church carried on as a business of its life. It was under the care and direction of the deacon Reparatus and his exorcist Secundus, officially appointed by the supreme pontiff to take care of the sick, poor, and strangers, in one of the seven regions into which Pope Cajus, about five years before, had divided the city for this purpose, 
committing each region to one of the seven deacons of the Roman Church. Rooms were set apart for lodging strangers who came from a distance, recommended by other churches, and a frugal table was provided for them. Upstairs were apartments for an hospital, for the bedridden, the decrepit, and the sick, under the care of the deaconess, and such of the faithful as loved to assist in this work of charity. It was here that the blind girl had her cell, though she refused to take her food, as we have seen, in the house. The tablinum, or monument room, which generally stood detached in the middle of the passage between the inner courts, served as the office and archives for transacting the business of this charitable establishment, and preserving all local documents, such as the acts of martyrs, procured or compiled by one of the seven notaries, kept for that purpose by institution of St. Clement I, who was attached to that region. A door of communication allowed the household to assist in these works of charity, and Agnes had been accustomed from childhood to run in and out many times a day, and to pass hours there, always beaming like an angel of light, consolation, and joy on the suffering and distressed. This house, then, might be called the almonry of the region, or district, of charity and hospitality in which it was situated, and it was accessible for these purposes through the posticum, or back door, situated in a narrow lane little frequented. No wonder that with such an establishment the fortune of the inmates should find an easy application. We heard Pancratius request Sebastian to arrange for the distribution of his plate and jewels among the poor, without its being known to whom they belonged. He had not lost sight of the commission, and had fixed on the house of Agnes as the fittest for this purpose. On the morning which we have described, the distribution had to take place. Other regions had sent their poor, accompanied by their deacons, while Sebastian, Pancratius, and other persons of higher rank had come in through the front door to assist in the division. Some of these had been seen to enter by Curvinus. End of section 13 Chapter 14 of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part First, Peace. Chapter 14. Extremes Meet. A group of poor, coming opportunely toward the door, enabled Corvinus to attack himself to them, an admirable counterfeit, and all but the modesty of their deportment. He kept sufficiently close to them to hear that each of them, as he entered in, pronounced the words, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. This was not merely a Christian, but a Catholic password, for St. Augustine tells us that heretics ridiculed Catholics for using it on the grounds that it was a salutation, but rather a reply. But that Catholics employed it, because consecrated by pious usage, it was yet heard in Italy on similar occasions. Corvinus pronounced the mystic words and was allowed to pass. Following the others closely, and copying their manners and gestures, he found himself in the inner court of the house, which was already filled with the poor and infirm. The men were ranged on one side, the women on the other. Under the portico at the end were tables piled with costly plate, and near them was another, covered with brilliant jewelry. Two silver and goldsmiths were weighing and valuing most conscientiously this property, and beside them was the money which they would give, to be distributed among the poor, in just proportion. Corvinus eyed all this with a gluttonous heart. He would have given anything to get it all, and almost thought of making a dash at something and running out. But he saw at once the folly or madness of such a course, and resolved to wait for a share, and in the meantime take note for Fulvius of all he saw. He soon, however, became aware of the awkwardness of his present position, while the poor were all mixed up together and moving about, he remained unnoticed. But he soon saw several young men in peculiarly gentle manners, but active, and evidently in authority, dressed in the garment known to him by the name of Dalmatic, from its Dalmatian origin, that is, having the tunic instead of the toga, a close-fitting shorter tunicle, with ample, but not over-long or wide sleeves. The dress adopted and worn by the deacons, not only at their more solemn ministrations in church, but also when engaged in the discharge of their secondary duties about the sick and poor. These officers went on marshalling the attendants, each evidently knowing those of his own district, and conducting them to a peculiar spot within the porticos. But as no one recognized or claimed Corvinus for one of his poor, he was at length left alone in the middle of the court. 
even his dull mind could feel the anomalous situation into which he had thrust himself here he was the son of the prefect of the city whose duty it was to punish such violators of domestic rights an intruder into the innermost parts of a nobleman's house having entered by a cheat dressed like a beggar and associating himself with such people of course for some sinister or at least unlawful purpose he looked towards the door meditating an escape but he saw it guarded by an old man named diogenes and his two stout sons who could hardly restrain their hot blood at this insolence though they only showed it by scowling looks and repressive biting of their lips he saw that he was the subject of consultation among the young deacons who cast occasional glances towards him he imagined that even the blind were staring at him and the decrepit ready to wield their crutches like battle axes against him he had only one consolation it was evident he was not known and he hoped to frame some excuse for getting out of the scrape at length the deacon reparatus came up to him and thus courteously accosted him friend you probably do not belong to one of the regions invited here to-day where do you live in the region of the alto Semita. this answer gave the civil not the ecclesiastical division of rome still reparatus went on the alto Semita is in my region yet i do not remember to have seen you while he spoke these words he was astonished to see the stranger turn deadly pale and totter as if about to fall while his eyes were fixed upon the door of communication with the dwelling-house reparatus looked in the same direction and saw pancratius just entered and gathering some hasty information from secundus Corvinus's last hope was gone he stood the next moment confronted with the youth who asked reparatus to retire much in the same position as they had last met in only that instead of a circle round him of applauders and backers he was here hemmed in on all sides by a multitude who evidently looked with preference upon his rival nor could Corvinus help observing the graceful development and manly bearing which a few weeks had given his late schoolmate he expected a volley of keen reproach and perhaps such chastisement as he would himself have inflicted in similar circumstances what was his amazement when Macratius thus addressed him in the mildest tone corvinus are you really reduced to distress and lame by some accident or how have you left your father's house not quite come to that yet i hope replied the bully encouraged to insolence by the gentle address though no doubt you will be heartily glad to see it by no means i assure you i hold you no grudge if therefore you require relief tell me and though it is not right that you should be here i can take you into a private chamber where you can receive it unknown then i will tell you the truth i came in here merely for a freak and i should be glad if you could get me quietly out corvinus said the youth with some sternness this is a serious offence what would your father say if i desired these young men who would instantly obey to take you as you are barefoot clothed as a slave counterfeiting a cripple into the forum before his tribunal and publicly charge you with what every roman would resent forcing your way into the higher patrician's house for the god's sake good pancratius do not inflict such frightful punishment you know corvinus that your own father would be obliged to act towards you the part of junius brutus or forfeit his office i entreat you by all that you love by all that you hold sacred not to dishonour me in mine so cruelly my father in his house not i will be crushed and ruined for ever i will go on my knees and beg your pardon for my former injuries if you will only be merciful hold hold corvinus i have told you that was long forgotten but hear me now every one but the blind around you is a witness to this outrage there will be a hundred evidences to prove it if ever then you speak of this assembly still more if you attempt to molest any one for it we shall have it in our power to bring you to trial at your own father's judgment seat do you understand me corvinus i do indeed replied the captive in a whining tone never as long as i live will i breathe to mortal soul that i came into this dreadful place i swear it by the hush hush we want no such oaths here take my arm and walk with me then turning to the others he continued i know this person his coming here is quite a mistake the spectators who had taken the wretch's supplicating gestures and tone for accompaniments to a tale of woe and strong application for relief 
joined in crying out pancratius you will not send him away fasting and unsuccored leave that to me was the reply the self-appointed porters gave way before pancratius who led corvinus still pretending to limp into the street and dismissed him saying corvinus we are now quits only take care of your promise fulvius as we have seen went to try his fortune by the front door he found it according to roman custom unlocked and indeed no one could have suspected the possibility of a stranger entering at such an hour instead of a porter he found guarding the door only a simple-looking girl about twelve or thirteen years of age clad in a peasant's garment no one else was near and he thought it an excellent opportunity to verify the strong suspicion which had crossed his mind accordingly he thus addressed the little portress what is your name child and who are you i am she replied emerentiana the lady agnes's foster sister are you a christian he asked sharply the poor little peasant opened her eyes in the amazement of ignorance and replied no sir it was impossible to resist the evidence of her simplicity and fulvius was satisfied that he was mistaken the fact was that she was a daughter of a peasant who had been agnes's nurse the mother had just died and her kind sister had sent for the orphan daughter intending to have her instructed and baptized she had only arrived a day or two before and was yet totally ignorant of christianity fulvius stood embarrassed what to do next solitude made him feel as awkwardly situated as a crab was making corvinus he thought of retreating but this would have destroyed all his hopes he was going to advance when he reflected that he might commit himself unpleasantly at this critical juncture whom should he see coming lightly across the court but the youthful mistress of the house all joy all spring all brightness and sunshine as soon as she saw him she stood as if to receive his errand and he approached with his blandest smile and most courtly gesture and thus addressed her i have anticipated the usual hour at which visitors come and i fear must appear an intruder lady agnes but i was impatient to inscribe myself as an humble client of your noble house our house she replied smiling boasts of no clients nor do we seek them for we have no pretensions to influence or power pardon me with such a ruler who possesses the highest of influences and the mightiest of powers those which reign without effort over the heart as a most willing subject incapable of imagining that such words could allude to herself she replied with artless simplicity oh how true are your words the lord of this house is indeed the sovereign over the affections of all within it but i interposed fulvius allude to that softer and benigner dominion which graceful charms alone can exercise on those who from near behold it agnes looked as one entranced her eyes beheld a very different image before them from that of her wretched flatterer and with an impassioned glance towards heaven she exclaimed yes he whose beauty sun and moon in their lofty firmament gaze on and admire to him is pledged my service and my love fulvius was confounded and perplexed the inspired look the rapturous attitude the music of the thrilling tones in which she uttered these words their mysterious import the strangeness of the whole scene fastened him to the spot and sealed his lips till feeling that he was losing the most favourable opportunity he could ever expect of opening his mind affection it could not be called to her he boldly said it is of you i am speaking and i entreat you to believe my expression of sincerest admiration of you and of unbounded attachment to you as he uttered these words he dropped on his knee and attempted to take her hand but the maiden bounded back with a shudder and turned away her burning countenance fulvius started in an instant to his feet for he saw sebastian who was come to summon agnes to the poor impatient of her absence striding forward towards him with an air of indignation sebastian said agnes to him as he approached be not angry this gentleman has probably entered here by some unintentional mistake and no doubt will quietly retire saying this she withdrew sebastian with his calm but energetic manner now addressed the intruder who quailed beneath his look fulvius what do you hear 
what business has brought you i suppose answered he regaining courage that having met the lady of the house at the same place with you her noble cousin's table i have a right to wait upon her in common with other voluntary clients but not at so unreasonable an hour as this i presume the hour that is not unreasonable for a young officer retorted fulvius insolently is not a trust so for a civilian sebastian had to use all his power of self-control to check his indignation as he replied fulvius be not rash in what you say but remember that two persons may be on a very different footing in a house yet not even the longest familiarity still less a one dinner's acquaintance can authorize or justify the audacity of your bearing towards the young mistress of this house a few moments ago oh you are jealous i suppose brave captain replied fulvius with his most refined sarcastic tone report says that you are the acceptable if not accepted candidate for fabulous hand she is now in the country and no doubt you wish to make sure for yourself of the fortune of one or the other of rome's richest heiresses there is nothing like having two strings to one bow this coarse and bitter sarcasm wounded the noble officer's best feelings to the quick and had he not long before disciplined himself to christian meekness his blood would have proved too powerful for his reason it is not good for either of us fulvius that you remain longer here the courteous dismissal of the noble lady whom you have insulted has not sufficed i must be the ruder executor of her command saying this he took the unbidden guest's arm in his powerful grasp and conducted him to the door when he had put him outside still holding him fast he added go now fulvius in peace and remember that you have this day made yourself amenable to the laws of the state by this unworthy conduct i will spare you if you know how to keep your own counsel but it is well that you should know that i am acquainted with your occupation in rome and that i hold this morning's insolence over your head as a security that you will follow it discreetly now again i say go in peace but he had no sooner let go his grasp than he felt himself seized from behind by an unseen but evidently an athletic assailant it was eurotus from whom fulvius durst conceal nothing and to whom he had confided the intended interview with corvinus that had followed and watched him from the black slave he had before learnt the mean and coarse character of this client of her magical arts and he feared some trap when he saw the seeming struggle at the door he ran stealthily behind sebastian who he fancied must be his pupil's new alley and pounced upon him with a bear's brood assault but he had no common rival to deal with he attempted in vain though now helped by fulvius to throw the soldier heavily down till despairing of success in this way he detached from his girdle a small but deadly weapon a steel mace of finished syrian make and was raising it over the back of sebastian's head when he felt it wrenched in a trice from his hand and himself twirled two or three times round in an iron grip and flung flat in the middle of the street i am afraid you have hurt the poor fellow cried ratus said sebastian to a centurion who was coming up at that moment to join his fellow christians and was of most herculean make and strength he well deserves it tribune for his cowardly assault replied the other as they re-entered the house the two foreigners crestfallen slunk away from the scene of their defeat and as they turned the corner caught a glimpse of corvinus no longer limping but running as fast as his legs would carry him from his discomfiture at the back door however often they may have met afterwards neither ever alluded to their feats of that morning each knew that the other had incurred only failure and shame and they came both to the conclusion that there was one fold at least in rome which either fox or wolf would assail in vain End of section fourteen. Section fifteen of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, piece. Chapter fifteen. Charity returns. When calm had been restored after this twofold disturbance, the work of the day went quietly on. Besides the distribution of greater alms, such as was made by St. Lawrence from the church, it was by no means so uncommon in early ages for fortunes to be given away at once by those who wished to retire from the world. 
indeed we should naturally expect to find that the noble charity of the apostolic church at jerusalem would not be a barren example to that of rome but this extraordinary charity will be most naturally suggested at periods when the church is threatened with persecutions and when christians who from position and circumstances might look forward to martyrdom would to use a homely phrase clear their hearts and houses for action by removing from both whatever could attach themselves to earth and become the spoil of the impious soldier instead of having been made the inheritance of the poor nor would the great principles be forgotten of making the light of good works to shine before men while the hand which filled the lamp poured in its oil in the secret which only he who seeth in secret can penetrate the plate and jewels of a noble family publicly valued sold and in their price distributed to the poor must have been a bright example of charity which consoled the church animated the generous shamed the avaricious touched the heart of the catechumen and drew blessings and prayers from the lips of the poor and yet the individual right hand that gave them remained closely shrouded from the scrutiny or consciousness of the left and the humility and modesty of the noble giver remained concealed in his bosom into which these earthly treasures were laid up to be returned with boundless and eternal usury and such was the case in the instance before us when all was prepared dionysius the priest who at the same time was the physician to whom the care of the sick was committed and who had succeeded polycarp in the title of saint pastor made his appearance and seated in a chair at one end of the court thus addressed the assembly dear brethren a merciful god has touched the heart of some charitable brother to have compassion on his poor brethren and strip himself of much worldly possession for christ's sake who he is i know not nor would i seek to know he is some one who loves not to have his treasures where rust consumes and thieves break in and steal but prefers like the blessed lawrence that they should be borne up by the hands of christ's poor into the heavenly treasury except then as a gift from god who has inspired this charity the distribution which is about to be made and which may be a useful help in the days of tribulation which are preparing for us and as the only return which is desired from you join all in that familiar prayer which we daily recite for those who give or do us good during this brief address poor pancratius knew not which way to look he had shrunk into a corner behind the assistants and sebastian had compassionately stood before him making himself as large as possible and his emotion did all but betray him when the whole of that assembly knelt down and with outstretched hands uplifted eyes and fervent tone cried out as if with one voice retribere dignare domine omnibus nobis bona facentibus propter nomen tuum vitam eternum amen the alms were then distributed and they proved unexpectedly large abundant food was also served out to all and a cheerful banquet closed the edifying scene it was yet early indeed many partook not of food as a still more delicious and spiritual feast was about to be prepared for them in the neighboring titular church when all was over cecilia insisted upon seeing her poor old cripple safe home and upon carrying for him his heavy canvas purse and chatted so cheerfully to him that he was surprised when he found they had reached the door of his poor but clean lodging his blind guide then thrust his purse into his hand and giving him a hurried good day tripped away most lightly and was soon lost to his sight the bag seemed uncommonly full so he counted carefully its contents and found to his amazement that he had a double portion he tried again and still it was so at the first opportunity he made inquiries from apparatus but could get no explanation if he had seen cecilia when she had turned the corner laugh outright as if she had been playing some one a good trick and running as lightly as if she had nothing heavy about her he might have discovered a solution of the problem of his wealth. End of section 15。section 16 of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。recording by Maria Therese。part first piece。chapter 16 the month of October。the month of october in italy is certainly a glorious season the sun has contracted his heat but not his splendor he is less scorching but not less bright 
as he rises in the morning he dashes sparks of radiance over awakening nature as an indian prince upon entering his presence chamber flings handfuls of gems and gold into the crowd and the mountains seem to stretch forth their rocky heads and the woods to wave their lofty arms in eagerness to catch his royal largest and after careering through a cloudless sky when he reaches his goal and finds his bed spread with molten gold on the western sea and canopied above with purple clouds edged with burnished yet airy fringes more brief than ophire supplied to the couch of solomon he expands himself into a huge disc of most benignant effulgence as if to bid farewell to its past course but soon sends back after disappearing radiant messengers from the world he is visiting and cheering to remind us he will soon be back and gladden us again if less powerful his ray is certainly richer and more active it has taken months to draw out of the sapless shrivelled vine stem first green leaves then crisp slender tendrils and last little clusters of hard sour berries and the growth has been provokingly slow but now the leaves are large and mantling and worthy in vine countries to have a name of their own and the separated little knots have swelled up into luxurious bunches of grapes and of these some are already assuming their bright amber tint while those which are to glow in rich imperial purple are passing rapidly to it though a changing opal hue scarcely less beautiful it is pleasant then to sit in a shady spot on a hillside and look ever and anon from one's book over the varied and varying landscape for as the breeze sweeps over the olives on the hillside and turns over their leaves it brings out from them light and shade for their two sides vary in sober tint and as the sun shines or the cloud darkens on the vineyards and the rounded hollows between the brilliant web of unstirring vine leaf displays the yellower or browner shade of its delicious green then mingle with these the innumerable other colors that tinge the picture from the dark cypress the duller ilex the rich chestnut the reddening orchard the adust stubble the melancholy pine to italy what the palm tree is to the east towering above the box and the arbutus and laurels of villas and these scattered all over the mountain hill and plain with fountains leaping up and cascades gliding down porticos of glittering marble statues of bronze and stone painted fronts of rustic dwellings and flowers innumerable and patches of greensward and you have a faint idea of the attractions which for this month as in our days used to draw out the roman patrician and knight from what horace calls the clatter and smoke of rome to feast his eyes upon the calmer beauties of the country and so as the happy month approached villas were seen open to let an air and innumerable slaves were busy dusting and scouring trimming the hedges into fantastic shapes clearing the canals for the artificial brooklets and plucking up the weeds from the gravel walks the velicus or country steward superintends all and with sharp word or sharper lash makes many suffer that perhaps only one may enjoy at last the dusty roads become encumbered with every species of vehicle from the huge wain carrying furniture and slowly drawn by oxen to the light chariot or gig dashing on behind spirited barbs and as the best roads were narrow and the drivers of other days were not more smooth-tongued than those of ours we may imagine what confusion and noise and squabbling filled the public ways nor was there a favoured one among these sabine tusculan and alban hills were all studded over with splendid villas or humbler cottages such as a Macanes or a horace might respectively occupy even the flat campana of rome is covered with the ruins of immense country residences while from the mouth of the tiber along the coast of laurentum lanuvium and nantium and so on to cacetta baja and other fashionable watering places round vesuvius a street of noble residences may be said to have run nor were these limits sufficient to satisfy the periodical fever for rustication in rome the borders of binacus now the lago maggiore north of milan como and the beautiful banks of the brenta receive their visitors not from neighbouring cities only still less from wanderers of germanic origin but rather from the inhabitants of the imperial capital it was to one of these tender eyes of italy as pliny calls its villas because forming its truest beauty the fabiola had hastened before the rush on the road the day after her black slave's interview with corvinus it was situated on the slope of the hill which descends to the bay of gaeta and was remarkable like her house for the good taste which arranged the most costly though not luxurious elements of comfort from the terrace in front of the elegant villa could be seen the calm azure bay 
embowered in the richest of shores like a mere in an embossed and enameled frame relieved by the white sunlit sails of yachts galleys pleasure boats and fishing skiffs from some of which rose the roaring laugh of excursionists from others the song or harp notes of family parties or the loud sharp and not over refined ditties of the various ploughmen of the deep a gallery of lattice covered with creepers led to the bass on the shore and halfway down was an opening on a favourite spot of green kept ever fresh by the gush from an outcropping rock of a crystal spring confined for a moment in its natural basin in which it bubbled and fretted till rushing over its ledge it went down murmuring and chattering in the most good-natured way imaginable along the side of the trellis into the sea two enormous plane trees cast their shade over this classic ground as did plato's and cicero's over their choice scenes of philosophical disquisition the most beautiful flowers and plants from distant climates have been taught to make this spot their home sheltered as it was equally from sultriness and from frost fabius for reasons which will be explained later seldom paid more than a flying visit for a couple of days to this villa and even then it was generally on his way to some gayer resort of roman fashion where he had or pretended to have business his daughter was therefore mostly alone and enjoyed a delicious solitude besides a well-furnished library always kept at the villa chiefly containing works of agriculture or of local interest a stock of books some old favourites other lighter productions of the season of which she generally procured an early copy at a high price was brought every year from rome together with a quantity of smaller familiar works of art such as distributed through new apartments make them become a home most of her morning hours were spent in the cherished retreat just described with a book casket at her side from which she selected first one volume and then another but any visitor calling upon her this year would have been surprised to find her almost always with a companion and that a slave we may imagine how amazed she was when the day following the dinner at her house agnes informed her that syra had declined to leave her service though tempted by a bribe of liberty still more astonished was she at learning that the reason was attachment to herself she could feel no pleasurable consciousness of having earned this affection by any acts of kindness nor even by any decent gratitude for a servant's care of her in illness she was therefore at first inclined to think syra a fool for her pains but it would not do in her mind it was true she had often read or heard of instances of fidelity and devotedness in slaves even towards oppressive masters but these were always accounted as exceptions to the general rule and what were a few dozen cases and as many centuries of love compared with the daily ten thousand ones of hatred around her yet here was a clear and palpable one at hand and it struck her forcibly she waited a time and watched her maid eagerly to see if she could discover in her conduct any errors any symptom of thinking she had done a grand thing and that her mistress must feel it not in the least syra pursued all her duties with the same simple diligence and never betrayed any signs of believing herself less a slave than before fabiola's heart softened more and more and she now began to think that not quite so difficult which in her conversation with agnes she had pronounced impossible to love a slave and she had also discovered a second evidence that there was such a thing in the world as disinterested love affection that asked for no return her conversations with her slave after the memorable one which we have recounted had satisfied her that she had received a superior education she was too delicate to question her on her early history especially as masters often had young slaves highly educated to enhance their value but she soon discovered that she read greek and latin authors with ease and elegance and wrote well in both languages by degrees she raised her position to the great annoyance of her companions she ordered euphrosian to give her a separate room the greatest of comforts to the poor maid and she employed her near herself as a secretary and reader still she could perceive no change in her conduct no pride no pretensions for the moment any work presented itself of the menial character formerly allotted to her she never seemed to think of turning it over to any one else but at once naturally and cheerfully set herself about it the reading generally pursued by fabiola was as has been previously observed of rather an abstruse and refined character consisting of philosophical literature she was surprised however to find how her slave by a simple remark 
would often confute an apparently solid maxim bring down a grand flight of virtuous declamation or suggest a higher view of moral truth or a more practical course of action than authors whom she had long admired proposed in their writings nor was this done by any apparent shrewdness of judgment or pungency of wit nor did it seem to come from much reading or deep thought or superiority of education for though she saw traces of this in Sarah's words ideas and behaviour yet the books and doctrines which she was reading now were evidently new to her but there seemed to be in her maid's mind some latent but infallible standard of truth some master key which opened equally every closed deposit of moral knowledge some well-attuned chord which vibrated in unfailing unison with what was just and right but jangled in dissonance with whatever was wrong vicious or even inaccurate what this secret was she wanted to discover it was more like an intuition than anything she had ever before witnessed she was not yet in a condition to learn that the meanest and least in the kingdom of heaven and what lower than a slave was greater in spiritual wisdom intellectual light and heavenly privileges than even the baptist precursor it was on a delicious morning in october that reclining by the spring the mistress and slave were occupied in reading when the former wearied with the heaviness of the volume looked for something lighter and newer and drawing out a manuscript from her casket said sira put that stupid book down here is something i am told very amusing and only just come out it will be new to both of us the handmaid did as she was told looked at the title of the proposed volume and blushed she glanced over the few first lines and her fears were confirmed she saw that it was one of those trashy works which were freely allowed to circulate as st justin complained though grossly immoral and making light of all virtue while every christian writing was suppressed or as much as possible discountenanced she put down the book with a calm resolution and said do not my good mistress ask me to read to you from that book it is fit neither for me to recite nor for you to hear fabiola was astonished she had never heard or even thought of such a thing as restraint put upon her studies what in our days would be looked upon as unfit for common perusal formed part of current and fashionable literature from horace to ausonius all classical writers demonstrate this and what rail of virtue could have made that reading seem indelicate which only described by the pen a system of morals which the pencil and the chisel made hourly familiar to every eye fabiola had no higher standard of right and wrong than the system under which she had been educated could give her what possible harm can it do either of us she asked smiling i have no doubt there are plenty of foul crimes and wicked actions described in the book but it will not induce us to commit them and in the meantime it is amusing to read them of others would you yourself for any consideration do them not for the world yet as you hear them read their image must occupy your mind as they amuse you your thoughts must dwell upon them with pleasure certainly what then that image is foulness that thought is wickedness how is that possible does not wickedness require an action to have any existence true my mistress and what is the action of the mind or as i call it the soul the thought a passion which wishes death is the act of this invisible power like it unseen the blow which inflicts it is but the mechanical action of the body discernible like its origin but which power commands and which obeys in which resides the responsibility of the final effect i understand you said fabiola after a pause of some little mortification but one difficulty remains there is responsibility you maintain for the inward as well as the outward act to whom if the second follows there is joint responsibility for both to society to the laws to principles of justice to self for painful results will ensue but if only the inward action exists to whom can there be responsibility who sees it who can presume to judge it who to control it god said sira with simple earnestness fabiola was disappointed she expected some new theory some striking principle to come out instead they had sunk down into what she feared was mere superstition though not so much as she once had deemed it what sira do you then really believe in jupiter in juno or perhaps minerva who is about the most respectable of the olympian family 
do you think they have anything to do with our affairs far indeed from it i loathe their very names and i detest the wickedness which their histories or fables symbolize on earth no i spoke not of gods and goddesses but of one only god and what do you call him sirrah in your system he has no name but god and that only men have given him that they may speak of him it describes not his nature his origin his attributes and what are these asked the mistress with awakened curiosity simple as light is his nature one and the same everywhere indivisible undefilable penetrating yet diffusive ubiquitous and unlimited he existed before there was any beginning he will exist after all ending has ceased power wisdom goodness love justice too and an erring judgment belong to him by his nature and are as unlimited and restrained as it he alone can create he alone preserve and he alone destroy fabiola had often read of the inspired looks which animated a sibyl or the priestess of an oracle but she had never witnessed them till now the slave's countenance glowed her eyes shone with a calm brilliancy her frame was immovable the words flowed from her lips as if these were but the opening of a musical reed made vocal by another's breath her expression and manner forcibly reminded fabiola of that abstracted and mysterious look which she had so often noticed in agnes and though in the child it was more tender and graceful in the maid it seemed more earnest and oracular how enthusiastic and excitable an eastern temperament is to be sure thought fabiola as she gazed upon her slave no wonder the east should be thought the land of poetry and inspiration when she saw Sira relax from the evident tension of her mind she said in as light a tone as she could assume but Sira, can you think that a being such as you have described far beyond all the conception of ancient fable can occupy himself with constantly watching the actions still more the paltry thoughts of millions of creatures it is no occupation lady it is not even choice i called him light is it occupation or labour to the sun to send his rays through the crystal of this fountain to the very pebbles in his bed see how of themselves they disclose not only the beautiful but the foul that harbours there not only the sparkles that the following drops strike from its rough sides not only the pearly bubbles that merely rise glisten for a moment and then break against the surface not only the golden fish that bask in their light but black and loathsome creeping things which seek to hide and bury themselves in dark nooks below and cannot for the light pursues them is there toil or occupation in all this to the sun that thus visits them far more would it appear so were he to restrain his beams at the surface of the transparent element and hold them back from throwing it into light and what he does here he does in the next stream and in that which is a thousand miles off with equal ease nor can any imaginable increase of their number or bulk lead us to fancy or believe that rays would be wanting or light would fail to scrutinize them all your theories are beautiful always sira and if true most wonderful observed fabiola after a pause during which her eyes were fixed contemplating the fountain as though she were testing the truth of sira's words and they sound like truth she added for could falsehood be more beautiful than truth but what an awful idea that one has never been alone has never had a wish to oneself has never held a single thought in secret has never hidden the most foolish fancy of a proud or childish brain from the observation of one that knows no imperfection terrible thought that one is living if you say true under the steady gaze of an eye of which the sun is but a shadow for he enters not the soul it is enough to make one any evening commit self-destruction to get rid of the torturing watchfulness yet it sounds so true fabiola looked almost wild as she spoke these words the pride of her pagan heart rose strong within her and she rebelled against the supposition that she could never again feel alone with her own thoughts or that any power should exist which could control her inmost desires imaginings or caprices still the thought came back yet it seemed so true her generous intellect struggled against the writhing passion like an eagle with a serpent more than eye than with beaks and talons subduing the quailing foe after a struggle visible in her countenance and gestures a calm came over her 
she seemed for the first time to feel the presence of one greater than herself someone whom she feared yet whom she would wish to love she bowed down her mind she bent her intelligence to his feet and her heart too owned for the first time that it had a master and a lord Sira, with calm intensity of feeling silently watched the workings of her mistress's mind she knew how much depended on their issue what a mighty step in her unconscious pupil's religious progress was involved in the recognition of the truth before her and she fervently prayed for this grace at length fabiola raised her head which seemed to have been bowed down in accompaniment to her mind and with graceful kindness said sirrah i am sure i have not yet reached the depths of your knowledge you must have much more to teach me a tear and a blush came to the poor handmaid's relief but to-day you have opened a new world and a new life to my thoughts a sphere of virtue beyond the opinions and judgments of men a consciousness of a controlling and approving and a rewarding power too am i right sirrah expressed approbation standing by us when no other eye can see or restrain or encourage us a feeling that were we shut up for ever in solitude we should be ever the same because that influence on us must be so superior to that of any amount of human principles in guiding us and could not leave us such if i understand your theory in the position of moral elevation in which it would place each individual to fall below it even with an outwardly virtuous life is mere deceit and positive wickedness is this so oh my dear mistress exclaimed sira how much better you can express all this than i you have never flattered me yet sira replied fabiola smilingly do not begin now but you have thrown a new light upon other subjects till to-day obscure to me tell me now was it not this you meant when you once told me that in your view there is no distinction between mistress and slave that as the distinction is only outward bodily and social is it not to be put in comparison with that equality which exists before your supreme being and that possible moral superiority which you might see of the one over the other inversely of their visible rank it was in a great measure so my noble lady though there are other considerations involved in the idea which would hardly interest you at present and yet when you stated that proposition it seemed to me so monstrous so absurd that pride and anger overcame me do you remember that sira oh no no replied the gentle servant do not allude to it i pray have you forgiven me that day sira said the mistress with an emotion quite new to her the poor maid was overpowered she rose and threw herself on her knees before her mistress and tried to seize her hand but she prevented her and for the first time in her life fabiola threw herself upon a slave's neck and wept her passion of tears was long and tender her heart was giving above her intellect and this can only be by its increasing softness at length she grew calm and as she withdrew her embrace she said one thing more sira dare one address by worship this being whom you have described to me is he not too great too lofty too distant for this oh no far from it noble lady answered the servant he is not distant from any of us for as much as in the light of the sun so in the very splendor of his might his kindness and his wisdom we live and move and have our being hence one may address him not as far off but as around us and within us while we are in him and he hears us not with ears but our words drop at once into his very bosom and the desires of our hearts pass directly into the divine abyss of his but pursued fabiola somewhat timidly is there no great act of acknowledgment such as sacrifice is supposed to be whereby he may be formally recognized and adored sira hesitated for the conversation seemed to be trenching upon mysterious and sacred ground never opened by the church to profane feet she however answered in a simple and general affirmative and could not i still more humbly asked her mistress be so far instructed in your school as to be able to perform this sublimer act of homage i fear not noble fabiola one must needs obtain a victim worthy of the deity ah yes to be sure answered fabiola 
a bull may be found enough for jupiter or a goat for bacchus but where can be found a sacrifice worthy of him whom you have brought me to know it must indeed be one every way worthy of him spotless in purity matchless in greatness unbounded in acceptableness and what can that be sirrah only himself fabiola shrouded her face with her hands and then looking up earnestly into sirrah's face said to her i am sure that after having so clearly described to me the deep sense of responsibility under which you must habitually speak as well as act you have a real meaning in this awful saying though i understand you not as surely as every word of mine is heard as every thought of mine is seen it is a truth which i have spoken i have not strength to carry the subject further at present my mind has need of rest End of section sixteen. Section seventeen of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, piece, chapter seventeen, the Christian community. After this conversation, Fabiola retired, and during the rest of the day, her mind was alternately agitated and calm. When she looked steadily on the grand view of moral life which her mind had grasped, she found an unusual tranquillity in its contemplation. She felt as if she had made discovery of a great phenomenon, the knowledge of which guided her into a new and lofty region, whence she could smile on the errors and follies of mankind. But when she considered the responsibility which this light imposed, the watchfulness which it demanded, the unseen and unrequited struggles which it required, the desolateness almost of a virtue without admiration or even sympathy she again shrunk from the life that was before her as about to be passed without any stay or help from the only sources of it which she knew unconscious of the real cause she saw that she possessed not instruments or means to carry out the beautiful theory this seemed to stand like a brilliant lamp in the midst of a huge bare unfurnished hall lighting up only a wilderness what was the use of so much wasted splendor the next morning had been fixed for one of those visits which used to be annually paid in the country that to the now ex-prefect of the city crematins our reader will remember that after his conversation and resignation of office this magistrate had retired to his villa in campania taking with him a number of the converts made by sebastian with the holy priest polycarp to complete their instruction of these circumstances of course fabiola had never been informed but she heard all sorts of curious reports about chromatius's villa it was said that he had a number of visitors never before seen at his house that he gave no entertainments that he had freed all his country slaves but that many of them had preferred remaining with him that if numerous the whole establishment seemed very happy though no boisterous sports or frolics and meetings seemed to be indulged in all this stimulated fabiola's curiosity in addition to her wish to discharge a pleasing duty of courtesy to a most kind friend of hers from childhood and she longed to see with her own eyes what appeared to her to be a very platonic or as we should say utopian experiment in a light country carriage with good horses fabiola started early and dashed gaily along the level road across the happy campania an autumnal shower had laid the dust and studded with glistening gems the garlands of vine which bordered the way festooned instead of hedges from tree to tree it was not long before she reached a gentle acclivity for hill it could scarcely be called covered with box arbutus and laurels relieved by tall tapering cypresses amidst which shone the white walls of the large villa on the summit a change she perceived had taken place which at first she could not exactly define but when she had passed through the gate the number of empty pedestals and niches reminded her that the villa had entirely lost one of its most characteristic ornaments the number of beautiful statues which stood gracefully against the clipped evergreen hedges and gave the name now become quite an empty one of odd statuas chromatius whom she had last seen limping with gout now a hale old man courteously received her and inquired kindly after her father asking if the report were true that he was going shortly to asia at this fabiola seemed grieved and mortified for he had not mentioned his intention to her 
Comatius hoped it might be a false alarm, and asked her to take a stroll about the grounds. She found them kept with the same care as ever, full of beautiful plants, but still much missed the old statues. At last they reached a grotto with a fountain, in which formerly nymphs and sea deities disported, it, but which now presented a black, unbroken surface. She could contain herself no longer, and turning to Crematius, she said, Why, what on earth have you been doing, Crematius, to send away all your statues and destroy the peculiar feature of your handsome villa? What induced you to do this? My dear young lady, answered the good-humoured old gentleman, do not be so angry. Of what use were those figures to any one? If you thought so, replied she, others might not. But tell me, what have you done with them all? Why, to tell you the truth, I have had them brought under the hammer. What? And never let me know anything about it? You know there were several pieces I would most gladly have purchased. Carmatius laughed outright, and said, with that familiar tone, which acquaintance with Fabiola from a child authorized him always to assume with her, Dear me, how your young imagination runs away! far too fast for my poor old tongue to keep pace with i meant not the auctioneer's hammer but the sledge-hammer the gods and goddesses have been all smashed pulverized if you happen to want a stray leg or a hand minus a few fingers perhaps i may pick up such a thing for you but i cannot promise you a face with a nose or a skull without a fracture fabiola was utterly amazed as she exclaimed what an utter barbarian you have become my wise old judge what shadow of reason can you give to justify so outrageous a proceeding why you see as i have grown older i have grown wiser and i have come to the conclusion that mr jupiter and mrs juno are no more gods than you or i so i summarily got rid of them yes that may be very well and i though neither old nor wise have been long of the same opinion but why not retain them as mere works of art because they had been set up here, not in that capacity, but as divinities. They were here as impostors, under false pretenses. And as you would turn out of your house, for an intruder, any bust or image found among those of your ancestors, but belonging to quite another family, so did I these pretenders to a higher connection with me, when I found it false. Neither could I run a risk of their being bought for the continuance of the same imposture." And pray, my most righteous old friend, is it not an imposture to continue calling your villa ad stratuus, after not a single statue is left standing in it? Certainly, replied Crematus, amused at her sharpness, and you will see that I have planted palm trees all about, and as soon as they show their heads above the evergreens, the villa will take the title of Odd Palmus instead. That will be a pretty name, said Fabiola, who little thought of the higher sense of the appropriateness which it would contain. She, of course, was not aware that the villa was now a training school, in which many were being prepared, as wrestlers or gladiators used to be, in separate institutions, for the great combat of faith, martyrdom to death. They who had entered in, and they who would go out, might equally say they were on their way to pluck the conqueror's palm, to be borne by them before God's judgment seat, in token of their victory over the world many were the palm branches shortly to be gathered in that early christian retreat but we must here give the history of the demolition of chromatius's statues which forms a peculiar episode in the acts of st sebastian when micastratus informed him as prefect of rome of the release of his prisoners and of the recovery of tranquilinus from gout by baptism chromatius after making every inquiry into the truth of the fact sent for sebastian and proposed to become a christian as a means of obtaining a cure of the same complaint. This, of course, could not be, and another course was proposed, which would give him new and personal evidence of Christianity, without risking an insincere baptism. Chromatius was celebrated, for the immense number of idolatrous images which he possessed, and was assured by Sebastian that, if he would have them all broken in pieces, he would at once recover. This was a hard condition, but he consented. His son Tiburtius, however, was furious, and protested that if the promised result did not follow, he would have Sebastian and Polycarp thrown into a blazing furnace. Not perhaps so difficult a matter for the prefect's son. In one day two hundred pagan statues were broken in pieces, including, of course, those in the villa, as well as those in the house at Rome. The images indeed were broken, but Chromatius was not cured. 
Sebastian was sent for and sharply rebuked. But he was calm and inflexible. I am sure, he said, that all have not been destroyed. Something has been withheld from demolition. He proved right. Some small objects have been treated as works of art rather than religious things, and, like Aachen's coveted spoil, concealed. They were brought forth and broken up, and Cremantius instantly recovered. Not only was he converted, but his son Tiburtius became also one of the most fervent of Christians, and, dying in glorious martyrdom, gave his name to a catacomb. He had begged to stay in Rome, to encourage and assist his fellow believers in the coming persecution, which his connection with the palace, his great courage and activity, would enable him to do. He had become, naturally, the great friend and frequent companion of Sebastian and Pancratius. After this little digression, we resumed the conversation between Cremantius and Fabiola, who continued her last sentence by adding, But do you know, Cremantius, let us sit down in this lovely spot, where I remember there was a beautiful Bacchus, that all sorts of strange reports are going round the country about your doings here. Dear me, what are they? Do tell me. Why, that you have a quantity of people living with you, whom nobody knows, that you see no company, go out nowhere, and lead quite a philosophical sort of life, forming a most platonic republic. Highly flattered, interrupted Crematius, with a smile and bow. But that is not all, continued Fabiola. They say you keep most unfashionable hours, have no amusements, and live most abstemiously. In fact, almost starve yourselves. But I hope they do us the justice to add that we pay our way, observed Crematius. They don't say, do they, that we have a long score run up at the baker's or grocer's? Oh, no, replied Fabiola, laughing. How kind of them, rejoined the good-humoured old judge. They, the whole public, I mean, seem to take a wonderful interest in our concerns. But is it not strange, my dear young lady, that so long as my villa was on the free and easy system, with as much loose talk, deep drinking, occasional sallies of youthful mirth, and troublesome freaks in the neighbourhood, as others, I beg your pardon for alluding to such things, but, in fact, so long as I and my friends were neither temperate nor irreproachable, nobody gave himself the least trouble about us. But let a few people retire to live in quiet, be frugal, industrious, entirely removed from public affairs, and never even talk about politics or society, and at once there springs up a vulgar curiosity to know all about them, and a mean paritist and third-rate statesman to meddle with them and there must needs fly about flocks of false reports and foul suspicions about their motives and manner of living. Is this not a phenomenon? It is indeed, but how do you account for it? I can only do so by that faculty of little minds which makes them almost jealous of any aims higher than their own, so that almost unconsciously they depreciate whatever they feel to be better than they dare to aspire. But what is really your object in your mode of life here, my good friend? We spend our time in the cultivation of our higher faculties. We rise frightfully early. I hardly dare tell you how early. We then devote some hours to religious worship, after which we occupy ourselves in a variety of ways. Some read, some write, some labor in the gardens, and I assure you no hired workman ever toiled harder and better than these spontaneous agriculturists. We meet at different times and sing beautiful songs together, all breathing virtue and purity, and read most improving books and receive oral instruction from eloquent teachers. Our meals are indeed very temperate. We live entirely on vegetables, but I have already found out that laughing is quite compatible with lentils, and that good cheer does not necessarily mean good fare. Why, you are turned complete Pythagoreans. I thought that was quite out of date, but it must be a most economical system, remarked Fabiola with a knowing look. Ha, you cunning thing, answered the judge. So you really think that this may be a saving plan after all. But it won't be, for we have taken a most desperate resolution. And what on earth is that? asked the young lady. Nothing less than this. We are determined that there shall not be such a thing as a poor person within our reach. This winter we will endeavor to clothe all the naked and feed the hungry and attend to all the sick about. All our economy will go for this. It is indeed a very generous, though very new, idea in our times, and no doubt you will be well laughed at for your pains, and abused on all sides. They will even say worse of you than they do now, if it were possible. But it is not. How so? 
do not be offended if i tell you but already they have gone so far as to hint that possibly you are christians but this i assure you i have everywhere indignantly contradicted chromatius smiled and said why an indignant contradiction my dear child because to be sure i know you and tiburtius and nicostratus and that dear damso too well to admit for a moment that you had adopted the compound of stupidity and knavery called by that name let me ask you one question have you taken the trouble of reading any christian writings by which you might know what is really held and done by that despised body oh not i indeed i would not waste my time over them i would not have patience to learn anything about them i scorn them too much as enemies of all intellectual progress as doubtful citizens as credulous to the last degree and as sanctioning every abominable crime even to give myself a chance of a nearer acquaintance with them well dear fabiola i thought just the same about them once but i have much altered my opinion of late this is indeed strange since as prefect of the city you must have had to punish many of these wretched people for the constant transgression of the law a cloud came over the cheerful countenance of the old man and a tear stood in his eye he thought of st paul who had once persecuted the church of god fabiola saw the change and was distressed in the most affectionate manner she said to him i have said something very thoughtless i fear or stirred up recollections of what must be painful to your kind heart forgive me dear chromatius and let us talk of something else one purpose of my visit to you was to ask you if you knew of any one going immediately to rome i have heard from several quarters of my father's projected journey and i am anxious to write to him lest he repeat what he did before go without taking leave of me to spare me pain yes replied chromatius there is a young man starting early to-morrow morning come into the library and write your letter the bearer is probably there they returned to the house and entered an apartment on the ground floor full of book-chests at a table in the middle of the room a young man was seated transcribing a large volume which on seeing a stranger enter he closed and put aside torquatus said chromatius addressing him this lady desires to send a letter to her father in rome it will always give me great pleasure replied the young man to serve the noble fabiola or her illustrious father what do you know of them asked the judge rather surprised i had the honour when very young as my father has had before me to be employed by the noble fabius in asia ill health compelled me to leave his service several sheets of fine vellum cut to a size evidently for transcription of some book lay on the table one of these the good old man placed before the lady with ink and a reed and she wrote a few affectionate lines to her father she doubled the paper tied a thread round it attached some wax to this and impressed her seal which she drew from an embroidered bag upon the wax anxious some time to reward the messenger when she could better know how she took another piece of the vellum and made on it a memorandum of his name and residence and carefully put this into her bosom after partaking of some slight refreshment she mounted her car and bid chromatius an affectionate farewell there was something touchingly paternal in his look as though he felt he should never see her again so she thought but it was a very different feeling which softened his heart should she always remain thus must he leave her to perish in obstinate ignorance were that generous heart and that noble intellect to grovel on in the slime of bitter paganism when every feeling and every thought in them seemed formed of a strong yet finest fibres across which truth might weave the richest web it could not be and yet a thousand motives restrained him from an avowal which he felt would at present only repulse her fatally from any nearer approach to the faith farewell my child he exclaimed may you be blessed a hundredfold in ways which as yet you know not he turned away his face as he dropped her hand and hastily withdrew fabiola too was moved by the mystery as well as the tenderness of his words but was startled before reaching the gate to find her chariot stopped by turquatus she was at the moment painfully struck by the contrast between the easy and rather familiar the respectful manner of the youth and the mild gravity mixed with cheerfulness of the old ex-prefect pardon this interruption madam he said but are you anxious to have this letter quickly delivered 
certainly i am most anxious that it should reach my father as speedily as possible then i fear i shall hardly be able to serve you i can only afford to travel on foot or by chance and cheap conveyance and i shall be some days upon the road fabiola hesitating said would it be taking too great a liberty if i should offer you the fray the expenses of a more rapid journey by no means answered Torquatus rather eagerly if i can thereby better serve your noble house fabiola handed him a purse abundantly supplied not only for his journey but for an ample recompense he received it with smiling readiness and disappeared by a side alley there was something in his manner which made a disagreeable impression she could not think he was fit company for her dear old friend if chromatius had witnessed the transaction he would have seen a likeness to judas and that eager clutching of the purse fabiola however was not sorry to have discharged by a sum of money once for all any obligation she might have contracted by making him her messenger she therefore drew out her memorandum to destroy it as useless when she perceived that the other side of the vellum was written on as the transcriber of the book which she saw put by had just commenced its continuation on that sheet only a few sentences however had been written and she proceeded to read them then for the first time she perused the following words from a book unknown to her i say to you love your enemies do good to them that hate you and pray for them that persecute and calumniate you that you may be the children of your father who is in heaven who maketh his son to rise on the good and the bad and reigneth upon the just and the unjust we may imagine the perplexity of an indian peasant who has picked up in a torrent's bed a white pellucid pebble rough and dull outside but where chipped emitting sparks of light unable to decide whether he have become possessed of a splendid diamond or of a worthless stone a thing to be placed on a royal crown or trodden under a beggar's feet shall he put an end to his embarrassment by at once flinging it away or shall he take it to a lapidary and ask its value and perhaps be laughed at to his face such were the alternating feelings of fabiola on her way home whose can these sentences be no greek or roman philosophers they are either very false or very true either sublime morality degradation or base degradation does any one practise this doctrine or is it a splendid paradox i will trouble myself no more on the subject or rather i will ask sarah about it it sounds very like one of her beautiful but impracticable theories no it is better not she overpowers me by her sublime views so impossible for me though they seem easy to her my mind wants rest the shortest way is to get rid of the cause of my perplexity and forget such harassing words so here it goes to the winds or to puzzle some one else who may find it on the roadside ho oh, formio stop the chariot and pick up that piece of parchment which i have dropped the outrider obeyed though he had thought the sheet deliberately flung out it was replaced in fabiola's bosom it was like a seal upon her heart for that heart was calm and silent till she reached home end of section seventeen section eighteen of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part first piece chapter eighteen temptation very early next morning a mule and guide came to the door of Grammatius's villa on it was packed a moderate pair of saddle-bags the whole known property of Dracatius. many friends were up to see him off and received from him the kiss of peace ere he departed may it not prove like that of gethsemane some whispered a kind soft word in his ear exhorting him to be faithful to the graces he had received and he earnestly and probably sincerely promised that he would others knowing his poverty put a little present into his hand and entreated him to avoid his old haunts and acquaintances polycarp however the director of the community called him aside and with fervent words and flowing tears conjured him to correct the irregularities slight perhaps but threatening which had appeared in his conduct repress the levity which had manifested itself in his bearing and cultivate more all christian virtues Torquatus, also with tears, promised obedience, knelt down, kissed the good priest's hand, and obtained his blessing. 
then received from him letters of recommendation for his journey and a small sum for its moderate expenses at length all was ready the last farewell was spoken the last good wish expressed and torquatus mounted on his mule with his guide at its bridle proceeded slowly along the straight avenue which led to the gate long after every one else had re-entered the house chromatius was standing at the door looking wistfully with a moist eye after him it was just such a look as the prodigal's father kept fixed on his departing son as the villa was not on the high road this modest quadrupedal conveyance had been hired to take him across the country to fundy now fondy as the nearest point where he could reach it there he was to find what means he could for prosecuting his journey fabiola's purse however had set him very much at ease on that score the road by which he travelled was varied in its beauties sometimes it wound along the banks of the lyris gay with villas and cottages then it plunged into a miniature ravine in the skirts of the apennines walled in by rocks matted with myrtle aloes and the wild vine amidst which white goats shone like spots of snow while beside the path gurgled and wriggled on a tiny brook that seemed to have worked itself into the bright conceit that it was a mountain torrent so great was the bustle and noise with which it pushed on and pretended to foam and appeared to congratulate itself loudly on having achieved a waterfall by leaping down two stones at a time and plunging into an abyss concealed by a wide and canthus leaf then the road emerged to enjoy a wide prospect of the vast garden of capania with the blue bay of cajeta in the background speckled by the white sails of its craft that looked at that distance like flocks of bright plumed waterfowl basking and fluttering on a lake what were the traveller's thoughts amidst these shifting scenes of a new act in his life's drama did they amuse him did they delight him did they elevate him or did they depress his eyes scarcely noted them it had run on far beyond them to the shady porticoes and noisy streets of the capital the dusty garden and the artificial fountain the marble bath and the painted vault were more beautiful in his eyes than fresh autumn vineyards pure streams purple ocean and azure sky he did not of course for a moment turn his thoughts towards its foul deeds and impious practices its luxury its debauchery its profaneness its dishonesties its calumnies its treacheries its uncleanness oh no what would he a christian have again to do with these sometimes as his mind became abstracted it saw in a dark nook of a hall in the therme a table round which moody but eager gamesters were casting their knuckle-bone dice and he felt a quivering creep over him of an excitement long suppressed but a pair of mild eyes like polycarps loomed on him from behind the table and aroused him then he caught himself in fancy seated at a maple board with the ruddy gem a falernian wine set in the rim of a golden goblet and discourse ungirded by inebriety going around with the cup when the reproving countenance of chromatius was seen placed opposite repelling with a scowl the approach of either he was in fact returning only to the innocent enjoyments of the imperial city to its walks its music its paintings its magnificence its beauty he forgot that all these were but the accessories to a living and panting mass of human beings whose passions they enkindled whose evil desires they inflamed whose ambition they fanned whose resolutions they melted and whose minds they enervated poor youth he thought he could walk through that fire and not be scorched poor moth he imagined he could fly through that flame and have his wings unscathed it was in one of his abstracted moods that he journeyed through a narrow overhung defile when suddenly he found himself at its opening with an inlet of the sea before him and in it one solitary and motionless skiff. The sight at once brought to his memory a story of his childhood, true or false, it mattered not, but he almost fancied its scene was before him. Once upon a time there was a bold young fisherman living on the coast of southern Italy. One night, stormy and dark, he found that his father and brothers would not venture out in their tight and strong smack. So he determined, in spite of every remonstrance, to go alone in a little cockle shell attached to it, it blew a gale but he rode it out in his tiny buoyant bark till the sun rose warm and bright upon a placid glassy sea overcome by fatigue and heat he fell asleep but after some time was awakened by a loud shouting in a distance he looked round and saw the family boat the crew of which were crying aloud and waving their hands to invite him back but they made no effort to reach him what could they want what could they mean he seized his oars and began to pull lustily towards them 
but he was soon amazed to find that the fishing boat towards which he had turned the prow of his skiff appeared upon his quarter and soon though he righted his craft it was on the opposite side evidently he had been making a circle but the end came within its beginning in a spiral curve and now he was commencing another and a narrower one a horrible suspicion flashed upon his mind he threw off his tunic and pulled like a madman at his oars but though he broke the circle a bit here and a bit there still round he went and every time nearer to the centre in which he could see a downward funnel of hissing and foaming water then in despair he threw down his oars and standing he flung up his arms frantically and a seabird screaming near heard him cry out as loud as itself tribdis and now the stroke of his boat went spinning round was only a few times longer than itself and he cast himself flat down and shut his ears and eyes with his hands and held his breath till he felt the waters gurgling above him and he was whirled down into the abyss i wonder tercatus said to himself did any one ever perish in this way or is it a mere allegory if so of what can a person be drawn on gradually in this manner to spiritual destruction are my present thoughts by any chance an outer circle which has caught me and fundy exclaimed the muleteer pointing to a town before them and presently the mule was sliding along the broad flags of its pavement torquatus looked over his letters and drew one out for the town he was taken to an inn of the poorest class and by his guide who was paid handsomely and retired swearing and grumbling at the niggardliness of the traveller he then inquired the way to the house of cassianus the schoolmaster found it and delivered his letter he received as kind a welcome as if he had arrived at home joined his host in a frugal meal during which he learned the master's history a native of fundi he had started the school in rome with which we became acquainted at an early period of our history and had proved eminently successful but finding a persecution imminent and his christianity discovered he had disposed of his school and retired to his small native town where he was promised after the vacation the children of the principal inhabitants in a fellow christian he saw nothing but a brother and as such he talked freely with him of his last adventures and his future prospect a strange idea dashed through the mind of Tercatus that some day that information might be turned into money it was still early when Tercatus took his leave and pretending to have some business in the town he would not allow his host to accompany him he bought himself some more respectable apparel went to the best inn and ordered a couple of horses and a postillion to accompany him for to fulfil fabiola's commission it was necessary to ride forward quick change his horses at each relay and travel through the night he did so till he reached Bovile, on the skirts of the alban hills here he rested changed his travelling suit and rode on gaily between the lines of tombs which brought him to the gate of that city within whose walls there was more of good and more of evil contained than in any province of the empire End of section eighteen Section nineteen of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part first, piece, chapter nineteen, the fall. Torquatus, now elegantly attired, proceeded at once to the house of Fabius, delivered his letter, answered all inquiries, and accepted, without much pressing, an invitation to supper that evening. He then went to seek a respectable lodging suited to the present state of his purse and easily found one fabius we have said did not accompany his daughter into the country and rarely visited her there the fact was that he had no love for green fields or running brooks his tastes were for the gossip and free society of rome during the year his daughter's presence was a restraint on his liberty but when she was gone with her establishment into capania his house presented scenes and entertained persons that he would not have presumed to bring in contact with her men of profligate life surrounded his table in deep drinking till late hours with gambling and loose conversation generally followed with sumptuous entertainments having invited Tercatus to sup with him he went forth in search of guests to meet him he soon picked up a batch of sycophants who were loitering about his known haunts in readiness for invitations but as he was sauntering home from the baths of titus he saw two men in a small grove round a temple earnestly conversing together 
after a moment's look he advanced towards them but waited at a small distance for a pause in the dialogue which was something to this effect there is no doubt then about the news none at all it is quite certain that the people have risen at nicomedia and burnt down the church as they call it of the christians close to and in sight of the palace my father heard it from the emperor's secretary himself this morning whatever possessed the fools to go and build a temple in one of the most conspicuous places of the metropolis they must have known that sooner or later the religious spirit of the nation would rise against them and destroy the eyesore as every exhibition of a foreign religion must be to an empire to be sure as my father says these christians if they had any wit in them would hide their heads and slink into corners when they are so condescendingly tolerated for a time by the most humane princes but as they do not choose to do so but will build temples in public instead of skulking in by-lanes as they used to do i for one am not sorry one may gain some notoriety and profit too by hunting these odious people down and destroying them if possible well be it so but to come to the purpose it is understood between us that when we can discover who are christians among the rich and not too powerful at first there shall be a fair division we will aid one another you propose bold and rough means i will keep my counsel as to mine but each shall reap all the profit from those whom he discovers and his right proportion from those who are shared between us is it not so exactly fabius now stepped forward with a hearty how are you fulvius i have not seen you for an age come and sup with me to-day i have friends engaged and your friend too Gravinus, i believe the gentleman alluded to made an uncouth bow will accompany you i hope thank you replied fulvius but i fear i have an engagement already nonsense man said the good-natured knight there is nobody left in the city with whom you could sup except myself but has my house the plague that you have never ventured into it since you dined there with sebastian and quarrelled with him or did you get struck by some magical charm which has driven you away fulvius turned pale and drew away fabius to one side while he said to tell the truth something very like it i hope answered fabius somewhat startled that the black witch has been playing no tricks with you i wish heartily she were out of my house but come he continued in good humour i really thought you were struck by a better charm that evening i have my eyes open i saw how your heart was fixed on my little cousin agnes fulvius stared at him with some amazement and after a pause replied and if it was so i saw that your daughter made up her mind that no good should ever come out of it say you so then that explains your constant refusal to come to me again but fabiola is a philosopher and understands nothing of such matters i wish indeed she would give up her books and think of settling herself in life instead of preventing others but i can give you better news than that agnes is as much attached to you as you can be to her is it possible how can you happen to know it why then to tell you what i should have told you long since if you had not fought so shy of me she confided it to me that very day to you yes to me those jewels of yours quite won her heart she told me as much i knew she could only mean you indeed i am sure she meant you fulvius understood these words of the rich gems which he displayed while the knight spoke of the jewels which he imagined agnes had received she had proved fulvius was thinking an easy prize in spite of her demureness and here lay fortune and rank open before him if he could only manage his game when fabius thus broke in upon his dream come now you have only to press your suit boldly and i tell you you will win it whatever fabiola may think but you have nothing to fear from her now she and all her servants are absent her part of the house is closed and we enter by the back door to the more enjoyable part of the establishment i will wait on you without fail replied fulvius and Gervinus with us added fabius as he turned away we will not describe the banquet further than to say that wines of rare excellence flowed so plentifully that almost all the guests got more or less heated and excited fulvius however for one kept himself cool the news from the east came into discussion the destruction of the church at nicomedia had been followed by incendiary fires in the imperial palace little doubt could exist that the emperor galerius was their author 
but he charged them on the christians and thus goaded on the reluctant mind of diocletian to become their fiercest persecutor every one began to see that before many months were over the imperial edict to commence the work of destruction would reach rome and find in maximian a ready executor the guests were generally inclined to gore the stricken deer for generosity in favour of those whom popular clamour hunts down requires an amount of courage too heroic to be common even the most liberal found reasons for christians being accepted from all kind consideration one could not bear their mysteriousness another was vexed at their supposed progress this man thought them opposed to the real glory of the empire that considered them a foreign element that ought to be eliminated from it one thought their doctrine detestable another their practice infamous during all this debate if it could be so called where both sides came to the same conclusion fulvius after having glanced from one to the other of the guests had fixed his evil eye upon Tercatus. the youth was silent but his countenance by turns was pale and flushed wine had given him a rash courage which some strong principle restrained now he clenched his hand and pressed it to his breast now he bit his lip at one time he was crumbling the bread between his fingers and another he drank off unconsciously a cup of wine these christians hate us and would destroy us all if they could said one torquatus leaned forward opened his lips but remained silent destroy us indeed did they not burn rome under nero and have they not just set fire to the palace in asia over the emperor's head asked the second torquatus rose upon his couch stretched forth his hand as if about to reply but drew it back but what is infinitely worse is they are maintaining such anti-social doctrines, conniving at such frightful excesses, and degrading themselves to the disgusting worship of an ass's head, proceeded a third. Tercatus now fairly writhed, and rising had lifted his head, when Fulvius, with a cold calculation of time and words, added in bitter sarcasm, Ay, and massacre a child, and devour his flesh and blood at every assembly. The arm descended on the table, with a blow that made every goblet and beaker dance and ring as in a choked voice tercatus exclaimed it is a lie a cursed lie how can you know that asked fulvius with his blandest tone and look because answered the other with great excitement i am myself a christian and ready to die for my faith if the beautiful alabaster statue with a bronze head in the niche beside the table had fallen forward and been smashed on the marble pavement it could not have caused a more fearful sensation than this sudden announcement all were startled for a moment next a long blank pause ensued after which each began to show his feelings in his features fabius looked exceedingly foolish as if conscious that he had brought his guests into bad company carpernius puffed himself out evidently thinking himself ill-used by having a guest brought in who might absurdly be supposed to know more about christians than himself a young man opened his mouth as he stared at Tercatus, and a testy old gentleman was evidently hesitating whether he should not knock down somebody or other, no matter whom. Corvinus looked at the poor Christian with the sort of grin of delight, half idiotic, half savage, with which a countryman might gaze upon the vermin that he finds in his trap in a morning. Here was a man ready to hand, to put on the rack or the gridiron whenever he pleased, but the look of Fulvius was worth them all. If ever any microscopic observer had had the opportunity of witnessing the expression of the spider's features, when after a long fast it sees a fly, plump with other's blood, approach its net, and keenly watches every stroke of its wing, and studies how it can best throw only the first thread round it, sure that then all that gorges it shall be its own, that we fancy would be the best image of his looks, as certainly it is of his feelings. To get hold of a Christian, ready to turn traitor, had long been his desire and study here he was sure was one if he could only manage him how did he know this because he knew sufficient of christians to be convinced that no genuine one would have allowed himself either to drink to excess or to boast of its readiness to court martyrdom the company broke up everybody slunk away from the discovered christian as from one pest stricken he felt alone and depressed when fulvius who had whispered a word to fabius and to Corvinus, went up to him, and taking him by the hand, said courteously, I fear I spoke inconsiderately in drawing out from you a declaration which may prove dangerous. 
I fear nothing, replied Torquatus, again excited. I will stand to my colors to the last. Hush, hush, broke in Fulvius. The slaves may betray you. Come with me to another chamber, where we can talk quietly together. So saying, he led himself into an elegant room, where Fabius had ordered goblets and flagons of the richest Falernian wine to be brought, for such as, according to Roman fashion, liked to enjoy a commissatio or drinking bout. But only Corvinus, engaged by Fulvius, followed. On a beautifully inlaid table were dice. Fulvius, after plying Dracatus with more liquor, negligently took them up and threw them playfully down, talking in the meantime on indifferent subjects. "'Dear me,' he kept exclaiming, "'what throws! It is well I am not playing with any one, or I should have been ruined. You try, Tercatus. Gambling, as we learnt before, had been the ruin of Tercatus, for a transaction arising out of it he was in prison, when Sebastian converted him. As he took the dice into his hand, with no intention, as he thought, of playing, Fulvius watched him as a lynx might its prey. Tercatus's eye flashed keenly, his lips quivered, his hand trembled. Fulvius, at once, recognized in all this, coupled with the poising of his hand, the knowing cast of the wrist, and the sharp eye to the value of the throw, the violence of a first temptation to resume a renounced vice. "'I fear that you are no better hand than I am at this stupid occupation,' said he indifferently. "'But I dare say, Gravinus here will give you a chance, if you will stake something very low.' "'It must be very low, indeed, merely for recreation, for I have renounced gambling. Once, indeed, but no matter.' "'Come on,' said Corvinus, whom Fulvius had pressed to his work by a look. They began to throw for the most trifling stakes, and Tricatus generally won. Fulvius made him drink still, from time to time, and he became very talkative. "'Corvinus! Corvinus!' he said at length, as if recollecting himself. "'Was not that the name that Cassianus mentioned?' "'Who?' asked the other, surprised. "'Yes, it was.' continued Tarcatus to himself, the bully, the big brute. Were you the person, he asked, looking up to Corvinus, who struck that nice Christian boy, Pancratius? Corvinus was on the point of bursting into a rage, but Fulvius checked him by a gesture, and said with timely interference, That Cassianus, whom you mentioned, is an eminent schoolmaster. Pray, where does he live? This he knew his companion wished to ascertain, and thus he quieted him. Tercatus answered, "'He lives. Let me see. No, no, I won't turn traitor. No, I am ready to be burnt, or tortured, or die for my faith. But I won't betray any one. That I won't.' "'Let me take your place, Corvinus,' said Fulvius, who saw Tercatus's interest in the game deepening. He put forth sufficient skill to make his antagonist more careful and more intent. He threw down a somewhat larger stake. Tricatus, after a moment's pause of deliberation, matched it. He won it. Fulvius seemed vexed. Tricatus threw back both thumbs. Fulvius seemed to hesitate, but put down an equivalent, and lost again. The play was now silent. Each won and lost, but Fulvius had steadily the advantage, and he was the more collected of the two. Once Tricatus looked up and started, he thought he saw the good polycarp behind his adversary's chair. He rubbed his eyes and saw it was only Corvinus staring at him. All his skill was now put forth. Conscience had retreated. Faith was wavering. Grace had already departed. For the demon of covetousness, of rapine, of dishonesty, of recklessness, had come back, and brought with him seven spirits worse than himself, to that cleansed but ill-guarded soul. And as they entered in, all that was holy, all that was good, departed. At length, worked up by repeated losses and draughts of wine, into a frenzy, after he had drawn frequently upon the heavy purse which Fabiola had given him, he threw the purse itself upon the table. Fulvius coolly opened it, emptied it, counted the money, and placed opposite an equal heap of gold. Each prepared himself for a final throw. The fatal bones fell, each glanced silently upon their spots. Fulvius drew the money towards him. Dracatus fell upon the table his head buried and hidden within his arms. Fulvius motioned Corvinus out of the room. Tercatus beat the ground with his foot, then moaned. 
next gnashed his teeth and growled then put his fingers in his hair and began to pull and tear it a voice whispered in his ear are you a christian which of the seven spirits was it surely the worst it is hopeless continued the voice you have disgraced your religion and you have betrayed it too no no groaned the despairing wretch yes in your drunkenness you have told us all quite enough to make it impossible for you ever to return to those you have betrayed be gone be gone exclaimed piteously the tortured sinner they will forgive me still god silence utter not his name you are degraded perjured hopelessly lost you are a beggar to-morrow you must beg your bread you are an outcast a ruined prodigal and gamester who will look at you with your christian friends and nevertheless you are a christian you will be torn to pieces by some cruel death for it yet you will not be worshipped by them as one of their martyrs you are a hypocrite dracatus and nothing more who is it that is tormenting me he exclaimed and looked up fulvius was standing with folded arms at his side and if all this be true what is it to you what have you to say more to me he continued much more than you think you have betrayed yourself into my power completely i am the master of your money and he showed him fabiola's purse of your character of your peace of your life i have only to let you fellow christians know what you have done what you have said what you have been to-night and you dare not face them i have only to let that bully that big brute as you call him but who is son of the prefect of the city loose upon you and no one else can now restrain him after such provocation and to-morrow you will be standing before his father's tribunal to die for that religion which you have betrayed and disgraced are you ready now any longer to reel and stagger as a drunken gambler to represent your christianity before the judgment seat in the forum the fallen man had not courage to follow the prodigal in repentance as he had done in sin hope was dead in him for he had relapsed into his capital sin and scarcely felt remorse he remained silent till fulvius aroused him by asking well have you made your choice either to go at once to the christians with to-night on your head or to-morrow to the court which do you choose torquatus raised his eyes to him with a stolid look and faintly answered neither come then what will you do asked fulvius mastering him with one of his falcon glances what you like said torquatus only neither of those things fulvius sat down beside him and said in a soft and soothing voice now torquatus listen to me do as i tell you and all is mended you shall have house and food and apparel ay and money to play with if you will only do my bidding and what is that rise to-morrow as usual put on your christian face go freely among your friends act as if nothing had happened but answer all my questions tell me everything torquatus groaned a traitor at last call it what you will that or death ay death by inches i hear corvinus pacing impatiently up and down the court quick which is it to be not death oh no anything but that fulvius went out and found his friend fuming with rage and wine he had hard work to pacify him corvinus had almost forgotten cassianus in fresh resentments but all his former hatred had been rekindled and he burnt for revenge fulvius promised to find out where he lived and used this means to secure the suspension of any violent and immediate measure having sent corvinus sulky and fretting home he returned to dracatus whom he wished to accompany that he might ascertain his lodgings as soon as he had left the room his victim had arisen from his chair and endeavoured by walking up and down to steady his senses and regain self-possession but it was in vain his head was swimming from his inebriety and his subsequent excitement the apartment seemed to turn round and round and float up and down he was sick too and his heart was beating almost audibly shame remorse self-contempt hatred of his destroyers and of himself the desolation of the outcast and the black despair of the reprobate rolled like dark billows through his soul each coming in turn uppermost unable to sustain himself longer on his feet he threw himself on his face upon a silken couch 
and buried his burning brow in his icy hands and groaned and still all whirled round and round him and a constant moaning sounded in his ears fulvius found him in this state and touched his shoulder to rouse him torquatus shuddered and was convulsed then exclaimed can this be charybdis End of section 19. Section 20 of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part 2nd Conflict. Chapter 1. The scenes through which we have hitherto led our reader have been laid in one of those slippery truces rather than peace which often intervene between persecution and persecution. Already rumors of war have crossed our path, and its note of preparation has been distinctly heard. The roar of the lions near the amphitheatre, which startled but dismayed not Sebastian, the reports from the east, the hints of Fulvius, and the threats of Corvinus, had brought us the same news, that before long the horrors of persecution will reappear, and Christian blood will have to flow, in a fuller and nobler stream, than had hitherto watered the paradise of the new law the church ever calmly provident cannot neglect the many signs of a threatened combat nor the preparations necessary for meeting it from the moment she earnestly begins to arm herself we date the second period of our narrative it is the commencement of conflict it was towards the end of october that a young man not unknown to us closely muffled up in his cloak for it was dark and rather chill might be seen threading his way through the narrow alleys of the district called the Sabura, a region, the extent and exact position of which is still under dispute, but which lay in the immediate vicinity of the Forum. As vice is unfortunately too often linked with poverty, the two found a common asylum here. Pancratius did not seem much at home in this part of the city, and made several wrong turns, till at length he found the street he was in search of still without numbers on the doors the house he wanted was an unsolved problem although not quite insoluble he looked for the neatest dwelling in the street and being particularly struck with the cleanliness and good order of one beyond the rest he boldly knocked at its door it was opened by an old man whose name has already appeared on our pages diogenes he was tall and broad-shouldered as if accustomed to bear burdens which however had given him a stoop in his gait his hair was a perfect silver, and hung down at the sides of a large massive head. His features were strongly marked in deep melancholy lines, and though the expression of his countenance was calm, it was solemnly sad. He looked like one who had lived much among the dead, and was happiest in their company. His two sons, Magus and Severus, fine athletic youths, were with him. The first was busy carving, or scratching rather, a rude epitaph, on an old slab of marble the reverse of which still bore traces of a heathen sepulchral inscription rudely effaced by its new possessor pancratius looked over the work in hand and smiled there was hardly a word rightly spelt or a part of speech correct indeed here it is de bianoba pelicla que ordev benet de bianoba the other son was making a rough design in which could be distinguished Jonas, devoured by the whale, and Lazarus, raised from the dead, both most conveniently drawn, with charcoal on a board, a sketch evidently for a more permanent painting elsewhere. Further, it was clear that when the knock came to the door, old Diogenes was busy fitting a new handle to an old pickaxe. These varied occupations in one family might have surprised a modern, but they did not at all the youthful visitor. He well knew that the family belonged to the honorable and religious craft of the Fasoras, or excavators of the Christian cemeteries. Indeed, the Algenes was the head and director of that confraternity. In conformity with the assertion of an anonymous writer, contemporary with St. Jerome, some modern antiquarians have considered the Fasor as forming a lesser ecclesiastical order in the primitive church, like the lector or reader. But although this opinion is untenable, it is extremely probable that the duties of this office were in the hands of persons appointed and recognized by ecclesiastical authority the uniform system pursued in excavating arranging and filling up of the numerous cemeteries round rome a system too so complete from the beginning 
as not to leave positive signs of improvement or change as time went on gives us reason to conclude that these wonderful and venerable works were carried on under one direction and probably by some body associated for that purpose it was not a cemetery or necropolis company which made a speculation of burying the dead but rather a pious and recognized confraternity which was associated for the purpose a series of interesting inscriptions found in the cemetery of st agnes proves that this occupation was continued in particular families grandfather father and sons having carried it on in the same place we can thus easily understand the great skill and uniformity of practice observable in the catacombs but the fossores had evidently a higher office or even jurisdiction in the underground world though the church provided space for the burial of all her children it was natural that some should make compensation for their place of sepulchre if chosen in a favourite spot such as the vicinity of a martyr's tomb these sextons had the management of such transactions which are often recorded in the ancient cemeteries the following inscription is preserved in the capital emptu locum ab artemisium musomum hoc est et pretium datum fossori hilaro edest full nude presentia severe fos elerenti that is this is the grave for two bodies brought by artemisius and the price was given to the fossor hilaris that is purses in the presence of severus the fossor and laurentius possibly the last name was the witness on the purchaser's side and severus on the seller's however this may be we trust we have laid before our readers all that is known about the profession as such of diogenes and his sons we left pancratius amused at modus's rude attempts in glyptic art his next step was to address him do you always execute these inscriptions yourself oh no answered the artist looking up and smiling i do them for poor people who cannot afford to pay a better hand this was a good woman who kept a small shop in the via nova and you may suppose did not become rich especially as she was very honest and yet a curious thought struck me as i was carving her epitaph let me hear it modus it was that perhaps some thousand years hence or more christians might read with reverence my scratches on the wall and hear of poor old policia and her barley stall with interest while the inscription of not a single emperor who persecuted the church would be read or even known well i can hardly imagine that the superb mausoleums of sovereigns will fall to utter decay and yet the memory of a market wife descend to distant ages but what is your reason for thinking thus simply because i would sooner commit to the keeping of posterity the memory of the pious poor than that of the wicked rich and my rude record may possibly be read when triumphal arches have been demolished it's dreadfully written though is it not never mind that its simplicity is worth much fine writing what is that slab leaning against the wall ah that is a beautiful inscription brought us to put up you will see the writer and engraver were different people it is to go to the cemetery at lady agnes's villa on the nomenton way i believe it is in memory of a most sweet child whose death is deeply felt by his virtuous parents pancratius took a light to it and read as follows dionusius napios akakos entade kete meta ton hegeon nescas de de kai hemon in tais hegeis hemon brokais kai tu glimpsantos kai tu grapsantos the innocent boy dionysius lieth here among the saints remember us in your holy prayers the writer and the engraver dear happy child continued pancratius when he had perused the inscription add me the reader to the writer and carver of your epitaph in your holy prayers amen answered the pious family but pancratius attracted by a certain husky sound in diogenes's voice turned round and saw the old man vigorously trying to cut off the end of a little wedge which he had driven into the top of the handle of his pickaxe to keep it fast in the iron but every moment baffled by some defect in his vision which he removed by drawing the back of his brawny hand across his eyes what is the matter my good friend said the youth kindly what does this epitaph of young dionysius particularly affect you it does not of itself but it reminds me of so much that is past and suggests so much that may be about to come that i feel almost faint to think of either what are your painful thoughts diogenes 
why do you see it is all simple enough to take into one's arms a good child like dionysius wrapped in a sewer cloth fragrant with spices and lay him in his grave his parents may weep but his passage from sorrow to joy was easy and sweet it is a very different thing and requires a heart as hardened as mine by practice another stroke of the hand across the eyes to gather up hastily the torn flesh and broken limbs of such another youth to wrap them hurriedly in their winding sheet then fold them into another sheet full of lime instead of balsams and shove them precipitately into their tomb how different one would wish to treat a martyr's body true diogenes but a brave officer prefers the plain soldier's grave on the field of battle to the car sarcophagus on the via appia but are such scenes as you describe common in times of persecution by no means uncommon my good young master i am sure a pious youth like you must have visited on his anniversary the tomb of restitius and the cemetery of hermes indeed i have and often have i been almost jealous of his early martyrdom did you bury him yes and his parents had a beautiful tomb made the arcosolium of his crypt my father and i made it of six slabs of marble hastily collected and i engraved the inscription now beside it i think i carved better than modges there added the old man now quite cheerful that is not saying much for yourself father rejoined his son no less smiling but here is the copy of the inscription which you wrote he added drawing out a parchment from a number of sheets i remember it perfectly said pancratius glancing over it and reading it as follows correcting the errors in orthography but not those in grammar as he read elio fabio restuto filio pissimo pari entes vicerunt quivi ani s x v i i i mens v i i anirene to elius fabius restitius their most pious son his parents erected this tomb who lived eighteen years and seven months in peace he continued what a glorious youth to have confessed christ at such an age no doubt replied the old man but i dare say you have always thought that his body reposes alone in his sepulchre any one would think so from the inscription certainly i have always thought so is it otherwise yes noble pancratius he has a comrade younger than himself lying in the same bed as we were closing the tomb of restitius the body of a boy not more than twelve or thirteen years old was brought to us oh i shall never forget the sight he had been hung over a fire and his head trunk and limbs nearly to the knees were burnt to the very bone and so disfigured was he that no feature could be recognized poor little fellow what he must have suffered but why should i pity him well we were pressed for time and we thought the youth of eighteen would not grudge room for his fellow-soldier of twelve but would own him for a younger brother so we laid him at alias fabius's feet but we had no second phial of blood to put outside that a second martyr might be known to lie there for the fire had dried his blood up in his veins what a noble boy if the first was older the second was younger than i what say you diogenes don't you think it likely you may have to perform the same office for me one of these days oh no i hope not said the old digger with a return of his husky voice do not i entreat you allude to such a possibility surely my own time must come sooner how the old trees are spared indeed and the young plants cut down come come my good friend i won't afflict you but i have almost forgotten to deliver the message i came to bring it is that to-morrow at dawn you must come to my mother's house to arrange about preparing the cemeteries for our coming troubles our holy pope will be there with the priests of the titles the regionary deacons the notaries whose number has been filled up and you the head foster that all may act in concert i will not fail pancratius replied diogenes and now added the youth i have a favour to ask you a favor from me asked the old man surprised yes you will have to begin your work immediately i suppose now often as i have visited for devotion our sacred cemeteries i have never studied or examined them and this i should like to do with you who know them so well nothing would give me greater pleasure answered diogenes somewhat flattered by the compliment but still more pleased by this love for what he so much loved 
after i have received my instructions i shall go at once to the cemetery of callistus meet me out of the porta capana half an hour before midday and we will go on together but i shall not be alone continued pancratius two youths recently baptized desire much to become acquainted with our cemeteries which they do not yet much know and have asked me to initiate them there any friends of yours will be always welcome what are their names that we may make no mistake one is tibertius the son of chromatius the late prefect the other is a young man named tercatus severus started a little and said are you quite sure about him pancratius diogenes rebuked him saying that he comes to us in pancratius's company is security enough i own interposed the youth that i do not know as much about him as about tibertius who is really a gallant noble fellow tercatus is however very anxious to obtain all information about our affairs and seems in earnest what makes you fear it severus only a trifle indeed but as i was going early to the cemetery this morning i turned into the bass of antoninus what interrupted pancratius laughing do you frequent such fashionable resorts not exactly replied the honest artist but you are not perhaps aware that cucumio the capsarius and his wife are christians is it possible where shall we find them next well so it is and moreover they are making a tomb for themselves in the cemetery of callistus and i had to show them modus's inscription for it here it is said the latter exhibiting it as follows cucumio et victoria se vivos vecerunt capsararius de antoninianus capital exclaimed pancratius amused at the blunders in the epitaph but we are forgetting tercatus as i entered the building then said severus i was not a little surprised to find in one corner at that early hour this tercatus in close conversation with the present prefect's son Corvinus, the pretended cripple who thrust himself into agnes's house you remember when some charitable unknown person god bless him gave large alms to the poor there not good company i thought and at such an hour for a christian true severus returned pancratius blushing deeply but he is young as yet in the faith and probably his old friends do not know of his change we will hope for the best the two young men offered to accompany pancratius who rose to leave and see him safely through the poor and profligate neighbourhood he accepted their courtesy with pleasure and bade the old excavator a hearty good night End of section twenty. Section twenty one of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part second. Conflict. Chapter two. The cemeteries. Margo Santonius restitutus feci hippogium sibi et suis fedentibus in domino. It seems to us as though we had neglected one whose character and thoughts opened this little history, the pious Lucinia. Her virtues were indeed of that quiet, unobtrusive nature, which affords little scope for appearing on a public scene or taking part in general affairs. Her house, besides being, or rather containing, a title or parochial church, was now honoured by being the residence of the supreme pontiff. The approach of a violent persecution which the rulers of Christ's spiritual kingdom were to be the first sought out as the enemies of Caesar, rendered it necessary to transfer the residence of the ruler of the church from his ordinary dwelling to a secure asylum. For the purpose, Lucina's house was chosen, and it continued to be so occupied, to her great delight, in that in the following pontificate, when the wild beasts were ordered to be transferred to it, that Pope Marcellus might feed them at home. This loathsome punishment soon caused his death. Lucina admitted, at forty, and through the order of deaconesses, found plenty of occupation in the duties of her office. The charge and supervision of the women in church, the care of the sick and poor of her own sex, the making and keeping in order of sacred vestments and linen for the altar, and the instruction of children and female converts preparing for baptism, as well as the attending them at that sacred rite, belonged to the deaconesses, and gave sufficient occupation in addition to domestic offices and the exercise of both these classes of duties lucina quietly passed her life its main object seemed to be attained 
her son had offered himself to God, and lived ready to shed his blood for the faith. To watch over him and pray for him were her delight rather than an additional employment. Early in the morning of the appointed day, the meeting mentioned in our last chapter took place. It will be sufficient to say that in it full instructions were given for increasing the collection of alms, to be employed in enlarging the cemeteries and burying the dead, and succoring those driven to concealment by persecution, in nourishing prisoners, in obtaining access to them, and finally in ransoming or rescuing the bodies of martyrs. A notary was named for each region, to collect their acts and record interesting events. The cardinals or titular priests received instructions about the administration of sacraments, particularly of the Holy Eucharist, during the persecution, and to each was entrusted one cemetery, or more, in whose subterranean church he was to perform the sacred mysteries. The Holy Pontiff chose for himself that of Callistus, which made Diogenes, its chief sexton, not a little, but innocently, proud. The good old excavator seemed rather more cheery than otherwise under the exciting forebodings of a coming persecution. No commanding officer of engineers could have given his orders more briskly or more decidedly for the defense of a fortified city committed to his skill to guard than he issued his to the subordinate superintendents of the various cemeteries round Rome, who met him by appointment at his own house, to learn the instructions of the superior assembly. The shadow of the sundial at the Porta Capina was pointing to midday as he issued from it with his sons, and found already awaiting the three young men. They walked in parties of two along the Appian Road, and at nearly two miles from the gate they entered by various ways, slipping round different tombs that lined the road, into the same villa on the right hand. Here they found all the requisites for a descent into the subterranean cemeteries, such as candles, lanterns, and the instruments for procuring light. Severus proposed that, as the guides and the strangers were in equal number, they should be divided into pairs, and in a division he allotted Tercatus to himself. What his reason was we may easily conjecture. It would probably weary our readers to follow the whole conversation of the party. Diogenes not only answered all questions put to him, but, from time to time, gave intelligent little lectures on such objects as he considered peculiarly attractive but we believe we shall better interest and inform our friends if we digest the whole matter of these into a more connected narrative, and besides, they will wish to know something of the subsequent history of those wonderful excavations into which we have conducted our youthful pilgrims. The history of the early Christian cemeteries, the catacombs as they are commonly called, may be divided into three portions, from their beginning to the period of our narrative, or a few years later. From this term to the eighth century, then down to our own time, and we have reason to hope that a new epoch is being commenced. We have generally avoided using the name of catacombs, because it might mislead our readers into an idea that this was either the original or generic name of those early Christian crypts. It is not so, however. Rome might be said to be surrounded by a circumvallation of cemeteries, sixty or thereabouts in number, each of which was generally known by the name of some saint or saints, whose bodies reposed there. Thus we have the cemeteries of St. Nerus and Achilles, of St. Agnes, of St. Pancratius, of Pretentatus, Priscilla, Hermes, etc. Sometimes these cemeteries are known by the names of the places where they existed. The cemetery of St. Sebastian, which was called sometimes Cemeterium ad Sanctum Celium, and by other names, had among them that of Ad Catacambas. The meaning of this word is completely unknown though it may be attributed to the circumstance of the relics of Saints Peter and Paul, having been for a time buried there, and a crypt still existing near the cemetery. This term became the name of that particular cemetery, then was generalized, till we familiarly call the whole system of these underground excavations, the catacombs. Their origin was, in the last century, a subject of controversy. Following two or three vague and equivocal passages, some learned writers pronounced the catacombs to have been originally heathen excavations, made to extract sand for the building of the city. These sand pits were called arenaria, and so occasionally are the Christian cemeteries. But a more scientific and minute examination, particularly made by the accurate F. Marchi, has completely confuted this theory. The entrance to the catacombs was often, as can yet be seen, from these sand pits, which are themselves underground, and no doubt were a convenient cover for the cemetery, but several circumstances proved that they were never used for Christian burial, nor converted into Christian cemeteries. 
the man who wished to get the sand out of the ground will keep his excavation as near as may be to the surface will have it of easiest possible access for drawing out materials and will make it as ample as is consistent with the safety of the roof and the supply of what he is seeking and all this we find in the ironaria still abounding round rome but the catacombs are constructed on principles exactly contrary to all these the catacomb dives at once generally by a steep flight of steps below the stratum of loose and friable sand into that where it is indurated to the hardness of a tender but consistent rock on the surface of which every stroke of the pickaxe is yet distinctly traceable when you have reached this step you are in the first story of the cemetery for you descend again by stairs to the second and third below all constructed on the same principle a catacomb may be divided into three parts its passages on streets its chambers or squares and its churches the passages are long narrow galleries cut with tolerable regularity so that the roof and floor are at right angles with the sides often so narrow as scarcely to allow two persons to go abreast they sometimes run quite straight to a great length but they are crossed by others and these again by others so as to form a complete labyrinth or network of subterranean corridors to be lost among them would easily be fatal but these passages are not constructed as the name would imply merely to lead to something else they are themselves the catacomb or cemetery their walls as well as the sides of the staircases are honeycombed with graves that is with rows of excavations large and small a sufficient length to admit a human body from a child to a full-grown man laid with its side to the gallery sometimes there are as many as fourteen sometimes as few as three or four of these rows one above the other they are evidently so made to measure that it is probable the body was lying by the side of the grave while this was being dug when the corpse wrapped up as we heard from diogenes was laid in its narrow cell the front was hermetically closed either by a marble slab or more frequently by several broad tiles put edgeways in a groove or mortise cut for them in the rock and cemented all around the inscription was cut upon the marble or scratched in the wet mortar thousands of the former sort have been collected and may be seen in museums and churches many of the latter have been copied and published but by far the greater number of tombs are anonymous and have no record upon them and now the reader may reasonably ask through what period does the interment in the catacombs range and how are its limits determined we will try to content him as briefly as possible there is no evidence of the christians having ever buried anywhere anteriorly to the construction of catacombs two principles as old as christianity regulate this mode of burial the first is the manner of christ's entombment he was laid in a grave in a cavern wrapped up in linen embalmed with spices and a stone sealed up closed to sepulchre as st paul so often proposes him for the model of our resurrection and speaks of our being buried with him in baptism it was natural for his disciples to wish to be buried after his example so as to be ready to rise with him this lying in wait for resurrection was the second thought that guided the formation of these cemeteries every expression connected with them alluded to the rising again the word to bury is unknown in christian inscriptions deposited in peace the deposition of are the expressions used that is the dead are but left there for a time till called for again as a pledge or precious thing entrusted to faithful but temporary keeping the very name of cemetery suggests that it is only a place where many lie as in a dormitory slumbering for a while till dawn come and the trumpet's sound awake them hence the grave is only called the place or more technically the small home of the dead in christ these two ideas which are combined in the planning of the catacombs were not later insertions into the christian system but must have been more vivid in its earlier times they inspired abhorrence of the pagan custom of burning the dead nor have we a hint that this mode was at any time adopted by christians but ample proof is to be found in the catacombs themselves of their early origin the style of paintings yet remaining belongs to a period of still flourishing art their symbols and the symbolic taste itself are characteristic of a very ancient period for this peculiar taste declined as time went on although inscriptions with dates are rare yet out of ten thousand collected and about to be published by the learned and sagacious cavalier de rossi about three hundred are found bearing consular dates through every century from the early emperors to the middle of the fourth century a d three fifty another curious and interesting custom 
furnishes us with dates on tombs at the closing of the grave the relations or friends to mark it would press into its wet plaster and leave there a coin a cameo or engraved gem sometimes even a shell or pebble probably that they might find the sepulchre again especially where no inscription was left many of these objects continue to be found many have been long collected but it is not uncommon where the coin or to speak scientifically the metal had fallen from its place to find a mould of it left distinct and clear in the cement which equally gives its date this is sometimes of domitian or other early emperors it may be asked wherefore this anxiety to rediscover with certainty the tomb besides motives of natural piety there is one constantly recorded on sepulchral inscriptions in england if want of space prevented the full date of a person's death being given we should prefer chronicling the year to the day of the month when it occurred it is more historical no one cares about remembering the day on which a person died without the year but the year without the day is an important recollection yet while so few ancient christian inscriptions supply the year of people's deaths thousands give us the very day of it on which they died whether in the hopefulness of believers or in the assurance of martyrs this is easily explained of both classes annual commemoration had to be made on the very day of their departure an accurate knowledge of this was necessary therefore it alone was recorded in a cemetery close to the one in which we have left our three youths with diogenes and his sons were lately found inscriptions mingled together belonging to both orders of the dead one in greek after mentioning the deposition of agenda on the thirteenth day before the calends or first of june adds this simple address zesis enko kai eronta yopierum live in the lord and pray for us another fragment is as follows non nos nunii vivas in pace et pete pro nobis nones of june live in peace and pray for us this is a third victoria refigere et et spiritus tus in bono victoria be refreshed and may thy spirit be in enjoyment good this last reminds us of a most peculiar inscription found scratched in the mortar beside a grave in the cemetery of protexatus not many yards from that of callistus it is remarkable first for being in latin written with greek letters then for containing a testimony of the divinity of our lord lastly for expressing a prayer for the refreshment of the departed we till up the portions of words wanting from the falling out of part of the plaster bene merenti sorore bon octavo ante calendas noblimli deus christus omnipotens spiritum tuum refigere in christo to the well-deserving sister bon the eighth day before the calends of nove christ god almighty refresh thy spirit in christ in spite of this digression on prayers inscribed over tombs the reader will not we trust have forgotten that we were establishing the fact that the christian cemeteries of rome owe their origin to the earliest ages we have now to state down to what period they were used after peace was restored to the church the devotion of christians prompted them to desire burial near the martyrs and holy people of an earlier age but generally speaking they were satisfied to lie under the pavement hence the sepulchral stones which are often found in the rubbish of the catacombs and sometimes in their places bearing consular dates of the fourth century are thicker larger better carved and in a less simple style than those of an earlier period placed upon the walls but before the end of that century these monuments became rarer and interment in the catacombs ceased in the following at latest pope damasus who died in three eighty four reverently shrunk as he tells us in his own epitaph from intruding into the company of the saints restitutus therefore whose sepulchral tablet we gave for a title to our chapter may well be considered as speaking in the name of the early christians and claiming as their own exclusive work and property the thousand miles of subterranean city with their six million of slumbering inhabitants who trust in the lord and await his resurrection End of section 21section twenty two of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part second conflict chapter three what diogenes could not tell about the catacombs 
diogenes lived during the first period in the history of the cemeteries though near its close could he have looked into their future fate he would have seen near at hand an epoch that would have gladdened his heart to be followed by one that would have deeply afflicted him although therefore the matter of this chapter have no direct bearing upon our narrative it will serve essentially to connect it with the present topography of its scene when peace and liberty were restored to the church these cemeteries became places of devotion and of great resort each of them was associated with the name of one or the names of several of the more eminent martyrs buried in it and on their anniversaries crowds of citizens and of pilgrims thronged to their tombs where the divine mysteries were offered up and the homily delivered in their praise hence began to be compiled the first martyrologies or calendars of martyrs days which told the faithful whither to go at rome on the salarian or the apian or the arditine way such are the indications almost daily read in the roman martyrology now swelled out by the additions of later ages an ordinary reader of the book hardly knows the importance of these indications for they have served to verify several otherwise dubious cemeteries another class of valuable writers also comes to our aid but before mentioning them we will glance at the changes which this devotion produced in the cemeteries first commodious entrances with easy staircases were made then walls were built to support the crumbling galleries and from time to time funnel-shaped apertures in the vaults were opened to admit light and air finally basilicas or churches were erected over their entrances generally leading immediately to the principal tomb then called the confession of the church the pilgrim thus on arriving at the holy city visited each of these churches accustomed yet practised descended below and without having to grope his way about went direct by well-connected passages to the principal martyr's shrine and so on to others perhaps equally objects of reverence and devotion during this period no tomb was allowed to be opened no body to be extracted though apertures were made into the grave handkerchiefs or scarves called brandia were introduced to touch the martyr's relics and these were carried to distant countries to be held in equal reverence no wonder that st ambrose st gaudentius and other bishops should have found it so difficult to obtain bodies or large relics of martyrs for their churches another sort of relics consisted of what was called familiarly the oil of a martyr that is the oil often mixed with balsam which burned in the lamp beside his tomb often a round stone pillar three feet or so in height and scooped out at the top stands beside a monument probably to hold the lamp or serve for the distribution of its contents st gregory the great wrote to queen theodolinda that he sent her a collection of the oils of the popes who were martyrs the list which accompanied them was copied by mabillon in the treasury of monza and republished by ruinart it exists there yet together with the very files containing them sealed up in metal tubes the jealousy of disturbing the saints is displayed most beautifully in an incident related by st gregory of tours among the martyrs most honored in the ancient roman church were saints chrysanthus and daria their tombs became so celebrated for cures that their fellow christians built that is excavated over them a chamber with a vault of beautiful workmanship where crowds of worshippers assembled this was discovered by the heathens and the emperor closed them in walled up the entrance and from above probably through the luminare or ventilating shaft showered down earth and stones and buried the congregation alive as the two holy martyrs had been before them the place was unknown at the peace of the church till discovered by divine manifestation but instead of being permitted to enter again into this hallowed spot pilgrims were merely allowed to look at it through a window opened in the wall so as to see not only the tombs of the martyrs but also the bodies of those who had been buried alive at their shrines and as the cruel massacre had taken place while preparations were being made for the oblation of the holy eucharist there were still to be seen lying about the silver cruets in which the wine was brought for that spotless sacrifice it is clear that pilgrims resorting to rome would want a handbook to the cemeteries that they might know what they had to visit it is likewise but natural that on their return home they may have sought to edify their less fortunate neighbors by giving an account of what they had seen accordingly there exist no less fortunately for us than for their untravelled neighbours several records of this character 
the first place among these is held by catalogues compiled in the fourth century one of the places of sepulture of roman pontiffs the other of martyrs after these come three distinct guides to the catacombs the more interesting because they take different rounds that agree marvellously in their account to show the value of these documents and describe the changes which took place in the catacombs during the second period of their history we will give a brief account of one discovery in the cemetery we have left our little party among the rubbish near the entrance of a catacomb the name of which was yet doubtful and which had been taken for that of retextatus was found a fragment of a slab of marble which had been broken across obliquely from left to right with the following letters nelly martris the young cavalier de rossi at once declared that this was part of the sepulchral inscription of the holy pope cornelius that probably his tomb would be found below in a distinguished form and that as all the itineraries above mentioned concurred in placing it in the cemetery of callistus this and not the one at st sebastian's a few hundred yards off must claim the honour of that name he went further and foretold that as these works pronounced st cyprian to be buried near cornelius there would be found something at the tomb which would account for that idea for it was known that his body rested in africa it was not long before every prediction was verified the great staircase discovered was found to lead at once to a wider space carefully secured by brickwork of the time of peace and provided with light and air from above on the left was a tomb cut like others in the rock without any exterior arch over it it was however large and ample and except one very high above it there were no other graves below or over or at the sides the remaining portion of the slab was found within it the first piece was brought from the kircherian museum where it had been deposited and exactly fitted to it and both covered the tomb thus crinelli martires e p below reaching from the lower edge of the stone to the ground was a marble slab covered with an inscription of which only the left hand end remains the rest being broken off and lost above the tomb was another slab let into the sandstone of which the right hand end exists and a few more fragments have been recovered in the rubbish not enough to make out the lines but sufficient to show it was an inscription in verse by pope damasus how is this authorship traceable very easily not only do we know that this holy pope already mentioned took pleasure in putting verses which he loved to write on the tombs of martyrs but a number of inscriptions of his yet extant exhibit a particular and very elegant form of letters known among antiquarians by the name of damasian the fragments of this marble bear portions of verses in this character to proceed on the wall right of the tomb and on the same plane were painted two full-length figures in sacerdotal garments with glories round their heads evidently a byzantine work of the seventh century down the wall by the left side of each letter below letter were their names some letters were effaced which we supply in italics as follow sci cross cornelli pp sci cross cipriani we here see how a foreigner reading these two inscriptions with the portraits and knowing that the church commemorates the two martyrs on the same day might easily be led to suppose that they were here deposited together finally at the right hand of the tomb stands a truncated column about three feet high concave at the top as before described and as a confirmation of the use to which we said it might be put st gregory has in his list of oils sent to the lombard queen oleum s cornelli the oil of st cornelius we see then how during the second period new ornaments as well as greater conveniences were added to the primitively simple forms of the cemeteries but we must not on that account imagine that we are in any danger of mistaking these later embellishments for the productions of the early ages the difference is so immense that we might as easily blunder by taking a rubens for a beato angelico as by considering a byzantine figure to be a production of the first two centuries we come now to the third period of these holy cemeteries the sad one of their desolation when the lombards and later the saracens began to devastate the neighbourhood of rome and the catacombs were exposed to desecration the popes extracted the bodies of the most illustrious martyrs and placed them in the basilicas of the city this went on till the eighth or ninth century when we still read of repairs made in the cemeteries by the sovereign pontiffs the catacombs ceased to be so much places of devotion 
and the churches which stood over their entrances were destroyed or fell to decay only those remained which were fortified and could be defended such are the extramural basilicas of st paul on the ostian way of st sebastian on the appian st lawrence on the tibertine or in the agar veranus st agnes in the nomentane road st pancratius on the aurelian and greatest of all st peter's on the vatican the first and last had separate burgs or cities round them and the traveller can still trace remains of strong walls round some of the others strange it is however that the young antiquarian whom we have frequently named with honour should have rediscovered two of the basilicos over the entrance to the cemetery of callistus almost entire the one being a stable and bakehouse the other a wine store one is most probably that built by pope damasus so often mentioned the earth washed down through air holes the spoliation practised during ages by persons entering from vineyards through unguarded entrances the mere wasting action of time and weather have left us but a wreck of the ancient catacombs still there is much to be thankful for enough remains to verify the records left us in better times and these serve to guide us to the reconstruction of our ruins the present pontiff has done more in a few years for these sacred places than has been effected in centuries the mixed commission which he has appointed have done wonders with their limited means they are going systematically to work finishing as they advance nothing is taken from the spot where it is found but everything is restored as far as possible to its original state accurate tracings are made of all the paintings and plans of every part explored to secure these good results the pope has from his own resources bought vineyards and fields especially at tormarancia where the cemetery of saints nereus and achilleus is situated and we believe also over that of callistus the french emperor too has sent to rome artists who have produced a most magnificent work perhaps somewhat overdone upon the catacombs a truly imperial undertaking it is time however for us to rejoin our party below and finish our inspection of these marvellous cities of departed saints under the guidance of our friends the excavators End of section twenty two Section twenty three of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part Second Conflict. Chapter Four. What Diogenes did tell about the catacombs. All that we have told our readers of the first period of the history of the subterranean Rome, as ecclesiastical antiquarians love to call the catacombs has no doubt been better related by diogenes to his youthful hearers as taper in hand they have been slowly walking through a long straight gallery crossed indeed by many others but adhered to faithfully with sundry pauses and of course lectures embodying what we have put together in our prosaic second chapter at length diogenes turned to the right and Tercatus looked round him anxiously i wonder he said how many turns we have passed by before leaving this main gallery a great many answered severus dryly how many do you think ten or twenty full that i fancy for i never have counted them Tercatus had however but wished to make sure he continued still pausing how do you distinguish the right turn then oh what is this and he pretended to examine a small niche in the corner but severus kept too sharp a lookout and saw that he was making a mark in the sand come come along he said or we shall lose sight of the rest and not see which way they turn that little niche is to hold a lamp you will find one at each angle as to ourselves we know every alley and turn here below as you do those of the city above torquatus was somewhat reassured by this account of the lamps those little earthen ones evidently made on purpose for the catacombs of which so many are there found but not content he kept as good count as he could of the turns as they went and now with one excuse and now with another he constantly stopped and scrutinized particular spots and corners but severus had a lynx's eye upon him and allowed nothing to escape his attention at last they entered a doorway and found themselves in a square chamber richly adorned with paintings what do you call this asked tiburtius it is one of the many crypts 
or cubicula which abound in our cemeteries answered diogenes sometimes they are merely family sepulchres but generally they contain the tomb of some martyr on whose anniversary we meet here see that tomb opposite us which though flush with the wall is arched over that becomes on such an occasion the altar whereon the divine mysteries are celebrated you are of course aware of the custom of so performing them perhaps my two friends interposed pancratius so recently baptized may not have heard it but i know it well it is surely one of the glorious privileges of martyrdom to have the lord's sacred body and precious blood offered upon one's ashes and to repose thus under the very feet of god but let us see well the paintings all over this crypt it is on account of them that i brought you into this chamber in preference to so many others in the cemetery it is one of the most ancient and contains a most complete series of pictures from the remotest times down to some of my son's doings well then diogenes explain them systematically to my friends said pancratius i think i know most of them but not all and i shall be glad to hear you describe them i am no scholar replied the old man modestly but when one has lived sixty years man and boy among things one gets to know them better than others because one loves them more all here have been fully initiated i suppose he added with a pause all answered tibertius though not so fully instructed as converts ordinarily are tercatus and myself have received the sacred gift enough resumed the excavator the ceiling is the oldest part of the painting as is natural for that was done when the crypt was excavated whereas the walls were decorated as tombs were hollowed out you see the ceiling has a sort of trellis work painted over it with grapes to represent perhaps our true vine of which we are the branches there you see orpheus sitting down and playing sweet music not only to his flock but to the wild beasts of the desert which stand charmed around him why that is a heathen picture altogether interrupted dercatus with pettishness and some sarcasm what has it to do with christianity it is an allegory tercatus replied pancratius gently and a favourite one the use of the gentile images when in themselves harmless has been permitted you see masks for instance and other pagan ornaments in this ceiling and they belong generally to a very ancient period and so our lord was represented under the symbol of orpheus to conceal his sacred representation from gentile blasphemy and sacrilege look now in that arch you have a more recent representation of the same subject i see said torquatus a shepherd with a sheep over his shoulders the good shepherd that i can understand i remember the parable but why is this subject such a favourite one asked tibertius i have observed it in other cemeteries if you look over the arcosalium answered severus you will see a fuller representation of the scene but i think we had better first continue what we have begun and finish the ceiling you see that figure on the right yes replied tibertius it is that of a man apparently in a chest with a dove flying towards him is that meant to represent the deluge it is said severus as the emblem of regeneration by water and the holy spirit and of the salvation of the world such is our beginning and here is our end jonas thrown out of the boat and swallowed by the whale and then sitting in enjoyment under his gourd the resurrection with our lord and eternal rest as its fruit how natural is this representation in such a place observed pancratius pointing to the other side and here we have another type of the same consoling doctrine where asked torquatus languidly i see nothing but a figure bandaged all round and standing up like a huge infant in a small temple and another person opposite to it exactly said severus that is the way we always represent the resurrection of lazarus here look is a touching expression of the hopes of our fathers in persecution the three babylonian children in the fiery furnace well now i think said tercatus we may come to the arcosolium and finish this room what are these pictures round it if you look at the left side you see the multiplication of the loaves and fishes the fish is you know the symbol of christ why so asked tercatus rather impatiently severus turned to pancratius as the better scholar to answer there are two opinions about its origin said the youth readily 
one finds the meaning in the word itself its letters forming the beginning of words so as to mean jesus christ son of god saviour another puts it in the symbol itself that as fish are born and live in the water so is the christian born of water and buried with christ in it by baptism hence as we came along we saw the figure of a fish carved on tombs or its name engraven on them now go on severus then the union of the bread and the fish in one multiplication shows us how in the eucharist christ becomes the food of all opposite is moses striking the rock from which all drank and which is christ our drink as well as our food now at last said tercatus we are come to the good shepherd yes continued severus you see him in the centre of the arcosalium in a simple tunic and leggings with the sheep upon his shoulders the recovered wanderer from the flock two more are standing at his sides the truant ram on his right the gentle ewe upon his left the penitent in the post of honour on each side too you see a person evidently sent by him to preach both are leaning forward and addressing sheep not of the fold one on either side is apparently giving no heed to their words but browsing quietly on while one is turning up its eyes and head looking and listening with eager attention rain is falling copiously on them that is the grace of god it is not difficult to interpret this picture but what makes this emblem such a particular favourite again pressed tiburtius we consider this and similar paintings to belong chiefly to the time when the novatian heresy so much plagued the church answered severus and pray what heresy is that asked tercatus carelessly for he thought he was losing time it was and indeed is the heresy answered pancratius that teaches that there are sins which the church has not power to forgive which are too great for god to pardon pancratius was not aware of the effect of his words but severus who never took off his eye from tercatus saw the blood come and go violently in his countenance is that a heresy asked the traitor confused surely a dreadful one replied pancratius to limit the mercy and forgiveness of him who came to call not the just but sinners to repentance the catholic church has always held that a sinner however dark the die however huge the mass of his crimes on truly repenting may receive forgiveness through the penitential remedy in her hands and therefore she has always so much loved this type of the good shepherd ready to run into the wilderness to bring back a lost sheep but suppose said tercatus evidently moved that one who had become a christian and received the sacred gift were to fall away and plunge into vice and and his voice faltered almost betray his brethren would not the church reject such a one from hope no no answered the youth these are the very crimes which the novatians insult the catholics for admitting to pardon the church is a mother with her arms ever open to re-embrace her erring children there was a tear trembling in tercatus's eye his lips quivered with the confession of his guilt which ascended to them for a moment but as if a black poisonous drop rose up in his throat with it and choked him he changed in a moment to a hard obstinate look bit his lip and said with an effort at coolness it is certainly a consoling doctrine for those that need it severus alone observed that a moment of grace had been forfeited and that some despairing thought had quenched a flash of hope in that man's heart diogenes and magus who had been absent looking at a new place for opening a gallery near now returned tercatus addressed the old master digger we have now seen the galleries and the chambers i am anxious to visit the church in which we shall have to assemble the unconscious excavator was going to lead the way when the inexorable artist interposed i think father it is too late for to-day you know we have got our work to do these young friends will excuse us especially as they will see the church in good time and in better order also as the holy pontiff intends to officiate in it they assented and when they arrived at the point where they had turned off from the first straight gallery to visit the ornamented chamber diogenes stopped the party turned a few steps along an opposite passage and said if you pursue this corridor and turn to the right you come to the church i merely brought you here to show you an arcosalium with a beautiful painting you here see the virgin mother holding her divine infant in her arms 
while the wise easterns here represented as four though generally we only reckon three are adoring him all admired the painting but poor severus was much chagrined at seeing how his good father had unwittingly supplied the information desired by Dracatus, and had furnished him with a sure clue to the desired turn by calling his attention to the tomb close round it distinguishable by so remarkable a picture when their company was departed he told all that he had observed to his brother remarking that man will give us trouble yet i strongly suspect him in a short time they had removed every mark which Tercatus had made at the turnings but this was no security against his reckonings and they determined to prepare for changing the road by blocking up the present one and turning off at another point for this purpose they had the sand of new excavations brought to the ends of a gallery which crossed the main avenue where this was low and left it heaped up there till the faithful could be instructed of the intended change End of section 23section twenty four of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part second conflict chapter five above ground to recover our reader from his long subterranean excursion we must take him with us on another visit to the happy campania or camp any the blessed as an old writer might have called it there we left fabiola perplexed by some sentences which she had found they came to her like a letter from another world she hardly knew of what character she wished to learn more about them but she hardly durst inquire many visitors called the next day and for several days after and she often thought of putting before some or other of them the mysterious sentences but she could not bring herself to do it a lady whose life was like her own philosophically correct and coldly virtuous came and they talked together over the fashionable opinions of the day she took out her vellum page to puzzle her but she shrank from submitting it to her it felt profane to do so a learned man well read in all branches of science and literature paid her a long visit and she spoke very charmingly on the sublimer views of the older schools she was tempted to consult him about her discovery but it seemed to contain something higher than he could comprehend it was strange that, after all, when wisdom or consolation was to be sought, the noble and haughty Roman lady should turn instinctively to her Christian slave. And so it was now. The first moment they were alone, after several days of company and visits, Fabiola produced her parchment and placed it before Syra. There passed over her countenance an emotion not observable to her mistress, but she was perfectly calm as she looked up from reading. "'That writing,' said her mistress, I got at Crematius's villa on the back of a note, probably by mistake. I cannot drive it out of my mind, which is quite perplexed by it. Why should it be so, my noble lady? Its sense seems plain enough. Yes, and that very plainness gives me trouble. My natural feelings revolt against this sentiment. I fancy I ought to despise a man who does not resent an injury and return hatred for hatred. To forgive at most would be much but to do good in return for evil seems to me an unnatural exaction from human nature now while i feel all this i am conscious that i have been brought to esteem you for conduct exactly the reverse of what i am naturally impelled to expect oh do not talk of me my dear mistress but look at the simple principle you honour in it others too do you despise or do you respect aristides for obliging a boorish enemy by writing when asked his own name on the shell that voted his banishment do you as a roman lady contemn or honour the name of coriolanus for his generous forbearance to your city i venerate both most truly sirrah for then you know those are heroes and not everyday men and why should we not all be heroes asked sirrah laughing bless me child what a world we should live in if we were it is very pleasant to read about the feats of such wonderful people, but one would be very sorry to see them performed by common men every day. Why so? pressed the servant. Why so? Who would like to find a baby she was nursing, playing with, or strangling serpents in the cradle? 
i should be very sorry to have a gentleman whom i invited to dinner telling me coolly he had that morning killed a minotaur or strangled a hydra or to have a friend offering to send the tiber through my stables to cleanse them preserve us from a generation of heroes say i and fabiola laughed heartily at the conceit in the same good humour syra continued but suppose we had the misfortune to live in a country where such monsters existed centaurs and minotaurs hydras and dragons would it not be better that common men should be heroes enough to conquer them than that we should have to send off to the other side of the world for a theseus or a hercules to destroy them in fact in that case a man would be no more a hero if he fought them than a lion slayer is in my country quite true syra but i do not see the application of your idea it is this anger hatred revenge ambition avarice are to my mind as complete monsters as serpents or dragons and they attack common men as much as great ones why should not i try to be as able to conquer them as aristides or coriolanus or cincinnatus why leave it to heroes only to do what we can do as well and do you really hold this as a common moral principle if so i fear you will soar too high no dear lady you were startled when i ventured to maintain that inward and unseen virtue was as necessary as the outward and visible i fear i must surprise you still more go on and do not fear to tell me all well then the principle of that system which i profess is this that we must treat and practice as every day in common virtue nay as simple duty whatever any other code the purest and sublimest that may be considers heroic and proves transcendent virtue that is indeed a sublime standard to form of moral elevation but mark the differences between the two cases the hero is supported by the praises of the world his act is recorded and transmitted to posterity when he checks his passions and performs a sublime action but who sees cares for or shall requite the poor obscure wretch who in humble secrecy imitates his conduct Sarah, with solemn reverential look and gesture raised her eyes and her right hand to heaven and slowly said his father who is in heaven who maketh his son to rise on the good and the bad and reigneth in the just and the unjust fabiola paused for a time overawed then said affectionately and respectfully again Sira, you have conquered my philosophy your wisdom is consistent as it is sublime a virtue heroic even when unseen you propose as the ordinary daily virtue of every one men must indeed become more than what gods have been thought to be to attempt it but the very idea is worth the whole philosophy can you lead me higher than this oh far far higher still and where at length would you leave me where your heart should tell you that it had found peace End of section 24section 25 of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part second conflict chapter six deliberations the persecution had now been some time raging in the east under diocletian and galerius and the decree for enkindling it throughout the west had reached maximian but it had been resolved to make this a work not of apprehension but of extermination of the christian name it had been determined to spare no one but cutting off the chiefs of the religion first to descend down to the wholesale butchery of the poorest classes it was necessary for this purpose to concert measures that the various engines of destruction might work in cruel harmony that every possible instrument should be employed to secure completeness to the effort and also that the majesty of imperial command should add its grandeur and its terror to the crushing blow for this purpose the emperor though impatient to begin his work of blood had yielded to the opinion of his counsellors that the edict should be kept concealed till it could be published simultaneously in every province and government of the west the thunder-cloud fraught with vengeance would thus hang for a time in painful mystery over its intended victims and then burst suddenly upon them 
discharging upon their heads its mingled elements and its fire hail snow ice and boisterous blast it was in the month of november that maximian hercules convoked the meeting in which his plans had finally to be adjusted to it were summoned the leading officers of his court and of the state the principal one the prefect of the city had brought with him his son corvinus whom he had proposed to be captain of a body of armed pursuivants picked out for their savageness and hatred of the christians who should hunt them out or down with unrelenting assiduity the chief prefects or governors of sicily italy spain and gaul were present to receive their orders in addition to these several learned men philosophers and orators among whom was our old acquaintance calpurnius had been invited and many priests who had come from different parts to petition for heavier persecution were commanded to attend the usual residence of the emperors as we have seen was the palatine there was however another much esteemed by them which maximian herculeus in particular preferred during the reign of nero the wealthy senator pilatius lateranus was charged with conspiracy and of course punished with death his immense property was seized by the emperor and part of this was his house described by juvenal and other writers as of unusual size and magnificence it was beautifully situated on the chilean hill and on the southern verge of the city so that from it was a view unequalled even in the vicinity of rome stretching across the wavy campana here bestrided by colossal aqueducts crossed by lines of roads with their fringes of marble tombs and bespangled all over by glittering villas set like gems in the dark green enamel of laurel and cypress the eye reached at evening the purple slip of hills on which as on a couch lay stretched luxuriously alba and tusculum with their daughters according to oriental phrase basking brightly in the setting sun the craggy range of sabine mountains on the left and the golden expanse of the sea on the right of the beholder closed in this perfect landscape it would be attributing to maximian a quality which he did not possess were we to give him credit for loving a residence so admirably situated through any taste for the beautiful the splendor of the buildings which he had still further adorned or possibly the facility of running out of the city for the chase of boar and wolf was the motive of this preference a native of samurium in sclavonia a reputed barbarian therefore of the lowest extraction a mere soldier of fortune without any education endowed with little more than a brute strength which made his surname of herculeus most appropriate he had been raised to the purple by his brother barbarian diodes known as the emperor diocletian like him covetous to meanness and spendthrift to recklessness addicted to the same coarse vices and foul crimes which a christian pen refuses to record without restraint of any passion without sense of justice or feeling of humanity this monster had never ceased to oppress persecute and slay whoever stood in his way to him the coming persecution looked like an approaching feast as to a glutton who requires the excitement of a surfeit to relieve the monotony of daily excess gigantic in frame with the well-known features of his race with the hair on his head and face more yellow than red shaggy and wild like tufts of straw with eyes restlessly rolling in a compound expression of suspicion profligacy and ferocity this almost last of rome's tyrants struck terror into the hearts of any beholder except a christian is it wonderful that he hated the race and its name in the large basilica or hall then of the aedes latinorene maximian met his motley council in which secrecy was ensured by penalty of death in the semicircular apse at the upper end of the hall sat the emperor on an ivory throne richly adorned and before him were arranged his obsequious and almost trembling advisers a chosen body of guards kept the entrance and the officer in command sebastian was leaning negligently against it on the inside but carefully noted every word that was spoken little did the emperor think that the hall in which he sat and which he afterwards gave with a contiguous palace to constantine as part of the dowry of his daughter fausta would be transferred by him to the head of the religion he was planning to extirpate and become retaining its name of the lateran basilica the cathedral of rome of all the churches of the city and of the world the mother in chief little did he imagine that on the spot whereon rested his throne would be raised a chair whence command should issue to reach worlds unknown to roman sway 
from an immortal race of sovereigns spiritual and temporal precedence was granted by religious courtesy to the priests each of whom had his tale to tell here a river had overflowed its banks and done much mischief to the neighboring plains there an earthquake had thrown down part of a town on the northern frontiers the barbarians threatened invasion at the south the plague was ravaging the pious population in every instance the oracles had declared that it was all owing to the christians whose toleration irritated the gods and whose evil charms brought calamity on the empire nay some had afflicted their votaries by openly proclaiming that they would utter no more till the odious nazarenes had been exterminated and the great delphic oracle had not hesitated to declare that the just did not allow the gods to speak next came the philosophers and orators each of whom made his own long-winded oration during which maximian gave unequivocal signs of weariness but as the emperors in the east had held a similar meeting he considered it his duty to sit out the annoyance the usual calumnies were repeated for the ten thousandth time to an applauding assembly the stories of murdering and eating infants of committing foul crimes of worshipping martyrs bodies of adoring an ass's head and inconsistently enough of being unbelievers and serving no god these tales were almost firmly believed though probably their reciters knew perfectly well they were but good sound heathen lies very useful in keeping up a horror of christianity but at length up rose the man who was considered to have most deeply studied the doctrines of the enemy and best to know their dangerous tactics he was supposed to have read their own books and to be drawing up a confutation of their errors which would fairly crush them indeed so great was his weight with his own side that when he asserted that christians held any monstrous principle had their supreme pontiff in person contradicted it every one would have laughed at the very idea of taking his word for his own belief against the assertion of calpurnius he struck up a different strain and his learning quite astonished his fellow sophists he had read the original books he said not only of the christians themselves but of their forefathers the jews who having come into egypt in the reign of ptolemy philadelphus to escape from a famine in their own country through the arts of their leader josephus brought up all the corn there and sent it home upon which ptolemy imprisoned them telling them that as they had eaten up all the corn they should live on the straw by making bricks with it for building a great city then demetrius Valerius hearing from them of a great many curious histories of their ancestors shut up moses and aaron their most learned men in a tower having shaved half their beards till they should write in greek all their records these rare books calpurnius had seen and he would build his argument entirely on them this race made war upon every king and people that came in their way and destroyed them all it was their principle if they took a city to put every one to the sword and this was all because they were under the government of their ambitious priests so that when a certain king saul called also paul spared a poor captive monarch whose name was agog the priest ordered him to be brought out and hewed to pieces now continued he these christians are still under the domination of the same priesthood and are quite as ready to-day under their direction to overthrow the great roman empire burn us all in the forum and even sacrilegiously assail the sacred and venerable heads of our divine emperors a thrill of horror ran through the assembly at this recital it was soon hushed as the emperor opened his mouth to speak for my part he said i have another and a stronger reason for my abhorrence of these christians they have dared to establish in the heart of the empire and in this very city a supreme religious authority unknown here before independent of the government of the state and equally powerful over their minds as this formerly all acknowledged the emperor as supreme and religious as in civil rule hence he bears still the title of pontifex maximus but these men have raised up a divided power and consequently bear but a divided loyalty i hate therefore as a usurpation in my own dominions the sacerdotal sway over my subjects for i declare that i would rather hear of a new rival starting up to my throne than of the election of one of these priests in rome this speech delivered in harsh grating voice and with a vulgar foreign accent was received with immense applause and plans were formed for the simultaneous publication of the edict through the west and for its complete and exterminating execution then turning sharply upon tertullius 
the emperor said prefect you said you had some one to propose for superintending these arrangements and for merciless dealings with these traitors he is here sire my son Curvinus. and tertullus handed the youthful candidate to the grim tyrant's footstool where he knelt maximian eyed him keenly burst into a hideous laugh and said upon my word i think he'll do why prefect i had no idea you had such an ugly son i should think he is just the thing every quality of a thorough paced unconscientious scapegrace is stamped upon his features then turning to corvinus who was scarlet with rage terror and shame he said to him mind you sirrah i must have clean work of it no hacking and ewing no blundering i pay up well if i am well served but i pay off well too if badly served so now go and remember that if your back can answer for a small fault your head will for a greater the lictor's fasces contain an axe as well as rods the emperor rose to depart when his eye caught fulvius who had been summoned as a paid court spy but who kept as much in the background as possible ho there my eastern worthy he called out to him draw nearer fulvius obeyed with apparent cheerfulness but with real reluctance much the same as if he had been invited to go near a tiger the strength of whose chain he was not quite sure about he had seen from the beginning that his coming to rome had not been acceptable to maximian though he knew not fully the cause it was not merely that the tyrant had plenty of favourites of his own to enrich and spies to pay without diocletians sending him more from asia though this had its weight but it was more he believed in his heart that fulvius had been sent principally to act the spy upon himself and to report to nicomedia the sayings and doings of his court while therefore he was obliged to tolerate him and employ him he mistrusted and disliked him which in him was equivalent to hating him it was some compensation therefore to corvinus when he heard his more polished confederate publicly addressed as rudely as himself in the following terms none of your smooth put on looks for me fellow i want deeds not smirks you came here as a famous plot hunter a sort of stoat to pull conspirators out of their nests or suck their eggs for me i have seen nothing of this so far and yet you have had plenty of money to set you up in business these christians will afford you plenty of game so make yourself ready and let us see what you can do you know my ways you had better look sharp about you therefore or you may have to look at something very sharp before you the property of the convicted will be divided between the accusers and the treasury unless i see particular reasons for taking the whole to myself now you may go most thought that these particular reasons would turn out to be very general End of section twenty five Section twenty six of Fabiola by Nicholas Patrick Cardinal Wiseman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part Second Conflict. Chapter Seven. Dark Death. A few days after Fabiola's return from the country, Sebastian considered it his duty to wait upon her, to communicate so much of the dialogue between Corvinus and her black slave as they could without causing unnecessary suffering. We have already observed that of the many noble youths that Fabiola had met in her father's house, none had excited her admiration and respect except Sebastian. So frank, so generous, so brave, yet so unboasting, so mild, so kind in act and speech, so unselfish and so careful of others, blending so completely in one character nobleness and simplicity, high wisdom and practical sense, he seemed to her the most finished type of manly virtue one which would not easily suffer by time nor weary by familiarity when therefore it was announced to her that the officer sebastian wished to speak to her alone in one of the halls below her heart beat at the unusual tidings and conjured up a thousand strange fancies about the possible topics of his interview this agitation was not diminished when after apologizing for his seeming intrusion he remarked with a smile that well knowing how sufficiently she was already annoyed by the many candidates for her hand he felt regret at the idea that he was going to add another yet undeclared to her list if this ambiguous preface surprised and perhaps elated her she was soon depressed again upon being told it was the vulgar and stupid corvinus 
for her father even little as he knew how to discriminate characters out of business had seen enough of him at his late banquet to characterize him to his daughter by those epithets sebastian fearing rather the physical than the moral activity of afra's drugs thought it right to inform her of the compact between the two dabblers in the black art the principal efficacy of which however seemed to consist in drawing money from the purse of a reluctant dupe he of course said nothing of what related to the christians in their dialogue he put her on her guard and she promised to prevent the nightly excursions of her necromancer slave what afra had engaged to do she did not for a moment believe it was ever her intention to attempt neither did she fear arts which she utterly despised indeed afra's last soliloquy seemed satisfactorily to prove that she was only deceiving her victim but she certainly felt indignant at having been bargained about by two such vile characters and having been represented as a grasping avaricious woman whose price was gold i feel she said to sebastian how very kind it is of you to come thus to put me on my guard and i admire the delicacy with which you have unfolded so disagreeable a matter and the tenderness with which you have treated every one concerned i have only done in this instance replied the soldier what i should have done for any human being save him if possible from pain or danger your friends i hope you mean said fabiola smiling otherwise i fear your whole life would go in works of unrequited benevolence and so let it go it could not be better spent surely you are not in earnest sebastian if you saw one who had ever hated you and sought your destruction threatened with a calamity which would make him harmless would you stretch out your hand to save or succor him certainly i would while god sends his sunshine and his rain equally upon his enemies as upon his friends shall weak man frame another rule of justice at these words fabiola wondered they were so like those of her mysterious parchment identical with the moral theories of her slave you have been in the east i believe sebastian she asked him rather abruptly was it there that you learnt these principles for i have one near me who is yet by her own choice a servant a woman of rare moral perceptions who has propounded to me the same ideas and she is asiatic it is not in any distant country that i learnt them for here i suck them in with my mother's milk though originally they doubtless came from the east they are certainly beautiful in the abstract remarked fabiola but death would overtake us before we could half carry them out were we to make them our principles of conduct and how better could death find us though not surprise us than in thus doing our duty even if not to its completion for my part resumed the lady i am of the old epicurean poet's mind this world is a banquet from which i shall be ready to depart when i have had my fill but conviva sator and not till then i wish to read life's book through and close it calmly only when i have finished its last page sebastian shook his head smiling and said the last page of this world's book comes but in the middle of the volume wherever death may happen to be written but on the next page begins the illuminated book of a new life without a last page i understand you replied fabiola good-humouredly you are a brave soldier and you speak as such you must be always prepared for death from a thousand casualties we seldom see it approach suddenly it comes more mercifully and stealthily upon the weak you no doubt are musing on a more glorious fate on receiving in front full sheaves of arrows from the enemy and falling covered with honour you look to the soldier's funeral pile with trophies erected over it to you after death opens its bright page the book of glory no no gentle lady exclaimed sebastian emphatically i mean not so i care not for glory which can only be enjoyed by an anticipating fancy i speak of vulgar death as it may come to me in common with the poorest slave consuming me by slow burning fever wasting me by long lingering consumption racking me by slowly eating ulcers nay if you please by the still crueler inflictions of men's wrath in any form let it come it comes from a hand that i love and do you really mean that death so contemplated would be welcomed by you as joyful as is the epicure 
when the doors of the banqueting hall are thrown wide open and he sees beyond them the brilliant lamps the glittering table and its delicious viands with its attendant ministers well girt and crowned with roses as blithe as in the bride when the bridegroom is announced coming with rich gifts to conduct her to her new home will my exulting heart be when death under whatever form throws back the gates iron on this side but golden on the other which lead to a new and perennial life and i care not how grim the messenger may be that proclaims the approach of him who is celestially beautiful and who is he asked fabiola eagerly can he not be seen save through the fleshless ribs of death no replied sebastian for it is he who must reward us not only for our lives but for our deaths also happy they whose inmost hearts while he has ever read have been kept pure and innocent as well as their deeds have been virtuous for them is this bright vision of him whose true rewards only then begin how very like sarah's doctrines she thought but before she could speak again to ask whence they came a slave entered stood on the threshold and respectfully said a courier madam is just arrived from Baius. pardon me sebastian she exclaimed let him enter immediately the messenger came covered with dust and jaded having left his tired horse at the gate and offered her a sealed packet her hand trembled as she took it and while she was unloosening its bands she hesitatingly asked from my father about him at least was the ominous reply she opened the sheet glanced over it shrieked and fell sebastian caught her before she reached the ground laid her on a couch and delicately left her in the hands of her handmaids who had rushed in at the cry one glance had told her all her father was dead end of section twenty six section twenty seven of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part Second Conflict. Chapter Eight. Darker Still. When Sebastian came into the court, he found a little crowd of domestics gathered round the courier, listening to the details of their master's death. The letter of which Torquatus was the bearer to him had produced its desired effect. He called at his villa and spent a few days with his daughter on his way to asia he was more than usually affectionate and when they parted both father and daughter seemed to have a melancholy foreboding that they would meet no more he soon however recovered his spirits at baius where a party of good livers anxiously awaited him and where he considered himself obliged to stay while his galley was being fitted up and stored with the best wines and provisions which campiana afforded for his voyage he indulged, however, his luxurious taste to excess, and on coming out of a bath, after a hearty supper, he was seized with a chill, and in four and twenty hours was a corpse. He had left his undivided wealth to his only child. In fine, the body was being embalmed when the courier stirred it, and was to be brought by his galley to Ostia. On hearing this sad tale, Sebastian was almost sorry that he had spoken as he had done of death, and left the house with mournful thoughts. Fabiola's first plunge into the dark abyss of grief was deep and dismal, down into unconsciousness. Then the buoyancy of youth and mind bore her up again to the surface, and her view of life, to the horizon, was as of a boundless ocean of black seething waves, on which floated no living thing save herself. Her woe seemed utter and unmeasured, and she closed her eyes with a shudder, and suffered herself to sink again into obliviousness till once more roused to wakefulness of mind. Again and again she was thus tossed up and down, between transient death and life, while her attendants applied remedies to what they deemed a succession of alarming fits and convulsions. At length she sat up, pale, staring, and tearless, gently pushing aside the hand that tried to administer restoratives to her. In this state she remained long. A stupor, fixed and deadly, seemed to have entranced her. The pupils were almost insensible to the light, and fears were whispered of her brain becoming oppressed. 
the physician who had been called uttered distinctly and forcibly into her ears the question fabiola do you know that your father is dead she started fell back and a bursting flood of tears relieved her heart and head she spoke of her father and called for him and mr sobs and said wild and incoherent but affectionate things about and to him sometimes she seemed to think him still alive then she remembered he was dead and so she wept and moaned till sleep took the turn of tears in nursing her shattered mind and frame euphrosian and Sira alone watched by her the former had from time to time but in the commonplaces of heathen consolation had reminded her too how kind a master how honest a man how loving a father he had been but the christian sat in silence except to speak gentle and soothing words to her mistress and served her with an act of delicacy which even then was not unnoticed what could she do more unless it was to pray what hope for else than that a new grace was folding up like a flower in this tribulation that a bright angel was riding in the dark cloud that overshadowed her humble lady as grief receded it left some room for thought this came to fabiola in a gloomy and searching form what was become of her father whither was he gone had he melted into unexistence or had he been crushed into annihilation had his life been searched through by that unseen eye which sees the invisible had he stood the proof of that scrutiny which sebastian and Sira had described impossible then what had become of him she shuddered as she thought and put away the reflection from her mind oh for a ray from some unknown light that would dart into the grave and show her what it was poetry had pretended to enlighten it and even glorify it but had only in truth remained at the door as a genius with drooping head and torch reversed science had stepped in and come out scared with tarnished wings and lamp extinguished in the fouetted air for it had only discovered a charnel house and philosophy had barely ventured to wander round and round and peep in with dread and recoil in thin prate or babble and shrugging its shoulders owned that the problem was yet unsolved the mystery still veiled oh for something or someone better than all these to remove the dismal perplexity while these thoughts dwell like gloomy night on the heart of fabiola her slave is enjoying the vision of light clothed in mortal form translucid and radiant rising from the grave as from an alembic in which have remained the grosser qualities of matter without impairing the essence of its nature spiritualized and free lovely and glorious it springs from the very hotbed of corruption and another and another from land and sea from reeking cemetery and from beneath consecrated altar from the tangled thicket where solitary murder has been committed on the just and from fields of ancient battle done by israel for god like crystal fountains springing into the air like brilliant signal lights darted from earth to heaven till a host of millions side by side repeoples creation with joyous and undying life and how knows she this because one greater and better than poet sage or sophist had made the trial had descended first into the dark couch of death had blessed it as he had done the cradle and made infancy sacred rendering also death a holy thing and its place a sanctuary he went into it in the darkest of evening and he came forth from it in the brightest of morning he was laid there wrapped in spices and he rose again robed in his own fragrant and corruption and from that day the grave had ceased to be an object of dread to the christian soul for he continued what he had made it the furrow into which the seed of immortality must needs be cast the time was not come for speaking of these things to fabiola she mourned still as they must mourn who have no hope day succeeded day in gloomy meditation on the mystery of death till other cares mercifully roused her the corpse arrived and such a funeral followed as rome then seldom witnessed processions by torchlight in which the waxen effigies of ancestors were borne and a huge funeral pile built up of aromic wood and scented by the richest spices of arabia ended in her gathering up a few handfuls of charred bones which were deposited in an alabaster urn and placed in a niche of the family sepulchre with the name inscribed of their former owner calpurnius spoke the funeral oration in which according to the fashionable ideas of the day 
he contrasted the virtues of the hospitable and industrious citizen with the false morality of those men called christians who fasted and prayed all day and were stealthily insinuating their dangerous principles into every noble family and spreading disloyalty and immorality in every class fabius he could have no doubt if there was any future existence whereon philosophers differed was now basking on a green bank in elysium and quaffing nectar and oh concluded the old whining hypocrite who would have been sorry to exchange one goblet of falernian for an amphora of that beverage oh that the gods would hasten the day when i his humble client may join him in his shady repose and sober banquets this noble sentiment gained immense applause to this care succeeded another fabiola had to apply her vigorous mind to examine and close her father's complicated affairs how often was she pained at the discovery of what to her seemed injustice fraud overreaching and oppression in the transactions of one whom the world had applauded as the most honest and liberal of public contractors in a few weeks more in the dark attire of a mourner fabiola went forth to visit her friends the first of these was her cousin agnes End of section 27section twenty eight of fabiola by nicholas patrick cardinal wiseman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese part second conflict chapter nine the false brother we must take our reader back a few steps in the history of tracatus on the morning after his fall he found on awaking fulvius at his bedside it was the falconer who having got hold of a good hawk was come to tame him and train him to strike down the dove for him in return for a well-fed slavery with all the coolness of a practised hand he brought back to his memory every circumstance of the preceding night's debauch his utter ruin and only means of escape with unfeeling precision he strengthened every thread of the last evening's web and added many more meshes to it the position of tracatus was this if he made one step towards christianity which fulvius assured him would be fruitless he would be at once delivered to the judge and cruelly punished with death if he remained faithful to his compact of treason he should want for nothing you are hot and feverish at last concluded fulvius an early walk and fresh air will do you good the poor wretch consented and they had hardly reached the forum when corvinus as if by accident met them after mutual salutations he said i am glad to have fallen in with you i should like to take you and show you my father's workshop workshop asked tercatus with surprise yes where he keeps his tools it has just been beautifully fitted up here it is and that grim old foreman catullus is opening the doors they entered into a spacious court with a shed round it filled with engines of torture of every form Tercata shrunk back. "'Come in, masters, don't be afraid,' said the old executioner. "'There is no fire put on yet, and nobody will hurt you, unless you happen to be a wicked Christian. It's for them we have been polishing up of late.' "'Now, Catilius, said Corvinus, "'tell this gentleman, who is a stranger, the use of these pretty toys you have here.' Catullus, with good heart, showed them round his museum of horrors, explaining everything with such hearty goodwill and no end of jokes not quite fit for record that in his enthusiasm he nearly gave tracatus practical illustrations of what he described having once almost caught his ear in a pair of sharp pincers and another time brought down a mallet within an inch of his teeth the rack a large gridiron an iron chair with a furnace in it for heating it large boilers for hot oil or scalding water baths ladles for melting lead and pouring it neatly into the mouth pincers hooks and iron combs of varied shapes for laying bare the ribs scorpions or scourges armed with iron or leaden knobs iron collars manacles and fetters of the most tormenting make in fine swords knives and axes in tasteful varieties were all commented upon with true relish and an anticipation of much enjoyment in seeing them used on those hard-headed and thick-skinned christians Tercatus was thoroughly broken down, 
he was taken to the vows of antonius where he caught the attention of old cucumio the head of the wardrobe department or capsarius and his wife victoria who had seen him at church after a good refection he was led to a gambling hall in the thermae and lost of course fulvius lent him money but for every farthing exacted a bond by these means he was in a few days completely subdued their meetings were early and late during the day he was left free lest he should lose his value through being suspected by christians corvinus had determined to make a tremendous dash at them so soon as the edict should have come out he therefore exacted from tercatus as his share of the compact that the spy should study the principal cemetery where the pontiff intended to officiate this tercatus soon ascertained and his visit to the cemetery of Callistus was in fulfilment of his engagement when that struggle between grace and sin took place in his soul which severus noticed it was the image of catullus and his hundred plagues with that of fulvius and his hundred bonds that turned the scale in favour of perdition corvinus after receiving his report and making from it a rough chart of the cemetery determined to assail it early the very day after the publication of the decree fulvius took another course he determined to become acquainted by sight with the principal clergy and leading christians of rome once possessed of this knowledge he was sure no disguise would conceal them from his piercing eyes and he would easily pick them up one by one he therefore insisted upon tercatus's taking him as his companion to the first great function that should collect many priests and deacons round the pope he overruled every remonstrance dispelled every fear and assured Tercatus that once in, by his password, he should behave perfectly like any Christian. Tercatus soon informed him that there would be an excellent opportunity at the coming ordination, in that very month of December. End of section 28this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Part Second Conflict. Chapter Ten. The Ordination in December. Whoever has read the history of the early popes will have become familiar with the fact, recorded almost invariably of each, that he held certain ordinations in the month of December, wherein he created so many priests and deacons and so many bishops for different places. The first two orders were conferred to supply clergy for the city. The third was evidently to furnish pastors for other dioceses. In later times, the ember days in December, regulated by the festival of St. Lucy, were those on which the supreme pontiff held with consistories, in which he named his cardinal priests and deacons, and preconized, as it is called, the bishops of all parts of the world. And though this function is not now coincident with the periods of ordination, still is continued essentially for the same purpose marcellinus under whose pontificate our narrative is placed is stated to have held two ordinations in this month that is of course in different years it was to one of these that we have alluded as about to take place where was the solemn function to be performed was fulvius's first inquiry and we could not but think that the answer will be interesting to the christian antiquary nor can our acquaintance with the ancient Roman church be complete without our knowing the favoured spot where pontiff after pontiff preached and celebrated the divine mysteries and held his councils, or those glorious ordinations which sent forth not only bishops but martyrs to govern other churches, and gave to a St. Lawrence his diaconate, or to St. Novatus or St. Timotheus his priesthood. There, too, a Polycarp or Arrhenius visited the successor of St. Peter, and thence received their commission the apostles converted our king lucius to the faith the house which the roman pontiffs inhabited and the church in which they officiated till constantine installed them in the lateran palace in basilica the residence and cathedral of the illustrious line of martyr popes for three hundred years can be no ignoble spot and that in tracing it out we may not be misguided by national or personal prepossession we will follow a learned living antiquarian who intent upon another research accidentally has put together all the data requisite for our purpose we have described the house of agnes's parents as situated in the vicus patricius 
or the patrician street this had another name for it was also called the street of the cornelli vicus corneliorum because in it lived the illustrious family of that name the centurion whom st peter converted belonged to this family and possibly to him the apostle owed his introduction at rome to the head of this house cornelius pudens this senator married claudia a noble british lady and it is singular how the unchaste poet marshall vies with the purest writers when he sings the wedding song of these two virtuous spouses it was in their house that st peter lived and his fellow apostle st paul enumerates them among his familiar friends as well eubulus and pudens and linus and claudia and all the brethren salute thee from that house then went forth the bishops whom the prince of the apostles sent in every direction to propagate and die for the faith of christ after the death of pudens the house became the property of his children or grandchildren two sons and two daughters the latter are better known because they have found a place in the general calendar of the church and because they have given their names to two of the most illustrious churches of rome those of st praxedes and st pudentiana it is the latter which alban butler calls the most ancient church in the world that marks at once the vicus patricius and the house of pudens as in every other city so in rome the eucharistic sacrifice was offered originally in only one place by the bishop and even after more churches were erected and the faithful met in them communion was brought to them from the one altar by the deacons and distributed by the priests it was pope Evaristus, the fourth successor of st peter who multiplied the churches of rome with circumstances peculiarly interesting this pope then did two things first he enacted that from thenceforward no altar should be erected except of stone and that they should be consecrated and secondly he distributed the titles that is he divided rome into parishes to the churches of which he gave the name of title the connection of these two acts will be apparent to any one looking at genesis twenty eight where after jacob had enjoyed an angelic vision while sleeping with a stone for his pillow we are told that trembling he said how terrible is this place this is no other than the house of god and the gate of heaven and jacob arising in the morning took the stone and set it up for a title pouring oil on the top of it the church or oratory where the sacred mysteries were celebrated was truly to the christian the house of god and the stone altar set up in it was consecrated by the pouring of oil upon it as is done to this day for the whole law of Evaristus remains in full force and thus became a title or monument two interesting facts are elicited from this narrative one is that to that time there was only one church with an altar in rome and no doubt has ever been raised that this was a church afterwards and yet known by the name of st pudentiana another is that the one altar till then existing was not of stone it was in fact the wooden altar used by st peter and kept in that church till transferred by st sylvester to the lateran basilica of which it forms the high altar we further conclude that the law was not retrospective and that the wooden altar of the popes was preserved at that church where it had been first erected though from time to time it might be carried and used elsewhere the church in the vicus patricius therefore which existed previous to the creation of titles was not itself a title it continued to be the episcopal or rather the pontifical church of rome the pontificate of st pius i from one forty two to one fifty seven forms an interesting period in its history for two reasons first that pope without altering the character of the church itself added to it an oratory which he made a title and having collated to it his brother pastor it was called the titulus pastoris the designation for a long time of the cardinalate attached to the church this shows that the church itself was more than a title secondly in this pontificate came to rome for the second time and suffered martyrdom the holy and learned apologist st justin by comparing his writings with his acts we come to some interesting conclusions respecting christian worship in times of persecution in what place do the christians meet he is asked by the judge do you think he replies that we all meet in one place it is not so 
but when interrogated where he lived and where he held meetings with his disciples he answered i have lived till now near the house of a certain martin at the bath known as the timotine i have come to rome for the second time nor do i know any other place but the one i have mentioned the timotine or timothian baths were part of the house of the Pudens family and are those at which we have said that fulvius and Corvinus met early one morning novatus and timotheus were the brothers of the holy virgins praxides and pudentiana and hence the baths were called the novatian and the timotine as they passed from one brother to another st justin therefore lived on this spot and as he knew no other in rome attended divine worship there the very claims of hospitality would suggest it now in his apology describing the christian liturgy of course such as he saw it he speaks of the officiating priest in terms that sufficiently describe the bishop or supreme pastor of the place not only by giving him a title applied to bishops in antiquity but by describing him as the person who has the care of orphans and widows and succors the sick the indigent prisoners strangers who come as guests who in one word undertakes to provide for all in want this could be no other than the bishop or pope himself we must further observe that st pius is recorded to have erected a fixed baptismal font in this church another prerogative of the cathedral transferred with the papal altar to the lateran it is related that the holy pope stephen a d 257 baptized the tribune the messias and his family with many others in the title of pastor and here it was that the blessed deacon laurentius distributed the rich vessels of the church to the poor in time this name is given way to another but the place is the same and no doubt can exist that the church of st prudentiana was for the first three centuries the humble cathedral of rome it was to this spot therefore that tercatus unwillingly consented to leave fulvius that he might witness the december ordination we find either in sepulchral inscriptions in martyrologies or in ecclesiastical history abundant traces of all the orders as still conferred in the catholic church inscriptions perhaps more commonly record those of lector or reader and of exorcist we will give one interesting example of each of a lector Sinamius opus lector tituli facioli amicus paperum qui vixit an Sinamius opus lector tituli facioli amicus paperum qui vixit an xlvi mens vii d v i i i deposit in pace ex calmart of an exorcist macedonius exorcista de catholica a difference was however that one order was not necessarily a passage or step to another but persons remained often for life in one of these lesser orders there was not therefore the frequent administration of these nor probably was it publicly performed with the higher orders torquatus having the necessary password entered accompanied by fulvius who soon showed himself expert in acting as others did around him the assembly was not large it was held in the hall of the house converted into a church or oratory which was mainly occupied by the clergy and the candidates for orders among the latter were marcus and marcellianus the twin brothers fellow converts of torquatus who received the deaconship and their father tranquilinus who was ordained priest of these fulvius impressed well in his mind the features and figure and still more did he take note of the clergy the most eminent of rome there assembled but on one more than the rest he fixed his piercing eye studying his every gesture look voice and liniment this was the pontiff who performed the august rite marcellinus had already governed the church six years and was of a venerable old age his countenance benign and mild scarcely seemed to betoken the possession of that nerve which martyrdom required and which he exhibited in his death for christ in those days every outward characteristic which could have betrayed the chief shepherd to the wolves was carefully avoided the ordinary simple garb of respectable men was worn but there is no doubt that when officiating at the altar a distinctive robe the forerunner of the ample chasuble a spotless white was cast over the ordinary garment to this the bishop added a crown or infola the origin of a later mitre while on his hand he held the crozier emblem of his pastoral office and authority 
on him who now stood facing the assembly before the sacred altar of peter which was between him and the people the eastern spy steadied his keenest glance he scanned him minutely measured with his eye his height defined the color of his hair and complexion observed every turn of his head his walk his action his tones almost his breathing till he said to himself if he stirs abroad disguised as he may choose that man is my prize and i know his worth in the section twenty nine